Good morning, everyone. I'm going to invite folks to take their seats so we can get started. Good morning. I'd like to call our Public Health Committee hearing to order. It's 11.01. We have a full agenda today. We have had, in a wonderful way, 98 people sign up to testify today. So a few notes before we begin. Uh, the first hour of our hearing is reserved for public officials. After that hour, we will alternate between our public officials and members of the public. Um, we have, for this hearing, made some special accommodations uh, for a group of people from the disability community. They will be testifying at approximately 2 to 3 p.m., so I wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that as well. Uh, if you are on Zoom, a reminder to please accept your promotion, um, and you will be removed from the platform at the completion of your testimony and can continue watching the hearing on CTN. For our wonderful fellow members of the committee, again with 98 uh, folks coming to testify, I'd ask that you make sure that you're asking your questions succinctly and uh, with brevity so that we can make sure that we hear from all of those 98 people who have come before us today. Um, with that, I will offer this to Senator Amwar for some opening remarks. Let's start. Oh, I love that brevity. Um, and I am not quite logged on. Senator Summers, I believe, is online. Senator Summers. Yes, I'm just looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say today and I'm ready to get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Summers. Representative Clara DeStetria. Thank you. Let's get started, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I believe that uh, the first person on our list who is in the room, I'm, I'm, we have Senator Looney, Comptroller Scanlon, Commissioner Dutani. Oh, Commissioner Dutani, she is here. Welcome. You will be first up for us today, and we'll go back to those who are not quite here yet. So thank you so much, Commissioner, for joining us, and we look forward to kicking off with you. Welcome. And before, actually, one more thing, I should remind everyone, we do have a three-minute limit. There will be questions for you, I'm sure, but just a reminder to all those testifying. Thank you, Commissioner. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, Senator Summers, Representative Claire DeStetria, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in strong support of House Bill 5058, an act adopting the nurse licensure compact. Connecticut has some of the strongest hospitals and healthcare professionals and programs throughout the nation. And yet we still suffer from the same nationwide shortage of providers that many other states are experiencing as well. And we are feeling this very acutely in the nursing workforce. So why do we support this compact? because it will provide relief to the ongoing nurse workforce shortage that we are experiencing. Secondly, it'll allow more people to be licensed in the state, which could expand our nurse education resources through a larger pool of eligible nurse educators and preceptors. We know that many of our surrounding states, including Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey are already doing this, and Massachusetts is considering joining the compact as well. We know that some of our greatest challenges in our nursing schools has been to have educators available who can train the next generation of nurses. So it, joining the Nurse Compact will provide not only workforce additional personnel, but will provide those educators that can help train our newest nurses. This bill sunsets the compact after three years at which point the committee and executive branch will have a chance to examine the impact it's had over those years to determine if it should be continued. So we look forward to being part of this conversation and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And thank you for getting right to the point with that. Uh, the nursing compact is an important conversation here today. Are there questions from members of the committee? Well, thank you, Commissioner. I know we will, as has been the case, remain in conversation about this. And uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you. Next on our list, um, 
is, I don't believe Senator Looney. Oh, Senator Looney. Wow, that timing was impeccable. Welcome to public health, Senator Looney. We're happy to have you here. Senator, before you begin, I'm just going to remind you to turn the microphone on, if you would. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Representative McCarthy Vahey and Senator Anwar uh, and members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, I'm Martin Looney, State Senator of the 11th uh, District, representing uh, parts of New Haven and Hamden, and would like to comment on three bills on today's agenda, uh, Senate or House Bill 5319, 5319, an act requiring a plan concerning private equity firms acquiring or holding an ownership interest in healthcare facilities, House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital finance assistance, and Senate Bill Number 9, an act promoting hospital financial uh, stability. Uh, House Bill 5320 would increase Connecticut's protections from uh, predatory hospital debt uh, collection practices. Uh, I was one of the co-sponsors of the 2003 legislation with then State Senator Chris Murphy, uh, who was our Senate Chair of Public Health at the time, uh, which was the original legislation that prohibited some of these uh, predatory debt collection practices by hospitals and our follow-up legislation then in uh, 2021, uh, which updated our statutes to address hospital-affiliated entities. And uh, uh, I support the changes in, that this bill would make and, and would like to uh, suggest some additional protections. Uh, I was recently uh, contacted by uh, Chuck Dell, Program Director for the Consumer Reports Advocacy, that's uh, formerly Consumer Union, and he suggested that Connecticut consider banning the reporting of medical debt to credit bureaus. Currently, we don't allow it for one year. And clearly, no one acquires medical debt voluntarily. It's always when people are uh, in extremis and uh, uh, have to get the care that they often can't afford. Uh, and uh, we should realize that uh, New York and Colorado have already done this. Uh, and uh, he also indicated a link to an advisory opinion from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that indicates that states do have the power uh, to do this. So I would, uh, would urge the committee to, uh, to add that to this bill. Uh, House Bill 5319 would require the Office of Health Strategy uh, to create a plan with legislative recommendations to improve the oversight of private equity ownership in healthcare. Our state must address this current trend regarding not only hospitals, but also other healthcare providers. Uh, I've been in uh, contact with Attorney General Tong, uh, language to beef up oversight of acquisitions and mergers, including those involving private equity, and look forward to working with the committee on, on this important issue. And finally, Senate Bill 9 addresses several issues regarding hospital regulation. Uh, but in reviewing it, uh, I find that uh, one section uh, somewhat of concern, and that is uh, Section 4F, uh, lines 323 to 330, uh, which appear to grant automatic approval to all practice acquisitions made by any entity until December 31st, 2025. Uh, that, I think, is an alarming uh, 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 relinquishing of oversight. Uh, and I would look forward to working with the committee on updating our statute on practice acquisition, uh, but believe that automatic approvals are, are not the appropriate way to go. Uh, in fact, would, uh, would also uh, encourage the committee uh, to shift the presumption of approval, uh, that, uh, that the presumption of approval be removed from the current statute and that the size of the practice that triggers a review uh, be lowered. And uh, I wanna thank the committee for hearing these uh, important bills and dealing with so many issues of great import uh, to our people every year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Looney, and thank you for being such a longtime champion for uh, healthcare access and affordability in our state. Are there questions? Senator Amor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Looney, for your uh, recommendations and, and also the work that you've been doing. So looking forward to uh, listening to each and every one of your comments and moving forward with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Looney. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And again, uh, yeah. every blessing on the great work that this committee does year in and year out. Thank you. We appreciate that. Next on our list is Representative Jennifer Lieber. Welcome. Thank you, and I think the microphone's still on. Uh, good morning. 
uh, chairs, Rep. McCarthy Dahey and Senator Anwar and ranking members, Representative Clara Destitria and Senator Summers and all the good members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Jennifer Lieber, State Representative from Fairfield, and I'm very happy to be back before you today to testify in support of HB 5318, an act concerning the licensure of lactation consultants. In 22, I was shocked to learn that the clinical lactation services are not available for Medicaid reimbursement because of their lack of licensure. And therefore, women on Medicaid are often locked out of clinical lactation support after they leave the hospital. I have not come across any other area in healthcare where we provide durable medical equipment, in this case, breast pumps, and no professional support to accompany it. Having experienced my own mismanaged care in the hospital by another licensed healthcare professional, I was extremely grateful to several IBCLCs who identified what was happening and got me and my baby the proper care and salvaged my ability to breastfeed. After last session, I, along with my MAPOC subcommittee on women and children's co-chair, organized a working group of public health experts across the public health spectrum from pediatricians to OBs, researchers, IBCLCs, and a peer counselor. We held six meetings over four months, all of which were recorded on CTN and available and linked to in our final recommendations. Our unanimous recommendation was to license the International Board Certified Lactation Consultants, or IBCLCs, to both protect patients and also to create a pathway for Medicaid reimbursement so that low-income mothers and babies can access this care. This recommendation is consistent with the U.S. Surgeon General's recommendations from 2011, from the Surgeon General's call to action to support breastfeeding. Quoting the Surgeon General, International board certified lactation consultants are healthcare professionals who specialize in the clinical management of breastfeeding. The only healthcare professional certified in lactation management. They carry certification by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Like all other U.S. certification boards for healthcare professionals, the IBCLE operates under the direction of the U.S. National Commission for Certifying Agencies and maintains rigorous professional standards. IBCLC candidates must demonstrate sufficient academic preparation as well as experience and supervised direct consultation on breastfeeding to be eligible to take the certification exam. Low-income mothers and mothers of color have lower initiation rates and also shorter breastfeeding duration than their non-low-income and non-Hispanic white peers. It has been well documented through many studies that lactation support and clinical management increase the rates of breastfeeding for all groups. Increased breastfeeding is a piece of the puzzle in closing our maternal health outcome gaps. We are recommending licensing only IBCLCs because we want to ensure that there are not two tiers of care and that women on Medicaid can access clinical care and not only peer support. I have lots more to say, but I'm sure I'm brushing up my uh, against my three minutes. And so I have submitted longer testimony and I'm grateful for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Leeper. And thanks to you and your co-chair uh, who I believe we'll hear from later today and the MAPOC Working Group for providing such a thorough analysis and background information for all of us to review, as well as your written testimony. Are there questions? Senator Amor. Thank you, Madam uh, Co-Chair. Uh, Representative Leeper, thank you for the work that you've done as, as a co-chair of MAPOC. I'm, I'm privy to the hard work that has gone on behind the scenes. Even though we look at this uh, bill, there are hundreds of hours of work that have gone on behind the scenes to make it uh, right for everyone in our state. So I wanted to thank you for that and, and each and everyone who participated in the process. And I'm sorry that last time around this uh, bill did not go through. Hopefully we'll take it across the finish line this time and, and uh, we'll be able to make sure we help each and every one of our families who do need support for this. So thank you for that. Thank you, Senator Amwar. Representative Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Leeper, for all your really hard work on this uh, over the, the last many months. We're, we're grateful for that. Um, I have two quick questions. My first one is, if you've been to our other meetings, you know we like to talk about data, data collection, and how that informs the policy we're making. So you reference this, but can you speak a little bit more to the specific data that demonstrates why um, supportive breastfeeding is important for health equity? 
Thank you so much for that question. And um, most folks know I also really love data. <laughs> so the data is very clear on the health benefits to both mothers and babies. And just to put some statistics to this impact, uh, per the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, a nationally representative sample found that breastfeeding was associated with a 21% reduced risk in postneonatal death for all infants and a 31% reduced risk for black infants. A recent analysis linking birth and death certificates for all US births in 2017 found that any breastfeeding of non-Hispanic black infants is associated with a 17% reduction in infant mortality and a 29% reduction in neonatal mortality. And lastly, and I think to highlight the impact on closing our maternal health outcome gaps, mothers who breastfeed experience lower risk of type two diabetes, breast, ovarian, and endometrial cancer, but also specifically hypertension, which is the leading cause of maternal deaths. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Rick Leeper. That's seems really compelling to me and um, something that we really wanna to work towards supporting. My other quick question is, uh, I know you referenced this in your testimony, but if you could just give us the highlights of, I believe you proposed some changes to the legislation as it's currently written, so we'd love to know what those are. Yeah, thank you. There were a couple uh, components to the bill before you that were not consistent with the recommendations put forward by the working group. Uh, specifically, we'd like to add a definition of perinatal health worker so that we can ensure we are not excluding any of our peri health, uh, perinatal health workers, which are doulas, community health workers, peer counselors, uh, WIC peer counselors, peer supporters, breastfeeding and lactation educators or counselors, childbirth educator, social worker, home visitor, and any other perinatal educator from practicing within their scope of practice. These professionals are really important in the entire spectrum of caring for the mother-baby dyad, and we would not want to pass anything that would exclude them from that practice. And then uh, the second primary concern with the uh, language in this bill is section three, uh, part B, in which we would strike that in its entirety. We don't believe it's consistent with the recommendations because our recommendations are quite specific to to license clinical lactation management. And um, we believe this section actually opens the door for almost anyone else. But thank you for the question. Got it, thanks for explaining that. We also think a lot about workforce. So wanting to lift up those professionals seems really important. Thank you for your for all your work, Rep. Lieber. Thanks for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Parker. Representative Clara DeStetria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, for all your hard work. I know you've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, what is the licensure fee that will be? I'm enacted? really grateful you asked that because I did include that in my written comments and uh, we would not support the really high fee that's uh, currently proposed. And we think a one-time $200 initiation fee and then a every other year $100 um, renewal fee would be a much more reasonable expenditure for IBCLCs. This is not a high paying profession as I'm sure you can imagine. And we don't want to inadvertently discourage people from getting into this practice because it's it's too expensive. They get, what's the proposed fee in the bill? The bill has the initial fee. Uh, give me one moment. The initial fee at $350 and then an annual fee at $190. And I just want to reiterate, we're not in support of those really high fees. Thank you. And do you know how those fees compare to neighboring states or any state for that matter? So I actually looked at our nursing fees and I made the suggestion I did to be more in line with the nursing fees. There's actually not that many states that have licensed IBCLCs, so we don't have a lot of good comparative models for fee structure. So I looked at our other clinical uh, providers. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Clara DeStetria. Seeing no other questions, thank you for being with us today, Representative Leeper, and again, for all your work on this important issue. Next, we have Dr. Deidre Gifford.
Dr. Gifford, welcome. Thank you, Representative. Good morning, Representative McCarthy Vahey, Senator Anwar, uh, Representative Claritis Dietria, Senator Summers, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Very happy to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Deidre Gifford, and I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Health Strategy. I'm pleased to be able to offer testimony on three bills uh, this morning, SB 9, the Governor's Act Promoting Hospital Financial Stability, HB 5319, an act requiring a plan concerning private equity firms, and HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. First of all, uh, in strong support of the Governor's Bill, SB 9, um, I, I will start by saying something that I think we all agree on, which is that a well-functioning, efficient hospital system that serves the needs of Connecticut residents is an essential part of our public health system. And as such, the state has a critical role in understanding the financial condition of hospitals and the financial practices of hospital ownership to ensure that they are not having negative impact on the health and safety of patients and communities. We've seen a lot of changes in the last 10 to 15 years uh, impacting our hospital systems. Consolidation and other transformations in the hospital sector have raised some concerns about hospital financial stability. And in the past year, we have seen several hospitals either seeking financial assistance from the state or facing challenges in meeting their financial obligations for a variety of reasons. So the governor's bill SB9 proposes important new initiatives that will provide an early warning system of hospital financial instability and give the state additional opportunities to protect the interests of patients and communities. Sections three and four of this bill would close a loophole in the transfer of ownership and would require state review and approval of certain types of transactions that currently do not require review. For example, the sale of a hospital parent company from one entity to another, or the sale of a, by a hospital of its real estate assets do not currently undergo review. And the governor's bill would uh, close that loophole. It would allow OHS to identify potential negative impacts of these transactions on the hospital's financial stability, quality, or access, and allow the opportunity to impose safeguards or remedies as part of the approval process. Second, Section 5 of the bill would make important and significant modifications to the CON approval criteria found in our statute. The governor believes that the CON process should be transparent, efficient, and effective. To that end, these modifications clarify and improve the approval criteria to make it easier for applicants to, to provide the information they need when they make a CON application and to avoid a time consuming back and forth between the agency and the applicant to get uh, the information that's required. Excuse Last me, question. Dr. Gifford, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. If you could finish that lastly, and then we're going I'll have some questions for you on the other bills as well. Happy to. Section six of the bill requires additional reporting um, by hospitals to the to OHS of some key financial metrics on a more frequent basis. Um, these is a small number of uh, data elements that would be reported on a quarterly basis that would give the office an opportunity to have an early warning when hospitals were facing um, financial challenges. So the governor's bill provides a comprehensive approach to some of the significant challenges in our healthcare delivery system, and I respectfully encourage uh, support of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Gifford. Dr. Gifford, you mentioned that you had uh, thoughts about 5319 and 5320. And 5319, um, just to speak about private equity, I know you referenced a few moments ago um, just the different methods of funding and trying to close some loopholes in the governor's bill. Uh, can you speak to 5319 and, and your thoughts about that? Happy to. So that bill would require OHS to develop a plan uh, to address uh, private equity acquisition of uh, healthcare entities. Um, we believe that we agree and support that this is uh, something that is an important consideration. We believe that the governor's bill 
would include uh, reviews of purchases or transfers of ownership involving a number of different types of entities, but that would include uh, private equity. Similarly, transfers of a large group practices or other types of healthcare institutions, transfers of ownership involving private equity would also be covered or covered under the governor's bill. Okay, thank you. And then finally, um, before I go to Senator Amar, uh, 5320, I'm also interested in hearing your just a summary of your thoughts about that bill as well. Thank you, Representative. Uh, OHS supports the intent of this bill, which is to uh, improve the availability of hospital financial assistance. Um, we, we can't support the bill in its current form because it requires some responsibilities for OHS that are not currently contemplated in the governor's budget, but we, we'd be happy to discuss further with members of the committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Gifford. Senator Amwar. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Gifford, thank you for your testimony and, and, and the work that you and your team are doing. Um, uh, with respect to the private equity, um, of course, the, the idea is that the Office of Health Strategies would be involved um, if there's any change of ownership uh, with the healthcare systems or uh, practices. Um, what are the ways potentially that Office of Health Strategy can help protect us from what we have seen nationally, not necessarily in Connecticut, but nationally, um, to, to make sure that the citizens of the state can be protected if that happens. Thank you, Senator. The statutory criteria that are in our, uh, over, our overarching statutes for CON now um, only require certificate of need when there is a change in control at the immediate ownership level of a facility. What the governor's bill does is that it requires review uh, at any level of control of the facility, parent, grandparent, um, or any entity with a 20% or more controlling interest. That review, Senator, to respond specifically to your question, would allow us, first of all, to evaluate where there, there is any risk to the institution that's being acquired. And if there's no risk, then the, that uh, evidence would be developed through the CON process. But it would allow OHS to uh, seek remedies through an agreed settlement, or if it's a hospital through imposed conditions, seek remedies such as we've seen in other states that might prevent some of the adverse impacts on the healthcare system uh, from fi financial practices that are not in the best interest of the patients or the communities. Um, so, so for example, there, there have been um, information that uh, some of these entities would sell parts of the hospital which are not making enough money or are providing care to the most uh, indigenous communities, or they may sell the building to a real estate investment trust or something. So with this bill, we would require some of those transactions to go through the state uh, Office of Health Strategies to uh, assess the pros and cons of all those options. Is that's, that? That's correct, Senator. Okay, thank you so much for clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Summers to be followed by Representative Claritas Dietria. Yes, good morning, and thank you for your testimony. Um, I have a question specifically on SB9, um, which has to do with Section 4, Lines 323 through 330. Um, it speaks, and I don't need to read it if the, um, the commissioner has uh, it in front of her. What I'm trying to find out is, what does this language mean? Who is it for, and why was it put in the bill? I want to make sure I have the, the could you read, uh, Senator, the specific language? I can read you the language, too, if that is helpful. Um, it says, withstanding the provisions of this section, hold on, one, sorry, and section 19A-639, as amended by this act, and 19A-639A, uh, on or before December 31st, 2025, the unit shall automatically issue a certificate of need to any large group practice or healthcare facility, except a hospital license pursuant to chapter 368 for transfer of ownership as defined in subparagraph C of subdivision 16 of section 19.3-630 as amended by this act upon such practice or facility submission of a certificate of need request determination by the unit. So I'm trying to figure out who is that put in for, what is this specifically addressing, and why is this language in the bill? 
Senator, I do very much appreciate the question because Senator Looney also raised this issue. So um, let us uh, uh, clarify. Um, so this, the governor's bill would require OHS to review transfers of ownership, not only for hospitals, but for large group practices and other types of healthcare institutions and facilities that are not currently subject to CON. So it adds a new body of work to OHS, including large group practices, other types of institutions and other facilities. Certain of those transfers are not subject to CON right now under existing law. We would be adding those under the governor's bill, but because we do not know the volume of those transactions that we need to anticipate, and we don't want to slow down the certificate of need process uh, by having an onslaught of new applications that we are not staffed or resourced to review. The way we have proposed in the legislation is that those transactions would come to us as a notification or determination, but they would not be assessed uh, like a typical certificate of need until a further date. That would allow us to know how many of these do we see in 2025? And is it 100, is it five, is it 300? And, and we would need to be staffed appropriately depending on the volume. Let me make one thing super clear because I think uh, it's, it's, um, there's a, a, a little bit of a clarification required. Transfers of ownership of group practices and other uh, facilities and institutions that are currently subject to CON under the existing law would continue to be subject to CON. What this delay pertains to is only those new reviews that we don't have an ability to understand how many are out there happening. So it would give us a year to sort of count how many are out there, what are the resources needed, and, and then it would be uh, uh, put into practice in 2026. Does that, does that clarify it for you, Senator? You know, it does clarify it a little bit. I feel like the Office of Health Strategy, though, is just continuing to get bigger and bigger and bigger as far as all the things that we're looking at for CON. And there's some of us that, um, you know, if you do the analysis in some other states, the, the price of health care without CON um, is um, no more than with CON. So I think that there are, and there's been a lot of um, issues with, you know, larger hospital systems trying to buy failing hospitals and through the CON process, how it is taking forever to get um, through that process. So it's this particular um, language was, to me, it appeared like it was opening up the floodgate to let institutions go around the CON process, but I must have been reading it incorrectly. So thank you for that clarification. I may have more. I think one of the things that might help this committee is for us to get a clear and definite list of the types of practices that you just described that are not part of the CON and what would be part of the CON going forward. Um, that I think that would be helpful for us if so we could decide if this is the direction we want to go. But thank you for your testimony. You're welcome and, and happy to provide that clarifying information, Senator. Thank you, Senator Summers. And in fact, uh, Representative Clara Distitria had a similar question. And I will note, we will have additional CON bills uh, before us at a future hearing date, just so that members are aware of that as well. We have Representative Cook followed by Senator Gordon. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, I just want to touch base briefly, and I, I think it's just for public clarification. So HB 5319, when we talk about um, private equity firms, and it's one of our favorite subjects, as you know, um, and nursing homes. So obviously, would this, under the definition of healthcare facility, that would also encompass nursing homes, correct? Actually, no, Representative. Um, the CON process by statute for nursing homes is housed at the Department of Social Services, and OHS does not review transactions pertaining to nursing homes. Thank you for that clarification. I greatly appreciate that. Maybe it's something we need to also look at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Cook. 
I think there will be ongoing continued conversations about certificates of need in, in this committee and have been in others. Uh, we have Senator Gordon. Uh, thank you very thank you very much, Madam Chair. Woman, and it's nice to see you again. Thank you for being here. Um, quick note about HB 5319. I think it is extremely important. We are looking at what those firms do. As you know, we're dealing with that now with a firm that has been dealing with Rockville Hospital, which is in my district and others. And I think that we can see the problems that can be created. And um, I think there's some things we should be doing more than what's in SB9 to not only protect the people of Connecticut, but those whose jobs are dependent upon the hospitals, and especially if it's going to go to a private equity firm. So I'll reserve any of my questions about that to to uh, another public hearing. Um, I just have two quick questions. One is when we're talking about in uh, Bill 9, and those are the lines that Senator Summers had raised, 323 to 330. If it's going to be an automatic issue of a certificate of need um, for somebody or a group that falls within this new wording, right, is OHS going to be charging a fee for whatever is going to be submitted? Because it does create time and effort and money and resources to submit these things. So one of the things I have a question about, if it's an automatic uh, CON, are you going to be charging them a fee just to submit something that's going to be automatically approved anyway? Thank you for that question, Senator. It's a good question. Um, so we, we would not be requiring an entire CON application. It's more of a notification. Um, and I don't believe we charge, I'm checking with my team, we don't charge for a determination. So the answer is no, there would be no charge to the applicant. They would fill out a standardized form that lets us know that this transaction is happening. We'd be able to count them uh, before it goes into law that we would need to review them so that we would understand the resources that would be required. And thank you, and I appreciate that, and I would hope that if we were to accept this wording, we make it very clear there's no fee, so in the future, suddenly there isn't a surprise billing uh, that's going on. And my last question, at least for right now, is, uh, and you may not know this right now, and you can get back to me in the committee, is lines 323 to 330 in Bill 9, does it at all conflict with the provisions of 19A638A3? which is existing law. And I, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but it is an important thing to note. And I, that's why I flagged it. And certainly if you need to get back to us with the answer, I'm happy to know. But uh, there have been some concerns by, by some that there might be a potential conflict. Maybe there isn't, but that's why I'm asking at the public hearing. Dr. Gifford, if you could turn your mic on. Sorry. Senator, would you mind restating, uh, I see the lines you're referring to, which are the same lines that others had questions about, but what is the statute that you want us to compare it to? Sure. It's statute 19A638A3. Okay. Uh, not having ha have that statutory language committed to memory, I won't attempt to answer it now. I will only say um, that uh, this language is not intended to modify anything in existing statute. It only changes the future applications and puts them off for a year. So with that sort of blanket, we'll be happy to get back to you with specifics about those lines in the statute. And I would appreciate that just because some people have raised a concern that there is a conflict in what you're proposing with existing law. Uh, and maybe there isn't. Just want to make certain we're clear on that because it's an important Point and might not be actually a minor issue if there's a conflict. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. I think that's a question also uh, well directed to our LCO and OLR attorneys, which we will do as well. Seeing no other questions, Dr. Gifford, I know we will be in conversation with you again. Thank you for your time with us today and for all the good work you do at the Office of Health Strategy. You're welcome, and I will look forward to further conversations. Thanks. Thank you. Next on our list is our comptroller, Sean Scanlon. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, Senator 
Anwar, members of the committee. It is good to be back in a different way. Uh, but I'm here this morning. I know you have a very long agenda uh, to testify in favor of House Bill 5322, uh, which is an act concerning the distribution of educational materials uh, regarding intimate partner violence. Um, in addition to being married to the CEO and president of the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence uh, and working with her uh, to combat domestic violence and intimate partner violence uh, across our state, um, I, as comptroller, uh, upon being elected, formed uh, a healthcare cabinet. Uh, given my interest in this issue, those of you who have served on this committee for a while know that healthcare was the thing I cared the most about when I served both on this committee and as chair of the insurance committee prior to being comptroller. And we brought together the best and the brightest uh, from across our state on eight different subcommittees to look at ways that we can make healthcare better in the state of Connecticut. The women's subcommittee uh, was one of the subcommittees that looked at domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and one of the recommendations of that task force and that subcommittee was to do this very bill that's in front of you. Uh, and the reason for that is because we unfortunately know all too well that intimate partner violence is a particular threat uh, to women and birthing people during and right after a birth of a child. And in from 2015 to 2021, one in three of the maternal mortalities that occurred in this state happened because of intimate partner violence. And so uh, a few months ago, I think some of you were there, I convened a roundtable over in another room here of stakeholders looking at maternal mortality in this state. Uh, Connecticut has made so many great strides when it comes to trying to combat it. But Connecticut is still woefully lagging in our national rankings, and we actually have much more prevalence of maternal mortality uh, and infant mortality in our state than I think anyone would ever want. So one way that we can combat that is to make sure that anybody who has a child uh, is given materials upon leaving that hospital. You know, I've had two kids. We get home. Yale gave us packets of information, um, but not included in that information was anything to do with intimate partner violence at a time when we know from statistically that that is the greatest threat uh, to that mother and to that child. We can fix that by passing this bill. And I would encourage all of you uh, to take a look at this and hopefully to pass it and help the task force that we put together and the cabinet uh, advance one of the most important recommendations that they made to this body and to me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to you and also to your wife, Megan, for her incredible advocacy on this issue. We have seen crime in, in so many ways decrease, but when it comes to intimate partner violence, the numbers are going in the wrong direction. So thank you for being an advocate. Representative Berger Javala to be followed by Representative Wielander. Thank you so much for being here today and for sharing this really important point of view. The um, only thing, it's really more of a comment, um, is I would really like for everyone who is watching this and hearing your support for this to look more closely at their own districts and see um, that they may be surprised and shocked to see how many um, are affected by intimate partner violence within their own um, their own district. So thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate thank you, it tremendously. Thank you, Representative. Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also agree. This is a fantastic proposal. My and you referenced it very quickly, but I just my one concern is to make sure that any information that is provided is along with all of the other information that is provided, so we don't inadvertently put anyone at risk um, by handing out something that is this topic specific. My understanding, Representative, the goal of this is to make sure that that's included in that postpartum packet of information that is given out by all the hospitals in the state. Um, you know, I know there's everything in there from Chet to how to install a car seat to so many other things that we've mandated over the years. This would just be a part of that overall packet. Thank you. And one final thing, when, did, when you mentioned hospital, I believe it is in the testimony that it is any like birthing center. Absolutely. Anywhere yes. that I keep saying hospital, but yes, it's just anywhere. Just double check. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Wielander, for that inclusion. Representative Claritas Dietrio to be followed by Representative Reddington Hughes. And then Senator Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today. Do you know uh, how many pages this will entail for the, to be added to the packet? 
I do not know that that's been determined yet. I think what this bill would do is just require that it be uh, distributed, but it would be up to the people to determine what that looked like and the size and all those other characteristics. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Representative Reddington used to be followed by Senator Gordon. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question has to do with folks that have home births. Um, is there any information that is sent to them uh, because they obviously would not have been at a hospital? So I just didn't know if there was anything that was ever sent to them. It's a good question. I believe that they would receive some information. I don't know the manner in which that that happens, but certainly can look into that and get back to your representative. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Senator Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Pomtrol, it's good to see you again. Likewise, Senator. Uh, I did track as best as I could the work that your health cabinet was doing, and I'm glad to see that when it comes to rural health, uh, you guys propose things that I've been advocating for for years, and even some that I've submitted this session on uh, before your report. Um, one question I have, it's more mechanics. Um, who actually or what committee will be working on what will now be added to the packet. I'm not opposed to the bill. I just want to better understand who actually will be creating the additional paperwork and what, so I can have an idea to track that. My understanding would be that it would be probably a collaboration between the Department of Public Health, who is required, I think is in charge of that dissemination of that and working with Connecticut Hospital Association, my wife's organization, CCADV, to come up with what form and manner that is and then have it be distributed throughout the different birthing centers in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gordon. Representative Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Comptroller. It's lovely to see Megan Scanlon's husband spending some time with us today. Um, I just wanted to share um, that uh, the Maternal Mortality Review Committee uh, is a group that's working on this information, has actually created something. And so what we're getting into in this bill is about making sure that's distributed, not just digitally, including to doulas, so folks that may be involved in home births, but then also some potential printing or hopefully printing to get out actually to the hospitals and birthing centers so we can handle this out in person. Uh, we appreciate your advocacy, Sean, uh, and happy to talk to folks that are interested in this as we keep going forward. Thanks for your time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Parker. Seeing no further questions, Comptroller Scanlon, we are grateful for your advocacy and partnership with your amazing wife and CCADV and all who have been working on this issue to help provide safety for our moms and babies and birthing people. Thank, Thank you. you all. Have a great day today. Next on our list is Maraid Painter. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, Senator Summers, Representative Claritis Dietria, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Marie Painter, the state long-term care ombudsman, and I'm happy to testify before you today on HB 5319, an act requiring a plan for nursing homes and their ownership related to private equity firms and their acquisitions. As a state long-term care ombudsman, I support this bill, and I'm committed to safeguarding the rights, well-being, and overall care for residents in skilled nursing facilities. I believe that this legislation will improve transparency, accountability, and quality in care. The bill seeks to address a growing concern related to private equity firms acquiring or holding ownership interests in skilled nursing facilities. Study after study report when private equity firms are involved in the ownership or investors in skilled nursing facilities, there are significant implications related to the delivery of care and services to residents. The compelling evidence presented in recent studies underscores the urgent need for this legislative action. Research featured in the JAMA Health Forum and the National Bureau of Economic Research provides a stark description of the consequences associated with private equity ownership in nursing facilities. These studies highlight increased rates of preventable hospitalizations, higher mortality rates, and escalated prescriptions of antipsychotic drugs, decreased frontline nurse staffing hours, and elevated taxpayer dollars spent per resident in private equity-owned nursing homes versus their competitors. Furthermore, the devastating impact of private equity ownership during COVID-19 as observed in New Jersey in the case study in 2020 cannot be overlooked. 
This study revealed a 30% higher infection rate and a 40% higher death rate in homes backed by private equity compared to the others and the statewide average. It is essential that we gain an understanding regarding how this is impacting the residents in our state. The development of a comprehensive plan to help policymakers address whether the certificate of need should be required for private equity acquisitions, what other limitations on private equity involvement might be needed, and the further disclosure requirements for health facilities is recommended. I believe this would only strengthen the pr protections and improve outcomes for residents. I've seen firsthand the impact of ownership structures on the quality of care provided to residents. Private equity involvement cannot be introduced without challenges, including potential conflicts of interest and prioritizing profits over the well being of the residents. The proposed legislation provides an opportunity for Connecticut to proactively address these issues and ensure that residents receive the highest standard of care, regardless of the ownership structure. By addressing private equity in their unique challenges, Connecticut can set a precedent for other states in safeguarding our residents. Included in my written testimony are references to research articles that highlight the impact and further discuss this issue, underscoring the importance of this study. Thank you. Ms. Painter, thank you. I'd like to say thank you, but some of the uh, information you've presented is actually uh, very disturbing. So uh, thank you for bringing it to light. Um, but I also, I believe Senator Amor has a question and we may have others. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, those numbers are quite scary. Can you speak them again, if you could? And then also, do you have a written testimony? Because I did not see that associated with the bill yet. I do, and I'll be submitting it right after this. But okay. the numbers, um, there is a lot of information included. However... The I mortality think... rate was 30% higher. Yes, during COVID Three zero. In, in New Jersey, there was a study um, in 2020 and it showed that there was a 30% higher infection rate and a 40% higher death rate in private equity backed nursing homes compared to other homes statewide. Wow, thank you so much. This I, I hope people are listening to this fact that the, the private equity who come as a savior for healthcare are resulting in more infections and more deaths of our most vulnerable and precious uh, citizens in, in, in any of the states. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Marks, to be followed by Representative Cook. Um, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, thanks, Ms. Painter. It's great to see you um, again. I just want to thank you that it's because of your advocacy and because of your leadership. Um, as the ombudsman, I don't think you have to be doing this, but I think because you take such great pride in your work and the people that you serve are so important to you and that you've seen this unbelievable inequity and the poor care that our seniors are getting, that you have opened all of our eyes to the private equity um, dilemma, the private equity, I'm not sure what the word is, ripoff in the seniors in um, nursing homes. And I am forever grateful for you for what you have done for everybody sitting at this table and for the seniors in Connecticut. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Marks Rip Cook. Hi, Marid. And I want to echo the sentiments on the gratitude. I think it's so vitally important that the work that you're doing is, um, is being done. It's sad that it has to be. Um, I want to clarify something that... Um, Deidre Gifford stated when we talk about 5319 and they were talking about it, didn't, this piece of legislation does not cover nursing homes. So you discuss skilled living facilities. Um, I just want to bring that to your attention and then ask you, as we know that there's a variety of different pieces of legislation that are all over the place, but OHS apparently does not cover the nursing home component. It comes under... Um, human services, which you and I spent a lot of time there. But I think that the conversation remains the same. So my question for you is, as we look at 5319 and the private equity that you are referring to, um, 
I think it warrants that conversation to our chairs about how we look to add those two together because as much as we might recognize that something doesn't fall under one department or the other, this is still a public health issue. Um, and I want to ensure that we don't silo this conversation out. So my question for you would be, how do you see us blending that together um, if we recognize where we are? Um, as we know that a significant amount of loss is happening, um, we know that there are truly good actors and bad actors in this business. Um, and we know that over the last several weeks, the newspapers have been diligent about reporting this conversation to ensure that the money that is hidden um, from those private owners has many, many legs and then tentacles off of those legs and following the dollars is beyond <laughs> frustrating um, and back taxes that are owed and a variety of other things that are happening to where Folks could, in essence, be put in harm's way if a facility closes if we take no action. So would you like to speak to that just a little bit? Yes, thank you for asking that. I think that any CON process where you have an entity that impacts individuals' care and services and that they could potentially financially gain from how they control what's delivered and how those services are delivered to individuals, especially if it's tied to taxpayer dollars, that we should have a clear understanding of any investors ownership. Um, and it would allow us really what we're trying to work on on a national schedule, a le national level is to see what is the impact in how they're providing care across the country. And so if they're gonna come into our state and buy a facility or invest in a healthcare entity, that we have a good understanding of who is coming in, who's investing in care and services in our state and are these investors that we should be allowing to come in and purchase um, healthcare companies in our state? Thank you for that. And I think that we should go one step farther. When folks are in bad standing, they're not allowed to take new patients. So I'm just leaving you with that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Marid, for everything. Thank you, Representative Cook. And indeed, the conversations uh, related to the certificate of need and private equity are intimately linked. Private equity's sole goal and focus is to make money. That is not the sole goal and focus of healthcare. However, we know that there is cost and budgeting that is required. Um, that's the balance that we seek to have as we look at our certificate of need process. It's about access quality and cost, all of those things, but ultimately that is in service of a mission of caring for patients. So thank you for this conversation. Again, as I said to Dr. Gifford and Will, to many others, these are, will be ongoing conversations as we seek to balance the issues of cost and the ability to provide equitable care. So thank you for being with us today. We are grateful for your work every day. Thank you very much. Next on our list is Representative Mitch Belinsky. Welcome, Representative. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. If I allow me to just organize my papers here very quickly. You know, it's um, it's it's an honor to be before this committee. So, um, aside from the the formality of saying uh, you know good morning to the co-chairs uh, and to the ranking members um, and to all the members of this committee, I I I, I want to acknowledge the serious conversations that you know come before um, you know the access to care, the the private equity questions that um, that that nobody seems to want to talk about. Um, and this this is uh, not part of my testimony. This is a, this is just my this is my personal um, my personal perspective on on uh, the conversation that just happened, um, and uh, you know, the information that comes through the sharing of questioning from people like um, Representative Cook. Um, uh, she she and I experienced um, some pretty eye opening tragic 
family circumstances um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it was related to the conversations that just took place. So um, um, forgive, forgive my distraction, but uh, I am here today with good news. So I'm here to uplift you. Uh, I wanna thank this committee with all of my heart for raising bill number uh, 5323, uh, which is an act developing a plan for licensure of dance movement therapists or what they call themselves DMTs. Um, I'm also here to commit to the Department of Public Health and to this committee, the full support of people that have been waiting for the opportunity to be licensed for over six years. And, um, you know, how we got to where we are is is much less consequential to, you know, than, than to where we need to be. Because uh, DMT, dance movement therapy, is a complementary therapy for mental health patients. And what it does is amazing. Um, and you might be wondering, what's what's a big guy like me doing sitting in the front of the room talking about dance therapy? And because um, I'm not going to be dancing with any stars anytime soon. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, circumstances sometimes put you in funny places. Um, and I don't mean funny, haha, I mean just ironic places. Um, I represent Kent Newtown. And my first exposures to expressive, creative therapies um, came very early in my service to the state of Connecticut and to the, to the town of Newtown and to my neighbors and to my friends. Um, and the trauma, the pure trauma of living through or seeing or even reading about something that no human being should ever have to even put into their consciousness is crippling. So for a moment, and I'm very careful with how I use my words here because, because I don't have the privilege of exploiting these words. Excuse me, Representative Belinsky, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I know it goes quickly, but there are there's at least one question for you, so you will have an ability to much. share a little bit more. Um, Representative Clara Destitria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, for being here today on this very important issue. Um, a couple questions. How many other states license their dance movement therapists? Um, I believe it's over 40. There, there's, a, there's a full association um, that is involved with this, and uh, we don't have a single state in the uh, region in New England that is not licensing these. As a matter of fact, the uh, DMTs uh, that are certified to practice that live in the state of Connecticut have to practice outside of the state. Um, they came to me and they asked um, if they could bring their art home. And uh, the healing powers of this particular therapy are, are so profound um, that the journey for these creative art therapies actually began uh, long ago with the passage in 2019 of the art therapy bill, uh, followed by the music therapist last year. And this year, uh, we're looking to you know put an exclamation point on the DMT as well as a complementary therapy. So um, the reason I'm here is because this works. This is a way to reach people that can't be reached through talk therapy. Um, and because there's no licensure in this state, there's uh, an inability to practice. There's an inability to provide you know, the access to a therapy that works on very, very difficult to reach individuals um, but it's not covered by insurance. It's not covered by Medicaid. Um, and it doesn't even have title protection in the state of Connecticut. Whereas, um, you know, I'm, uh, my, my primary contact in this business has been, uh, a, a DMT who travels to Brooklyn, New York every day to practice her art 
And, you know, she and I have been talking for many years and she wishes nothing more in the world than to be able to work in her home state um, without that three and a half hour daily trudge back and forth. But it's not about her. It's about the people that she helps. Yes. Thank you. So she um, she is so immersed in this and has seen such dramatic changes in people that range from children to people that are traumatized in family violence, um, children of divorce, people, um, veterans with PTSD that can't be reached um, with dance and movement therapy. And you'll hear from this, uh, this particular individual, Dr. Uh, Naomi, uh, later in the testimony, she'll be testifying remote, but, um, you know, she tells stories of people that have been able to express themselves with movement um, and have that training of theirs, which includes the, you know, the clinical uh, interpretation uh, of it. It's not dance classes. It, it's, it's therapy that is drawn out, um, you know, through a different part of your brain and it works. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just here asking for the opportunity to get it licensed so that it can be practiced in our state so that the people of Connecticut that do live here can practice it here. And so that people um, of my community and yours can benefit from it um, if they can't be reached by talk therapy. Thank you. That's, that, that's a perfect explanation. And just quickly, can you tell us what education they need to become certified? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, the uh, implementation of this from an educational standpoint, there is a, there is a full um, educational complement and, uh, and, and a, a credentialing board that comes with this. So um, if I may, the American Dance Therapy Association is the credentialing body. Um, the uh, educational and continuing education requirements involved in certification are pretty rigorous as well as the practicum. Um, this is something that uh, requires a great deal of education. The exact hours are something that I will defer to um, to the therapist that will be uh, uh, testifying in uh, positions 43 and 44, I believe. But um, from a perspective of the committee and a pr the perspective of the state of Connecticut's Department of Public Health, um, we have uh, submitted scoping and uh, language around this bill uh, on a half a dozen other uh, uh, occasions. Um, and the ADTA um, and their credentialing board are fully able to uh, assist us in making sure that this thing is written out um, in a way that requires almost no work on the part of the DPH. Essentially, they'll be the ones issuing licenses and collecting the money. This whole um, this this whole exercise would be revenue positive for the state of Connecticut. It has no fiscal note, and it has practically no work involved in it. So, um, it's um, it's sort of a no brainer, and it follows very closely along the scoping and the the licensure that we've already accomplished twice, once with art therapy and once with music therapy. That's perfect. Thank you, Representative, for your answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Clara Dostitria. Representative Parker? Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Rep. Belinsky, for your advocacy. Um, my wife is an expressive arts therapist, and so I will lift up the incredible value of this uh, related field of therapy. My question is, uh, expressive arts therapists are also not licensed in the state of Connecticut. I know that she practices as a licensed professional counselor and can do work in Connecticut. Similarly, people that are social workers uh, or LMFTs can uh, do this kind of therapy in Connecticut. So Rep. Belinsky, I'm just wondering, is there have you heard from anyone? Is there any worry that people that are practicing DMT in Connecticut under a comp, you know, appropriate 
similar license, that there'd be any negative impact on folks like that? I haven't heard that myself, but just want to know if that came up in your conversations. Uh, it has not come up uh, where where there's any restriction in, in people that are practicing other, other licenses, um, because most of them are practicing in situations where they're um, working for a larger facility or a larger healthcare network. Um, that would be the only circumstance under which uh, currently uh, somebody who is a DMT um, can practice in the state of Connecticut. So um, for them, it's not a full-time job. It's, uh, it's, it's not the ability to, you know, to have a practice. Um, and it still is not something that can be claimed necessarily under um, a private health insurance plan, Medicaid, um, or anything. So we're restricting access by not having this available. Um, and, and representative as a as a individual who has has a wife that practices the creative art therapies, um, you know that you know we're dealing with um, with the ability to to reach people that are otherwise unreachable and um, and provide a, hu a, a an incredible human benefit to thousands of people in the state of Connecticut while still being able to allow our DMTs to come home and work. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Seems like a, a very well put. Uh, thanks for your advocacy, Rep. Linsky. Thanks for your time, Adam Chu. Thank, thank you, you Representative part. Parker. Representative Belinsky, thank you so much for your advocacy here and your time with us today. Thank you very much. Since we have exceeded the first hour, we are going to begin rotating. We are actually going to go to uh, Luisa Gasco Sobolewski, who is number 23 on our list. She will be next to be followed by Sarah Egan. Louisa, welcome. Oh, excuse me, if I may, if you can turn on the microphone for us, press the button. Thank you so much. Apologize. Well, good late morning, early afternoon, uh, Senator Saad Anwar, Representative McCarthy. Uh, Representative D'Amico, and the Public Health Committee. My name is Louisa Gasco Sobolewski, and I am here to testify in support of Raised House Bill 5200. I am here representing the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing community as president of Connecticut Association of the Deaf I am also a board member on Disability Rights Connecticut. And I am a co-chair of the Governor's State Advisory Board for persons who are deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing. I am a retired principal of the American School for the Deaf, and I live in Southington. I am a third generation deaf individual. I wanna thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and speak on behalf of this bill 5200. It is important that we work together to better serve our community, especially in this area of healthcare for persons with disabilities. We do have disabled, deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing members who need the same type of access, whether that be a wheelchair, mobility, visual access, along with the communication access for this population. And that accessibility is often lacking. We are asking to have what's called a universal design for every individual, meaning equitable access for everyone, regardless of the population they identify in. Every individual with disability having equitable access. 
So for example, universal design means that a ramp being there for ADA mobility access is also beneficial for parents that are using strollers, our large loads that needed to be rested, uh, needing to be uh, arriving. Another example is if you're in a loud environment at a restaurant and the TV is there, captioning, which is mainly for the deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing population, is beneficial for those in a loud environment, watching the news, trying to find out what's being said. They are then able to use closed captioning. Now in your raised bill 5200 at line 34, after assisted assistive device, we would like to see added to stating communication aid, built-in internet access, space for sign language or ASL interpreter, and visual slash light arrangements. Oftentimes we have issues with Wi-Fi, especially as we're using the video remote interpreting or VRI. Wi-Fi may not be strong enough to handle that accommodation, which causes pixelation or picture freezing during the interpretation. Also, we do need good lighting when it comes to watching the sign language or ASL interpreter and space for the interpreter to stand or sit so that the deaf person has a better view. It's important that we have that equitable access. I do wanna let you know that sometimes the interpreters have to stand away from windows because of backlighting or reflection issues. The issues have been repeatedly consistent for the deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing communities. This is frustrating for all of us. I personally have been getting several calls from the community expressing their concerns with language accessibility in the healthcare settings. So we need to be heard and this needs to be improved. We do support this bill, raised House Bill 5200, and would appreciate that we add the communication accessibility. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there, if you hang on one moment, if you don't mind, just to make sure we may have some questions or comments. And first we will begin with Senator Amwar. And then we will be followed by Representative D'Amico. Senator Amwar. You have to look at me for the comment. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I adore you. Oh my gosh, that's something I taught you two weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And if you would share the interpretation with us, that would be wonderful, Senator Amar. Say, love you and thank you. And I love you back. Yes. Thank you. Representative D'Amico. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Gasco Sobolewski, for coming and testifying today. Um, I, I appreciate. Uh, your, your suggestions as to how we can improve uh, bill, uh, House Bill 5200 uh, to, to make it stronger and better for members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, uh, since you are involved much more so with that community than I, uh, I just want to ask you uh, just one, one or two questions. Um, has, has your, have you or, 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 or the people that you work with um, um, uh, made these uh, complaints and, and or suggestions known to uh, members of, of the medical community? Uh, and, and if so, uh, what kind of a response have you received? Thank you, Representative D'Amico, for asking that question. You know, so typically the members of the deaf community call me for support 
in contacting the Department of Justice or the DOJ when any issues within the medical settings do come up. So I join as their advocate, helping them connect with a formal complaint process. Right now, there are um, there is a case where we're in the midst of just collecting information and data. I think right now, individuals in the community uh, that are experiencing the frustrations are fearful of going through the process because again, English is not their first language. Uh, and 90% of deaf individuals are born into families and parents that are hearing. Uh, only about 10%, such as myself, are born into a deaf family. And I had communication access and acquisition from birth throughout my childhood. So I was a fortunate uh, child in experiencing that. But 90% of the population do not experience that. They don't have that language access from day one. Uh, parents are hearing, baby is deaf. They're not acquiring that language. They're not getting that exposure until later in childhood, such as age three or four, potentially. And so a lot of the individuals within our community are fearful in trying to go through that process because it does heavily rely on English uh, skills. So we are seeing more and more with advocacy efforts, uh, more and more deaf individuals that are stepping forward with bravery and making their complaints known. Uh, but I would say over 12 times we've experienced willingness to work with us, and that is good news. Uh, it's about time. We are wanting to see more and more of that, uh, especially targeting the communication access across the setting, not just in hospitals, but in all medical or healthcare settings. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate the, the, your advocacy on behalf of, of the of the uh, deaf and hard of hearing community. And I especially appreciate your efforts and your suggestions to try and make this bill even better. Because after all, that's why we have these public hearings is to is to review the bills and and hopefully make them better. And, and, and uh, I'm confident that we will. So thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Tomiko. Thank you for just uh, taking the time to listen and really taking these words into thought, because um, this is coming from our community uh, into yours. So this is not just a benefit for us. We hope it's for everyone. We do have another question for you. Oh, all right. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Representative Reddington Hughes. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you for being here today and to and also for bringing uh, these issues to light for us. My question has to do with uh, other states and if you have another state that would be a great example of a place that is doing this right. That is a very good question, and if you wouldn't mind giving me some time to research a little bit more into that. But I was at a conference uh, last week, it was, where 28 different states were represented. Uh, Maine recently had a horrible uh, violent shooting occur where four deaf individuals were part of the casualty uh, list. And so Maine decided to have communication access language put in uh, to more of their work uh, just for the entire population. So if you wouldn't mind, I can reach out to Maine and those that have worked on all of the language additions. I know that Massachusetts also has a few uh, things that they have done recently. Connecticut is one of the first states that had a commission for the deaf and hard of hearing and unfortunately, we did lose that. Tomorrow, there is a public hearing for House Bill 5241, uh, which will address hopefully getting some of that service back um, from the commission type work. Uh, so let me reach out and then we'll work on that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Reddington Hughes. And again, 
thank you for being here with us today, Ms. Gasco Sobolewski. We so appreciate the time that you have taken to educate us and inform us and for your many, many years of advocacy. We appreciate you. Next on our list. And please, ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions, uh, just to make sure, clarify, it's important that we have a very collaborative working experience. So thank you. Thank you. And we will take you up on that. <laughs> please do anytime. Thank you. Next on our list is Sarah Egan to be followed online by Jennifer Toe. Miss Egan, it's nice to see you. Welcome. Good afternoon to the committee. My name is Sarah Egan. I run the state's office of the child advocate. Glasses here. We're here to testify in strong very strong, all caps, underlined support of Bill 274, and thanks to the committee for raising this bill, which we think directly addresses the state's multi-generational opioid crisis and the impact of opioids on the health and safety of children. I think many of you know, but maybe not all, that the obligations of the Office of the Child Advocate are to review, investigate, and make recommendations regarding the publicly funded state and local systems and how they meet the needs of vulnerable children. We are specifically directed among other responsibilities, to conduct child fatality review and make annual reports and investigative reports to the legislature. I want to quote the National Center for Fatality Review and Prevention when I tell you that the statutory purpose of fatality and critical incident review is to inform statewide child injury prevention efforts. According to the National Center, every child fatality must be understood as a sentinel event that should catalyze action. Since 2021, almost 50 children under the age of five have suffered an ingestion injury from opioids. 12 of these children have died. As recently as a couple of months ago, and an ingestion injury as recently as last week. Every single one of these injuries is a near fatal event for a child under the age of five. The majority of these 50 children were saved by the administration of naloxone by first responders. Based on OCA's tracking of ingestion injuries reported to DCF and coded as critical incidents by DCF, which are then copied to OCA, there has not been a reduction in the number of critical ingestion reports between 2021 and the end of 2023. Notably, while Connecticut has thankfully seen some reduction in adult overdose fatalities over the last two years, Connecticut has persistently remained in the top 10 of all states for adult opioid overdoses per 100,000 adults. It is imperative that we have a structure for developing, coordinating, strengthening public health responses that respond to the multi-generational aspects of the fentanyl crisis, including specific attention to the needs of caregivers with opioid use disorder and their children. Only a few weeks ago, the OCA issued a fatality report following the death by homicide of 10-month-old Marcello from fentanyl, xylazine, and cocaine intoxication. Marcello, who died last summer, was the 11th young child in Connecticut to die from opioid ingestion. His family had an open child abuse neglect case with DCF until weeks prior to his death, and his mother had outstanding warrants for violation of probation issued by the criminal court shortly after his birth, which were served at the time of his death. OCA found that though agencies involved with the family provided supervision and referrals to community-based services, they did not comply with all their respective policies and procedures regarding risk and safety management. OCA found that agencies' policies and processes for regarding risk and safety need improvement. OCA Excuse me, Ms. Egan, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. If you can just summarize, that yes. would be wonderful, and then we'll have some questions. OCA found that treatment for the family was poorly coordinated and that providers working with the family had varying protocols for fentanyl testing, did not share results with each other, and did not effectively safety plan for Marcello's family. Bill 274 creates a subcommittee of the state's Alcohol, Drug, and Policy Council to bring folks together, advocates like the OCA, providers, state agencies. These issues cut across state agencies, DCF, DEMIS, the Department of Correction, the, the judicial branch, all which are part of the ADPC, is an opportunity for coordinated, planful, strategic discussion 
rolling up our sleeves to talk very specifically about what are the treatment opportunities, what are the safety planning discussions, what is the availability of naloxone to caregivers. And while I appreciate that both DCF and DEMAS are gonna oppose this bill today and provide testimony that it is not needed, I want to respectfully and strongly tell you that I disagree with that. If we, I didn't think we need it, we would not keep recommending it in the reports that we put out. If all the work was getting done that needed to get done, we would not keep making this recommendation. It is not an indictment of the effort that people at state agencies and members of the ADPC, which includes the OCA, are making. It is a recognition that after 50 deaths or near deaths of children under the age of five from opioid intoxication, that this needs more attention and it needs it now. And I know I'm strong and heated today, but frankly, I feel strong and heated today. And so I'm not gonna hide that from the committee. We're always willing to work with folks to get these things over the finish line. But we need to do more. Thank and you, I'm looking Ms. forward Egan. to the opportunity to work with the agencies to get that done. Thank you. I wanna acknowledge your passion. I don't think there's anyone in this room who wouldn't share that passion when it comes to protecting children in that way and from this type of harm, which we know that opioids are an epidemic for both our adult population and now we're seeing more of our children who are suffering and struggling. I think it's just kind of taking a step away from that passion and emotion and just looking at the mechanics and the specifics of the bill itself. Some of the things in your testimony are with respect to DCF policies and procedures. And I recognize that that is the purview of the Children's Committee, and you spend a lot of time talking with them there. So this bill in particular is a part of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council, and you're a member of that, correct? Yes. Yes. So part of my question is, logistically speaking, and I sit in on those meetings as well. I have not been there as much as many of the other people in this room or uh, who are really diligently doing that work. There are a number of subcommittees already. And I think the struggle and balance that we have is as we do that work, and I found that group to be a pretty um, serious group, right? Co-chaired by leaders of, of our commissions, our commissioners, and then with providers who are in the trenches and people who are facing the issues such as yourself. The struggle is being specific and I think what you're talking about is specifically focusing on an issue that we're seeing that is more and more of a problem before us today and balancing that with not siloing. And I think we're saying the same things, but my question is, given the current makeup of the subcommittees of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council, you feel like it's important to have a separate group as opposed to having some of the existing groups take on this particular mission. Is that, is that right? I, yes, and I appreciate the question. I think there has to be a structure to support the work that we're recommending be done, which is more than itemizing the services that we have for children and families, but looking at where are the services available what is the capacity of those programs to meet the needs of the population in those catchment areas? What are the outcomes for those programs? What do we need more of? Maybe what do we need less of? How are agencies coordinating with each other and with providers to develop protocols to respond to the kind of emergencies and, and safety issues that we see? And, and I don't have all the answers at the Office of the Child Advocate. And I need and rely every day on the input from agency personnel, community providers, family advocates to do that. And I think our bill proposal, and we're not wedded to every particular word in it, and I invited Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to provide me with substitute language if they had a proposal they thought could work better. So I'm open to seeing that, right? But what I our proposal is really about, we don't think that we're having enough of this conversation. I don't think we're having enough of it at ADPC. I don't think we're having enough of it at the OSAC. We're not looking at it structurally in a, enough in an open, uh, coordinated fashion between the providers and the agencies. And that is continuously, frankly, the feedback I get from the providers and family advocates. They want more of this discussion. They supported this initiative. So 
is this the only structure for doing that? No. You know, could it possibly fit under the auspices of another subcommittee? Possibly. But it has to come, it should come with a specific mandate for this is what we want you to look at. And this is what we need reported back because we've been missing this on these young children. We've been missing it. So I'm looking for something different. And with all due respect, you know, SB9 last year required that the agencies coordinate and respond on what is the service array for caregivers with opioid use disorder, substance use disorder in their children, and where are the gaps? Well, I read that report for the first time today because it was attached to uh, the agency's testimony, and there are helpful things in it. I read it quickly. It's like 30 pages. And what I see in there is an itemization of these are the services that we have. And for most, but not all of the services, this is the utilization. What I don't see in there is the barriers and gaps analysis, right? So for example, just one more example. When it lists like where are the parent and pregnant women residential treatment programs, and it lists the places that there are, and the 150 plus admissions over fiscal year 2023, can see that there are regions of the state that don't have that program. So this morning after reviewing it, I called up a human service specialist in one of the regions that doesn't have that program. And I said, is this a program that you need? And this person says back to me, Sarah, we need everything. We need everything. Another provider I talked to this morning who runs a program for children and families said that they have a program that's not allowed to run a wait list, which some programs are just operated that way, can't have wait lists, but communicated that they turn away two to three families a week that they can't serve. So our vision for what SB9 was requiring was that analysis. What do we have? We have a lot of stuff that's good. We have a lot of things that are working, but what do we not have? And what do we need? And what is that going to cost? And what do we need to do about reimbursement rates? Because without that analysis, the legislature can't act. And that's the work that we want done. And whether it's in a subcommittee, whether it's a working group, whether it's time limited, I'm open to all of that, but it's got to be something more than what we've been doing. Thank you for that answer. I think one of the conundrums based on some of our other conversations uh, that you've had with Senator Amar and I is the challenge between assuring that our parents who need treatment and seek treatment are able to do so without facing you know, punitive consequences. And frankly, I'll put that on all of us at the legislature as well, right? We're a part of that equation because when an incident occurs and a child is, is in danger or tragically dies, we look to, and that's you know obviously your office's job, to where are those gaps and how do we get there? And then we sometimes, we become a little more strict in terms of you know what, what we're doing in order to protect children's safety. And then on the other side of that, as a parent who may be in need of treatment, you know, how do they go forward? And how do they, not only do they access services, but do so in a way that provides the support and frankly i i see the whole spectrum there whether it's the folks at dcf who are charged with assuring that those children in care and custody are safe and then those of you who are looking at these tragic incidents after the fact so i think this is it's a really complex situation it's why i went back to the specifics of the bill which is to say is this particular mechanism the best way for us to get at what is a very critical and necessary conversation because we know that when it comes to opioids and the people of our state, adults and children dying, we're, we're, we all have more to do. And we know that we need to continue to learn. We had conversations in this committee last year with some ideas and thoughts on that. We know that many of our nonprofit and agency partners are doing the same, but I'm going to uh, turn it over to Senator Amwar and we will continue this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Egan, for your testimony and, and your passion. Um, I, I just wanna make a quick little statement. I, I know this for a fact that every single person in DEMAS, every single person in DCF, they're committed to make sure 
that they are able to fulfill their requirements with the resources that they have and 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 be able to do the difficult job that's expected and necessary. Um, this epidemic is uh, grown at a rate that uh, we may not have been able to put the resources around it. And now what we are seeing is with the increase in the number of families and individuals who are exposed to the substances, uh, there are two generation families. And then we are seeing the anticipated, unfortunately anticipated ex, uh, changes and, and, and deaths of our children or near deaths of our children in our, in our state. Um, and when it comes to children, it becomes even a far more critical issue for everyone. And, and I think that's where you have looked at some 49 cases or 11 deaths and, and, and near deaths and, and the challenges. And there's a pattern that is emerging and collectively we do not have a full handle on it because the existing challenge and its ongoing increase is still something that uh, is overwhelming the existing agencies as well. So it's, it's uh, the way I see this is that the more conversations that we have and more organized structures that we create to help the legislative body and the administration put resources to protect the citizens who are going through these high risk situations and especially our children is a necessary thing. So um, I, I know that because of the bandwidth limitations at times the agencies would say maybe we should not have another group amongst 20 others that we are part of to have their conversation because it's taking us away from what needs to be done. But when it comes to children and where we are with the numbers, um, this is a necessary thing so that we can actually literally get all hands on deck. So I hear where you're coming from and I respect the agency's perspective as well. And I think end of the day, we do need more resources. Uh, this is uh, the time when uh, our children start to die and come to a near death experiences from opioids because of their parents. This should be a, a call for another yet another crisis. So um, hear you support you. And, and I, I will be conversing with, with our uh, amazing group of uh, 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 people from the Demas as well as DCF to share what are the areas of opportunity that they also feel is an issue. Back to my question, the 49 near deaths, what are the patterns that we can actually look at that is going to give us a glimpse into better policy making, perhaps even in this session as well? So it's for clarity, it's 37 ingestion injuries that were reported and coded as criticals by DCF that did not result in a fatality. The number of fatalities over and above that is 12 as of now, um, without updated information from the medical examiner on children whose deaths are pending further studies. Um, so what can we do right now? Well, our, our recommendation is, is what is cut, what is proposed in 274 which looks at a structure for what Representative McCarthy Vicky, I think, you know, taking the words out of my mouth says, it is a very challenging conversation. Like, that's what I mean when I say, I don't have all the answers, right? As to how do you support the safety of children, very young children in the context of a, of a, of a treatment approach, which we all support, right? And that's, I think what we have to really dig into with our providers, with our adult probation folks with, who come into contact with lots and lots of folks, right? Just like Marcello's family, with the other agencies um, to talk about what our best practice is going to look like for sharing information, for coordinating treatment, for frequency of testing, for interpretation of test results, for access to naloxone. There, there are so many things and, and creating and having a table that is dedicated to that discussion, I, I think is not a lot to ask. Um, and then there are other provisions within the bill that speak to um, uh, having a plan for Medicaid and insurance reimbursement so that healthcare facilities can uh, distribute naloxone as applicable where appropriate to individuals upon discharge, which is based on uh, work, legislative work that's happened in Colorado under their naloxone project and mom's project. Um, so that's something that I think is a short session, right? That's something we could do now, right, to talk about. Um, and 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 I, ha 
I have been strong this morning. I know that or this afternoon or whatever time it is. So please don't, you know, my colleagues are sitting here in the room. Everybody's working hard. I understand that. And it's our job from our office to offer you an independent lens on these issues. And, and sometimes it's hard just being honest. It's hard to get a gaps analysis that we need when the state agencies operate under budget constraints and structural constraints that I think sometimes limit the conversation that we're having about what we really need to invest in and how much investment that costs, right? Because nobody's a free agent here with a blank check. And I understand that, right? So it has to be advocates and providers who say, we need more, right? I think there's there's other questions that, that you know, Demas's testimony today in the report that they're providing raise that need to be looked at. You know, it, around the utilization of the services that we do have. We only have a few intensive, for example, intensive in-home services for caregivers with substance use disorder and children under the age of six. Utilization is down in those programs. A lot. Why? I mean, the need isn't down, so why is the contract utilization down? Is that because referrals aren't made, or is that because the workforce isn't there? I, I don't know. Right, But these, these are actually the kind of granular questions that need to be looked at, and there has to be a setting for that. And, and I spoke to one of the providers, and I'll end with this, the, one of the providers I spoke to this morning about, you know, what is it that you need? And the person said, we need more opportunity for interagency coordination and a dialogue for providers and agencies on these subjects so we can coordinate on, again, what Representative McCarthy Vahey said, are these really challenging scenarios? That's what we're asking for, a table where that happens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony and we appreciate uh, uh, your thoughts. We hear you. Thank, Thank you. you. Representative Dauphine. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's almost like deja, deja vu from yesterday with the story of Liam. And so we're grateful to have you on board. I think you give us the bird's eye view and it doesn't sound like you're picking on any one person. It just seems like we need to pull these things together and better coordinate in a case management type setting where um, you know you see it done in the nursing homes, you see it done everywhere else where the client is kind of the center and all the entities are working together to make sure everything's coordinated. Is that correct? I mean, it sounds like there's missing pieces and that's what we need to do some sort of that thing. Representative Duffy, I, I think that's that's probably where we want to get to, right? And so if we, we, we know the goal is family-centered treatment, we know we want to preserve families whenever safely possible. What is it going to take to do that, right, in the context of what we know is, is, is by necessity a harm reduction model, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't, I sitting here today, I don't know 100% what that looks like when we're talking about a parent that is new to recovery or not yet rooted in a program of recovery, who wants to be in recovery who has very young children and we're trying to keep that family together. And it's not that we, again, we, we have services that are geared to support that, right? But, but that's what we need to look really closely at. What's working the best? What happens when a parent leaves the parent-child program? What does DCF have on the table? What do other, you know, what are we offering? How do we better coordinate that, right? The coordination seems key. I mean, it, it seems like yesterday, one wasn't talking to the other and, and things just kind of fell apart. You know, there are many parts, moving parts to these issues and they all need to kind of talk. So anyway, thank you so much for what you do. And, and I'm very supportive of your efforts and, and really appreciate your passion. Thank you.
Thank you, um, Representative Dauphiné. One thing that I had hoped to do before the hearing, but I'll confess I did not, was to reach out and talk to some members of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council, aside from the leaders of that, um, to just get their take on this. And I will ask you the same question I'm going to ask of the commissioners, which is, have you talked to anyone else on Alcohol and Drug Policy Council, particularly leaders of some of those subcommittees about this? Um, no, that's a fair question. I primarily have talked to providers um, in the course of our work. I never come here in a vacuum, right? I'm a lawyer, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a substance use treatment provider. I'm a lawyer for kids and an advocate. So everything I give you, I have discussed endlessly with people doing the work but they, they, they can't always come up here and talk about the things that I talk about, right, for a lot of reasons. And so the recommendations that we make in our reports and our legislation are discussed, vetted, amended by stakeholders throughout the state. Some overlap with the ADPC, but it's a fair question, and I'm happy to do more footwork on my end on that. Thank you, as will I. And as I said, I will be asking the commissioners the same. But I, I do think that it's something we should talk about because that is an important group, as is the Opioid Settlement Advisory uh, Group as well, committee. You referenced them. So I think bridging those conversations will be helpful. Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions, but I know we'll be continuing the conversation with you and appreciate your testimony and your passion and your work every day. Thank you. Uh, next, we actually have, I believe both of our commissioners, uh, Commissioner Navarretta and our commissioner designate um, Hill Lilly are coming before us. And I would remind you that you have three minutes, even though there are two of you. <laughs> and we're so glad to have you here. Oh, you know what? I, I apologize. I'm going to apologize to Jennifer Toe. That was my mistake. And if you would, since our, um, if you don't mind commissioners, I'm going to ask you just, you can just wait there. If you don't okay. mind, Jennifer Toe is uh, online. If Jennifer, you are able to testify, I, I got distracted and I know we were going down the, is it Jennifer, are you with us online? I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you for your indulgence. I appreciate it. Jennifer, welcome and please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Tao. I'm a mother of three, resident of Glastonbury and an IBCLC of 28 years. I oppose HB 5318, an act requiring the licensure of IBCLCs. I began my career in the early 90s, developing the first peer counseling program in Connecticut to support an underserved population. The financial hardship and health consequences resulting when parents are denied insurance coverage for skilled lactation care isn't lost on anyone. The working group that proposed this bill excluded IBCLCs who raised concerns last year in direct contradiction to the request of this committee. Among its 16 members, only three are Connecticut IBCLCs. Their key selling point is that licensure will allow access to Medicaid reimbursement. IBCLCs have not attained Medicaid coverage in their three licensed states. IBCLCs in private practice, most likely to be adversely affected by this bill, cannot sustainably accept Medicaid coverage. OBs, pediatricians, and clinics can already bill Medicaid for IBCLCs under their own licenses. Several states are addressing the Medicaid issue without licensure, including Colorado and New Jersey. In Connecticut, unlicensed doulas will be able to bill Medicaid, so it seems the Medicaid issue can be addressed in a separate legislative or procedural act, avoiding the perceived, perceived need for licensure. The lactation field is a quagmire of 20 plus certifications that are misleading to the public as well as policymakers. Parents cannot differentiate between breastfeeding specialist, lactation counselor, educator, or other title, nor will licensing change that fact. A tired parent isn't going to Google licensed when seeking breastfeeding support. The second selling point that licensure would elevate the profession is contradicted by the language of the bill itself. Originally, language limited clinical practice to IBCLCs, the only credential qualified to provide such care. Now all 20 plus other certificates may practice freely based on the quote, scope of practice of the person's license, permit or certification and training, unquote, which means that so long as their certificate claims they can provide clinical care, no matter how limited their education, they may do so. No fees, no license, no restrictions, no risk for misinterpretation of scope of practice by DPH as IBCLCs now face. Concerns raised to the working group as to these potential consequences were met with tacit dismissal, yet all have come to pass with this bill. 
HB 5318 deters candidates from seeking the credential and actually encourages them not to. If I'm able to practice because my certificate claims I'm equal to an IBCLC, why become an IBCLC? Why pay for the education fees and recertification on top of fees to the state of Connecticut when I can pay a nominal fee and practice at will with no repercussion, no matter how I practice. In contrast, IBCLCs will penal be penalized financially and professionally. And as if, and if as lactation counselors now demand, others are equally licensed, licensure is a moot point. In summary, HP 5318 establishes a system of punitive action toward the highest credential, obstructing our ability to practice, deterring candidates from pursuit of the IBCLC, and actually encodes a system of disparity of care into statute. That was my, that's thank you for listening to my um, testimony. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Tao, and I appreciate you getting in under that three minutes. Um, <laughs> I, that's impressive, and you've got a lot in there. Seeing no questions uh, from the committee, I appreciate your time and testimony, and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank next, you. Next on our list, thank you for your patience, commissioners. Please Absolutely. proceed and welcome. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Behe, Senator Summers, Representative Claritas Dietria, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on SB 274, an act concerning opioids. I'm Nancy Navarreta, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and I'm here with Commissioner Hill Lilly from DCF. We're testifying together as we co chair the ADPC. So as you've heard, the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council, or ADPC, is legislatively mandated as a body comprised of a wide range of stakeholders, including some of you that I am before today. Um, so many state agencies, providers of adult and child services, experts in the field of prevention, harm reduction, treatment and recovery, individuals and family members with lived experience, um, uh, co-chairs and ranking members of the General Assembly's Public Health, Criminal Justice, and Appropriations Committees, as well as a child advocate. So we are charged, as we've been talking about, ex to have this coordinated discussion and developing recommendations and implementing interventions which address substance use-related priorities on behalf of all Connecticut citizens across the lifespan and from all regions of the state. Uh, some of you have seats there and you've seen the enthusiasm of the group and their commitment to reducing opioid deaths across the lifespan. Um, and you've also seen the participation of the subcommittees and the work that they do between council meetings. So the structure was set up in a very thoughtful and deliberative process. And there are four domains. Prevention, screening, and early intervention is one subcommittee. Treatment is another. Recovery and criminal justice are the other two. Through their missions and charters, each group has successfully recommended policy changes, many of which have been implemented relating to specific impacts of alcohol, tobacco, opioids, and other substances across the lifespan. And this includes special populations, such as caregivers and children. This bill would require the ADPC to establish a standing subcommittee to examine programs and services for parents and caregivers impacted by substance use disorder and their children and make recommendations. Demas and DCF thank the committee for recognizing how vital it is have to have family-centered approaches and the treatment of substance use disorder. We cannot overstate how serious both of our agencies take the responsibility of collaborating to support the safety and well-being of children. We thoroughly support and currently engage in the delivery of substance use treatment programs and prevention services to families, safety planning and supports for children, and targeted distribution of naloxone to parents and caregivers. Um, the comprehensive reports that we recently submitted, uh, Public Act 23-97, were attached. In fact, um, another development is we're meeting on Monday with uh, CHA, Connecticut Hospital Association, to develop a distribution plan for naloxone to labor and delivery, as well as EDs. I know this is something that the OCA was looking for. And in listening to the OCA and into, into the legislators speak today, 
I think um, we are all in agreement that the conversation is necessary. And we're just saying that we think it can be accommodated within the current structure. So as co-chairs, we have the expressed authority to establish subcommittees and working groups. The subcommittee structure itself is not codified, but instead is fluid. So it allows us to be responsive to current trends in substance use. Excuse me, Commissioner, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind completing that thought, I would like sure. to hear that. So, um, for example, when we were reconstituted uh, as the opioid crisis was amping up, we took an express desire to address the opioid crisis, and we were reconstituted to do that even within appropriated funds. And we did, and we have continued to do that over the past 10 years. If you look back historically, the group was focused on alcohol and tobacco before this past decade, because that was happened to be more of concern at the time. So we're able to be fluid and to adjust within the prevention subcommittee, for example, um, almost 70% of the recommendations that have been put forward through prevention Include or expressly mention children and families. So in preparation for today, I went back and looked at all of the recommendations that were made over the past several years. And I think that says a lot that 70% expressly mentioned children and families. And in the rest of the recommendation, it's, it's implied. We take a two-gen approach um, and address lifespan issues. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. I know I'm sure there are going to be a few questions. And sure. as you heard during earlier testimony, I, I have a couple of questions. I appreciate you sharing that the subcommittee structure is not codified. Um, and I, I should add too, it's it's um, nice to have you, Commissioner Designate, here. We don't usually see you here. And so it's uh, nice to have you both here together. Um, and as Senator Amar said earlier, we are grateful for the work that you all do in your agencies as well. Um, and with that, some of those questions. The, the bill before us would require that standing subcommittee. And what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that prevention screening, and I forget the rest of the category. Early intervention. Can you repeat that? Early intervention. Early intervention. OK. So that subcommittee um, is is set up and you've heard or quantified that 70% of the recommendations included children and families. But this proposal is really geared towards something a little more specific in that we're seeing ingestion now. And we're seeing this more because we're seeing this substance, more the substances in question more ubiquitously in our society in general. Um, so two questions to start. One is, has the subcommittee really looked at that kind of specificity of the issue uh, is one. And then two, the question that you heard me to ask earlier, which was, have you been able to speak with anyone at the alcohol, others, members of the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council uh, about this, knowing that I too will be reaching out directly to speak with them as well? Excuse me. So I would say that this is not a new conversation to especially the prevention subcommittee. There already have been recommendations that have come out of the OCA's report and concerns. So we were asked, for example, you know, as uh, it was um, being played out in the media and these uh, very, very unfortunate deaths of children, we did things like amplified our prevention messaging around safe storage and the um, the fact that naloxone is safe for everyone. We're going to continue amplifying that message in some of our um, media campaigns. We have a collaborative project where Demas will be training all of DCF's uh, social workers in the state of Connecticut, and uh, Commissioner can speak to that a little bit as well. But we're taking our staff, we're uh, purchasing naloxone, we're gonna distribute it across the state, 
through the social workers that work in DCF and are actually in the homes and can talk to the parents and do some of that education. All of this is a result of these conversations around the um, opioid poisonings. So good afternoon. Um, I can say, uh, well, I'm at week five so in this role. So give me a little bit of grace that we have some subject matter experts here if need be. Um, but I'm not new to DCF, 35 years and five years as deputy commissioner. And I have a what I would consider to be a significant amount of national experience um, understanding what's happening in child protective services across the country. And I can say hands down um, that if you're looking for a partnership, what a partnership should look like on uh, the continuum of adults and children, it's this um, through the ADPC. Um, we have people who come to our office routinely, and one person who I won't name specifically, she's in the room, but she, the guards know her well because she's there all the time. This partnership is second to none, and we are, we are just um, in mourning, quite frankly, of what's happening in our society and to our children, and I appreciated the testimony that um, or the comments that were made about us needing to all just be on the same page because I feel like we're in a war zone and we need to be together to try to be solution focused to figure out how we get our arms around this horrible situation that, that we're all grappling with and learning at the same time. Demas has been wonderful teachers to us. We are learning, we are evolving, we are doing the best we can. And quite frankly, I appreciate the passion from the child advocate. I welcome it. I welcome the criticism. I welcome the challenge. We need it to keep us, hold us accountable. Um, and I invite, we met just as recently as yesterday, just talking through things. I will be at the table and those things don't, I, I, I appreciate um, any comments that are made that are gonna push the, push the envelope to make sure that we do something to address this crisis. I will say, as we're doing this, it we need to be um, cognizant of the fact that it doesn't make much sense to involve ourselves in duplicative efforts. Why not use the structure that we have to push that agenda as deemed necessary and appropriate? So I don't disagree with the urgency to any of this. I don't disagree that we need to do um, more um, in terms of, you know, um, adding to, you know, incorporating some of these suggestions. It's the how that we're talking about and the procedures and why not use the same infrastructure. One of the things we're um, grappling with is time and resources. Um, and the more meetings you hold, the less time we have actually doing the work. We do have a workforce shortage um, in DCF and among our providers. And I too spoke to a provider just yesterday um, who was very grateful of the work that we're doing together regarding naloxone and making it available and, and actually um, said to me um, himself, this is a national standard, I mean, in terms of the way that we've been collaborating and together. So I believe that we have the right passion. We have the right infrastructure. Um, I just would um, hope that we would consider not um, engaging in duplicative um, sort of efforts and that we would um, take the content of what we we feel is missing, whatever that is, we're, hope, we're open to hearing from it, but we don't want to create another committee um, to create, um, to address uh, duplicative issues. And I would add, there's a piece also about data. And so if there are suggestions about data that we're not reporting in the triennial report, so every three years we do a comprehensive report that covers all substance use services across the lifespan and across departments. If there's something in, in that report that's missing we and we're responsible for that, happy to um, have that conversation to add that data as well. Thank you, Commissioner. And I appreciate your comments about being in a war zone and the war zone is against opioids and we're all together in that. Um, and I do think uh, as in my earlier conversation, I'm interested in the practical realities of how we are going to most effectively address this. We're all on the same page with this. 
So I, I'm interested in us kind of drilling down to make sure that as we look at the structures, we're really getting to the roots of what we're about. And I think as I listen to this conversation, um, I think I'm interested in talking together with you and our child advocate about how we're defining the problems in order to understand how to address them. Because of course, there are a million things that we need to do when it comes to preventing opioids. Naloxone distribution and availability is one of them. Obviously, our um, prevention in terms of law enforcement is a piece. There are so many pieces of this conversation. Um, so I appreciate that perspective. Senator Amwar has a question to be followed by I one second to be followed by Rep Dauphiné. Good. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Designate. Uh, we appreciate the work that you do. I have been part of those meetings and I, I see the work that goes on and I appreciate uh, the challenges um, and in the challenging work that you are doing. And, and I'm also obviously privy to the work outside of that committee that you are doing and your entire team is doing. Um, I, here's the dilemma that I have right now. Um, children in our state are dying for a variety of reasons, but, but specific to the opioid crisis, they are dying. The trajectory has not changed. And if the trajectory has not changed, and that means the status quo is not good enough, in my mind. So we should not necessarily continue to do what we have been doing in anticipating that things will suddenly change. Um, and also, um, the, the Child Advocates Office, who have the responsibility from this body and in the entire legislative body to look at every death in, in our community of child children and, and look at what can be done to prevent it. And they have a passionate, clear view that this is the step to take. So for a disaster that's happening every day, asking us to stay the course and not even have a subcommittee to focus on that conversation, it's not sitting well with me comfortably yet. Um, I, I hear you. I hear the challenges that you have. Um, if, if something was going wrong and we said, stay the course, I can't live with that. And especially if the children are on the other end. So if you can help me and then perhaps three year duration or some, some duration and not be forever, hopefully it will not be needed in three years or a few years from now. But I, I wanted to put that out there. I, I can't accept status quo at all. And we agree with you 150%. Um, and I think what I heard Ms. Egan say is that she isn't wedded to uh, codifying the subcommittee structure and she's willing to talk with us and we're willing to talk with her about uh, time limited work groups or depending on what areas she and the subject matter experts think are most important. Do they fall in early intervention and prevention? Do they fall within treatment? Do they fall within recovery supports? We can amplify that message and you know look at what is happening across the nation and what our evidence-based practice is. Um, what do we want to try in Connecticut that perhaps has not been tried elsewhere? I mean, the fact that we're going to be uh, doing education, prevention, and distributing naloxone in labor and delivery, it's it's both impressive and scary that this is the place that we're at, but um, thinking about things like that to reach the most people to make the most difference. Um, I would completely agree with everything that you're saying. And I agree with you, Senator Anwar. We don't want to keep doing the same thing. I don't, I'm not, I'm, we're not suggesting that we do the same thing. We're saying we use the same structure, but change the content to address the issues. Um, uh, Sarah Egan, the child advocate, is on the, the subcommittee. We need to leverage that voice in the structure that we have to make the changes that are deemed necessary and appropriate. Um, I've attended one meeting so far, <laughs> um, and so in my capacity, and I'm, I've, I've taken the time to read up on all the policies, and certainly I've been involved in certain sub 
committees and some of the work and have been really, really impressed. I have yet, even though I spent an hour over an hour with uh, Sarah yesterday, we talked for a long time. We didn't get to this specific agenda item. Um, but what I will tell you in talking with and dealing with my co-chair, even when I was deputy commissioner, we we spoke often. Um, we we need to be in a place of listening and hearing and and responding, um, and that we are committed to do. Um, and we're just hoping that we um, are able to do it within the existing robust infrastructure that we already have. And 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 the fact that Sarah is on the child advocate is on that actual subcommittee gives us the perfect opportunity to make sure that we um, leverage that voice and address the concerns that are are at, on the table now. Thank you, Commissioner and Commissioner Designate. Uh, I'll just add, um, I, I read about a couple of the deaths and as a looking at it from a, how could have this been prevented? There's so many opportunities for prevention. Um, I will like to see the 37 near deaths and the 12 deaths total and see what patterns there are and what can be done to have a prevention strategy. And then perhaps see if, if uh, that amount of work and a prevention strategy and implementation strategy would require the existing subcommittees to be able to do it or not, or should we have a specific group targeting that work, even if it's for a short term to be able to look at the pattern that we are seeing and then have a prevention, comprehensive, integrated prevention strategy between the two agencies and the workforce. I think that's that's uh, how I'm seeing the the work and I'll, I'll probably have to do more homework to see how the existing framework can do this. So, but I, we, I, I hear you and understand where you're coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say we have um, many other structures internal to the agency and external to the agency that are reviewing each one of these fatalities, coming up with recommendations. So this isn't the only body that is used to make recommendations. And I'll also add um, that we at DCF sit with this death as well, um, looking into these deaths, looking into the workers' eyes, knowing that we're in a in this war zone and we're all trying to learn. Um, we are mourning this. We have each, we have the passion um, that that everyone has here. And yet we have to intervene um, with the resources that we have, the knowledge that we have. And as I said, the partnership here is second to none. And and we are learning. Uh, we have we have grown as a result of this partnership, just learning how best to respond to the emerging needs of our kids and our families. And and Commissioner Designate, I just want to make one comment. Um, I'm so glad the governor has uh, chosen you to be our commissioner. So thank you for your work that you've done all these years and 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 anticipated work going forward. And thank you both commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anwar. We have Rep. Reddington Hughes to be followed by Rep. Dauphiné to be followed by Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question has to do with a uh, circle back to the data. Um, with the data, is this going to be used to create a better paradigm so that you would be able to identify when a child is perhaps no longer safe in their present environment, even though there is that desire to keep the family together? There's, a, there's um, an outstanding question, I think, as to what that data would be. So we're open to having that conversation with the Office of the Child Advocate if there's something she thinks is missing. Right now, we do a report every three years that looks across all of the state agencies. Um, so we're flexible in terms of if there's a piece of data that could be helpful, we would include that. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dauphiné to be followed by Representative Zupkis. Thank you, and thank you both for being here. And I certainly can appreciate and um, recognize your passion, both of you. I, I, you know, the war zone, um, your passion, the 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 work that you're doing. I I really think you do want to do a good job and are working at doing that. I think what I heard Sarah Egan talk about though was um, not 
per se you so much as is the work that's being done in these silos mm -hmm. and the silos that need some kind of coordination. So when you talked about the structure and um, feeling like it didn't need to change, I would challenge that and say that that structure does need to change to include coordinating better with um, you know, the other agencies, the other moving parts to this. And I think that's really what she was asking for is like, we have to look at this from a bird's eye view and say, where are the gaps? Where are the missing pieces? Not specific to DCF, but um, maybe perhaps bringing all of them together. I, I've got to believe that you guys are all doing this job because you're passionate about it. So I, I, I don't really question that. I question the fact that we need more of a case management style overlook bird's eye view at all of the moving parts to come together because if deaths are occurring something's something's missing right and so that that's all I would say to that I didn't really have a question I just wanted to comment on that so thank you for being here today I'm happy to just respond thank you for that um one of the things that the child advocate mentioned was um the inclusion of the perspective uh, of the providers, which I think is um, really key. And we've been doing a whole lot of that. Some, so, And so I do think that there is a lot of misinformation um, that is has not really been articulated here. And we are more than willing, and maybe this might be a solution if we were to um, have a, a, a opportunity to present to you all you know, what the work of the ADPC is and what we're already doing. And then we can make an informed decision about whether or not this is duplicative or whether or not we need to do something different. But I, I would hate for us to make a decision without knowing what is um, um, in detail, what is already being done. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I didn't hear her saying or talking about making a de decision as much as, I mean, she was very open to S language, come in and, and give us your input. And, and I, she was she was saying, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Let's come together yeah. and pull together and identify these gaps and, and make this a better process. So that's what I heard her say. I would just like to mention that there's actually is a strategic plan where all of the stakeholders have come together. And um, so there was one that covered 2016 through 21, and there's a new one that goes from 22 to 27. And that addresses substance exposed infants statewide. So there are other forums. I won't go through all of them, but there's like a plan of safe, safe care stakeholder work group. And I think those kinds of meetings do exactly what you're asking for. And also the fatality review uh, committees. All those folks are in the room. DMIS, DCF, DPH. Um, I don't know if you speak. Hospitals, yeah. Yes, hospitals. Yeah, I that I mean I think that's what I was um, saying is that there's a lot of work that's being done, um, and there's a lot of different entities that are doing a lot of this work. Um, and maybe we could co-present with the child advocate to say, okay, here's where what we're doing, and here are some of the gaps. I don't know if we can do that. I'm not sure what the rules are, but we're happy to present um, outside of you know this meeting so that we can make an informed decision about how best to go forward. Thank you, I appreciate that. I mean, obviously the structure that is in place isn't working if children are dying. And so there has to be some evaluation of that. Where are the holes, where are the pitfalls? How can we make this better? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative. Before I go to Rep Subkiss, I, I would just comment that I think we all agree that there's a gap the question is, um, is the structure the cause of the gap or are there other causes? And that's when I talked earlier about the idea of the problem definition. And I think it's very multifactorial. Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I agree with what's being said. I have always said when I served on children's, I would never want to be the commissioner of DCF. It is brutal <laughs> but the, I understand what Me <laughs> no but understanding it's difficult uh and even Demas it, we all know that and your passion does show through 
Um, it just happened yesterday. One of my best friends is burying their daughter. She died of opioids yesterday. So I get it. And they weren't in the DCF system. I mean, this good family, the whole thing. So it's not just one group. It's something that we need to address overall. And um, I am not going to reiterate it, the gaps. We've got to figure it out because what's happening, it's not working, what we're doing. And so I would love to hear, and this is the perfect opportunity, what are those gaps and let's put it into place and fix it because it's not working. And um, my other issue is the marijuana bill. It passed. That's a gateway. People can argue it or not, but it's, I'm not going to rehash, but that is, we're legalizing something that is a drug and impairs people, all of those things. And so to me, I just see, and now they're talking about mushrooms and all these things, and we're headed down a road. People are dying from these things and the bills come out of this building. Thank you. I just wanted to respond by saying so sorry for your loss. Um, and I appreciate um, your words. Um, that hits home um, because, as I said earlier, this is a war zone and we're all trying to get our arms around it. And and believe it or not, there are different variants that are emerging. I don't want to step in, in my commissioner's <laughs> to field there. Um, but I, I cannot stress to you, I joked a little bit about being the commissioner of DCF. I'm, I'm, um, I feel like it's an honor and a, a humbling experience. I feel like I signed up to serve and that's what I've done because I have to speak on behalf of the staff who are feeling the pain that you're, you're feeling. I look into the eyes of the staff every day when we, when we lose a child. Um, it is heartbreaking. This is gut-wrenching work. And there's there, we need to be together in this to try to be solution focused. There's no other way to do this because we have a workforce shortage. We don't want to create an environment where we exacerbate the problem with people wanting not wanting to do this work. We got to support our workforce. And so the way we do that is to work collaboratively together to address this horrible situation. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Representative Zupkus. And I would add my sincere condolences to many of our children and our fellow community members are being lost. And so that's what we're here to do is to, to do more. Thank you for your testimony today and your time. As I say often to those before us, but certainly in this case, we will be talking together about the best way forward for this. So I, we appreciate you. Next on our list is Claudio Capone, followed by Carolina Bortoletto. Mr. Capone, welcome. Please unmute yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, and members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Claudia Capone. I serve as the Regional Vice President of Strategy and Business Development for Trinity Health New England. And I appreciate the opportunity to submit testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 9, an act promoting hospital financial stability. Trinity Health New England opposes uh, SB 9, which increases regulatory oversight and control over hospitals without providing any assistance to address the many issues impacting our hospitals. Imposing penalties and adding more regulatory burden won't help more patients get care, won't, su won't support access to care across the state, and won't help the healthcare workforce. These actions will, however, add unnecessary costs, more red tape, and interfere in the care-related decisions of healthcare providers in emergency situations. We are experiencing significant financial challenges brought on by these workforce and supply chain cost increases, and that are exasperated by continued Medicaid underpayment and burdensome commercial insurance practices, including restrictive prior authorization protocols. The resulting financial performance is unsustainable for us. Adding to the administrative burden of the hospitals through the CON program, financial reporting requirements and diversion policies under the current framework will only worsen an already fragile healthcare system. We appreciate the Office of Healthcare Strategy um, is, is under-resourced and is challenged to appropriately and timely carry out its current regulatory responsibilities. Our experience with OHS has always been productive 
but the under-resourced realities impacted us in the ability to implement CON regulated services. As an example, one of our CONs for an interoperative CAT scanner used for cranial and spine procedures in the operating room took a year to receive a decision. This well-established technology allows for improved accuracy of implants and screws resulting in fewer realignments and revision surgeries that may increase the cost of care. This year-long CON process should have been quicker and easier, allowing for patients to receive a higher standard of care quicker. Therefore, we support updating the CON program to streamline the process to help improve access and reduce the total cost of care, but feel that some of the proposed changes will do more harm than good. Focus should be on making the programs more collaborative, efficient, timely, and removing unnecessary costs, reducing the regulatory burden on hospitals and healthcare systems, and creating a more competitive healthcare system. We urge you to oppose Senate Bill 9 and look for ways to provide help to hospitals and support patient care and access. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Capone. Seeing no, oh, Senator Amor. Thank you, Mr. Capone, for your testimony. Uh, can you help us solve the challenge that uh, when private equity is going to come to the any healthcare system and invest where their primary goal is to um, make money from the the illness of individuals, how can we as a state protect our citizens if we do not have a CON and if we do not have a bill which states what it does in Senate Bill 9? So it's not so much that that we are opposed to having a CON, um, Senator Anwar. It's really revolving around um, ensuring that it's not too onerous for those that are already in the state, like nonprofits like ourselves. Um, we understand that, yes, we agree that some of these private equities should have um, further regulation, but the regulations should not impose hardships on the current uh, organizations like the uh, not-for-profit healthcare systems already in the state. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Amar. Thank you, Senator Amar. Senator Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'll be real quick. Uh, Mr. Capone, thank you for testifying. Sure. I also want to say thank you to Trinity Health for the work it does up at uh, Johnson Memorial Hospital in my district, Stafford. If I can just ask you a question, I know I've been working with people to see what we can do in a common sense and meaningful way with regards to certificate own, of need. Um, I know that Trinity Health did do a big expansion, is continuing to do expansion of some of the outpatient facilities and services uh, in uh, in that part of the state. Um, can you just say real quickly what you feel has been the burden to have to go through a process for something that is expanding uh, upon existing outpatient services and trying to provide even more outpatient services in communities that need it and otherwise have to travel quite some distances or even hop the border to another state uh, to get those services as an example about some of the burden you've noticed with certificate of need? Yeah, I appreciate that question, Senator Gordon. Um, I, I think if we harken back to when OHS was, was well-resourced, um, the process was shorter for us. I think um, in the past couple of years, we've seen it um, increase and uh, over time, which which is causing us to um, uh, delay services or delay some of the movements we want to make to expand ambulatory care, like the, the project you're mentioning, for example, um, is one of them. So uh, for us, it's it, it would be to streamline the process, you know, really to go back to um, a process that makes more sense, that asks the right questions up front, and that we're not uh, prolonging it so that we can do these expansions to provide the care in those communities and continue to expand. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Senator Gordon. Mr. Capone, thank you for your answers and your time with us today. Thanks. Appreciate it. Next on our list is Carolina Bortoletto. I believe is with us online. Hi. Hello. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. If you are able to turn on your camera, that would be great. If not, please proceed. Okay. Yeah, I can because I'm on I'm on my phone. <laughs> um all right. Hi. Uh, my name is Carolina Butulentu. I'm a resident of Brookfield, and I've been a resident of Denbury and Brookfield for over 26 years. Um, I'm also undocumented. I'm a co-founder and board member of Connecticut Students for a Dream, which is an organization that fights for the rights of undocumented youth, and also a leader in the Husky for Immigrants Coalition, fighting to expand healthcare for the undocumented community. 
Um, I'm here today testifying a strong support of HB uh, 5320, which is an act concerning hospital financial assistance. I have substantial personal experience with medical debt and charity care as a 26 years old, 26 year old, six months after I was kicked off my parents' health insurance plan. I served with a severe and sudden medical emergency. Um, I had a gastric obstruction and a rupture and I got sent to the emergency room. I woke up two weeks later from a coma to learn what had happened. And then I spent eight months in various hospitals in Connecticut. Um, Black and Latino people report being less likely to receive information about charity care programs and less likely to have uh, insurance. Higher rates of uninsurance means that the burden of medical debt falls disproportionately on Black, Latino, and other communities of color and immigrants. I'm not a person of color, but I am undocumented and I saw this firsthand. I'm not sure if I was ever offered financial assistance or charity care during the first hospital I was inpatient at, which is why I'm glad that this bill will require hospitals to provide financial assistance to those who qualify. What I do remember is the bills that my, kept, my parents kept receiving in the mail while I was in the hospital. This is because 45% of nonprofit hospitals routinely send medical bills to patients whose incomes are low enough to qualify for financial assistance. My parents tried to keep the information from me, but in between my medical procedures and in moments where I wasn't in constant pain, I remember my parents whispering, what were they going to do about all these bills that wouldn't stop coming? Halfway through my eight months, I was transferred to a different, different hospital in Connecticut by ambulance. And it was then the first time that I heard about hospital financial assistance or charity care. My parents were very happy, but the process was not easy. I don't remember much, but I remember working on a new application than I had at my previous hospitals. I remember long conversations with the admin for my hospital, trying to explain to my parents in English what bad funds were and asking if I could find a donor for bad funds. Surely a common application would have helped me when I was healing from the nine surgeries that I had in those eight months. What I clearly remember is after I was discharged from the hospital, I had ongoing care needs. I could not eat or drink anything for three years, and I was dependent on a feeding tube. This required equipment, formula, PPN, among other things. I had to apply for charity care again, but first I had to apply and be rejected by Husky. As an undocumented person, I did not qualify for Husky, and I clearly remember the fear my parents had that I had to apply and be rejected. They thought we were going to get in trouble, and I had to explain to them that this is what I had to do. I remember being bad bound in my house with a pile of papers around me trying to figure out what to do. How do I apply to Husky? Where do I mail this? Do I call the office? I had never applied for any government benefit or been on the website. I was thinking, what do I say over the phone? How long will this denial take? If this denial doesn't get approved fast enough, how am I going to get my feeding tube formula? That's why I believe that implementing measures such as creating a common application for financial assistance, ensuring language accessibility, and automatically qualifying certain patients for assistance based on income level are vital steps toward making financial assistance more accessible and reducing the barriers faced by marginalized communities. And so I urge the committee to favorably pass this bill, HB 5320, and that concerning hospital financial assistance policies. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and for sharing your story with us. You have been through a lot and to come here and share that with us today so that we can better understand why this work is important. We are very grateful. Seeing and hearing no questions, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for being such a tremendous advocate. Next on the list, we have Craig Miller. Mr. Miller, welcome. Please unmute and proceed. Welcome. Hi, thank you, uh, Representative McCarthy Bay, and also thank you for your support in my uh, nomination to the Rare Disease Advisory Council. Uh, my name is Craig Miller. I'm the Director of Immunology and Respiratory Disease Research at Boringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals and a member of the Rare Disease Advisory Council. Representative McCarthy Behe, Senator Anwar, Representative Caledris Dietria and Senator Summers, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, 
I submit this testimony today in support of Committee Bill 175 to provide funding for the Rare Disease Advisory Council. Boringer Ingelheim is working on breakthrough therapies that transform the lives of patients today and for generations to come. As a leading research-driven biopharmaceutical company, we create value through innovation in areas of high unmet medical need, including rare diseases. Founded in 1885 and family-owned ever since, Borger and Ingelheim takes a long-term sustainable perspective to our research. Our U.S. headquarters are in Richfield, Connecticut, and home to our North American research hub with more than 2,100 employees. Today, I stand not only as a member of the Connecticut Rare Disease Council, but also as a dedicated researcher at Borger Ingelheim, focusing on rare disease treatments. Throughout my 20-year career in discovering new therapeutics with a focus on rare diseases, I have witnessed firsthand the challenging nature of these diseases and the burden they place on patients, their families, and communities. First, I wanna thank the committee for your support in forming the Connecticut Rare Disease Advisory Council. As a proud member, I value the opportunity to bring more awareness to the needs of those patients living with rare disease and their caregivers. I stand here today because the council lacks the necessary funding to carry out its vital work. This bill will provide essential funding for key functions such as staff support, and the creation of a dedicated website to reach out to patients. Just last week, Rare Disease Day was commemorated at the Legislative Office Building in Hartford. I was honored to speak at this event and more importantly to hear from patients, caregivers, researchers, and physicians about the challenges they face and the, the hurdles they have to overcome. It is evident that our continued work on the council can make a significant difference, but it requires this funding to turn that potential into reality. I thank you for your time and for your consideration for this bill. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Miller, thank you for your time here with us today and for your work on behalf of all those with rare diseases in our state for serving as a member of the council. Thank you for your advocacy and seeing no questions. We will go on to next on our list, Cody Cuny. Cody, are you able? There you are. Welcome. Hello, good afternoon, distinguished chair, member, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Cody Cooney, and I'm speaking today as a resident of Hartford County, Connecticut, and as an international board certified lactation consultant, IBCLC. I am in opposition to HB 5318, an act requiring licensure of lactation consultants. I support families in both my private practice and OBGYN office and in the hospital setting. I have a background in public health and for years was a community health worker supporting the most at-risk families meet their breastfeeding goals. Licensing IBCLCs does nothing to support families in our state. It places undue burden upon the highest skilled providers while less allowing lesser credentials to practice without oversight. Sleep-deprived parents will not understand the nuance between a licensed lactation consultant and someone calling themselves a breastfeeding or lactation specialist. This bill would hurt families as the language takes away any incentive for people to achieve the IBCLC credential, given that they could practice without licensure if they had a lesser credential. This bill has been proposed as a pathway to allow IBCLCs to take Medicaid. However, this is far from certain. In most states where IBCLCs have been licensed, they still do not receive Medicaid reimbursement. Even if Medicaid coverage was achieved, the reimbursement rates would not be sustainable for most private practice LC. OBGYN and pediatric offices already have options for providing IBCLC support for Medicaid recipients if they hire IBCLCs and bill for those services. It is possible to change Medicaid requirements without the need of licensure there's precedent for unlicensed providers to be reimbursed. The field of lactation is quickly evolving. The language of this bill would give oversight and interpretation of an IBCLC's scope of practice to the Commission of Public Health. This commission would not be qualified to make decisions regarding lactation support. They do not possess the education or clinical experience to do so. Nurses and physicians are overseen by a board of their peers well-versed in the nuances of our profession. We deserve to be reviewed by a board of our peers, which is already in place through the International Board of Lactation Examiners, IBCLE. There's already an avenue in place to lodge complaints and censure IBCLCs if needed. We already have continuing education and recertification requirements for I from IBCLE. Reporting to an additional board is redundant. 
We need more access to care by not limiting or discouraging people from becoming IBCLC, which this bill would do. Vulnerable families, especially those low income families, do not need less quality support. This bill would threaten the profession that I love and limit my ability to provide the highest quality care to families. For these reasons, I urge you to vote no to this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony today and for being here with us and for your work supporting uh, new parents seeking to breastfeed. Seeing no questions from the group, I am going to just pause for a moment. If you recall at the beginning of our meeting, um, we talked about having a group coming this afternoon, testifying between approximately two and three. We're, we're a little bit before two o'clock, but I am wondering if Ruth and others are ready for us to go ahead and move to the group with my thanks to those of you who are just ahead of them. We will come back to you once we get through our speakers number 26 through 36. So we will have numbers 26 through 36 speak next, and then we will go back to the next folks on our list. So Ruth, welcome, and thank you for being here today. Ruth, if you could press the button right in front of you, wonderful. And would you like a chair? Uh, we move the chairs over, there you go, so you can sit, yes. Thank you. Representative McCarthy Vahey and Senator Anwar and members of the Public Health Committee. My, my name is Ruth Groby and I live in Farmington where I serve as the secretary of the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access, a grassroots disability advocacy organization comprised mostly of volunteers with physical disabilities. In my work, I have learned how many physical, attitudinal, and institutional barriers they face in a country that espouses equality for all. This is particularly true in the critical area of health care, a problem that our advocates have been asking the General Assembly to address since 2017. People with disabilities lives are at risk because most medical diagnostic equipment is not accessible. House Bill 5200 shows promise, but to make it stronger, our advocates are urging you to adopt revisions and additions to the language of the bill. I have submitted suggested amendments as an attachment to my written testimony, and today I will try to briefly explain what we are requesting. But first, a little background. In 2017, the U.S. Architectural and Transportation Barriers Compliance Board published standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment, and the Citizens Coalition has been advocating for change since that date. However, opponents of state regulation have routinely argued that we need to wait for the relevant federal agencies to promulgate regulations based on the compliance board standards because we wouldn't be sure otherwise which standards they would accept. Just recently, both the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice began the process of doing just that by issuing notices of rulemaking that adopt the compliance board standards in their entirety and apply them to all healthcare providers accepting federal funds. There is no longer any question that the standards will, what the standards will be when ultimately imposed nationally and therefore no longer any need to wait. HB 5200 just moves Connecticut along to implement those uniform federal standards a little earlier. However, we do think it is important for HB 5200 to more closely track the proposed federal regulations for two reasons. First, the federal government has reasonably proposed to apply three broad exceptions to compliance. For example, the claim of undue burden. The Citizens Coalition recommends that these exceptions be included in HB 5200 in order to reduce the hardship on medical providers. Second, the federal language includes an affirmative obligation to acquire within a designated time frame the two most fundamental and least expensive pieces of MDE, exam tables and weight scales. As presently written, HB 5200 allows a medical facil 
facility to wait on any purchases until it is adding to its supply of medical diagnostic equipment or replacing a worn out piece of equipment. Now I would like to also call your attention to the additional healthcare accessibility issues that are covered in HB 5200, but not addressed in the proposed federal regulations. The pro first, the provision of adequate space in the medical exam room for a wheelchair to maneuver. And second, the provision of lifts to help with transferring patients with disabilities. Both of these provisions are extremely important aspects of providing healthcare equity. Our proposed amendment expands on the language regarding lifts to make it more specific and more relevant to the most pressing needs. And then finally, I turn to our proposed amended language that is totally new to the bill. We propose three additions to HB 5200. First, the creation of a fund to help with the costs associated with a healthcare facility's implementation of the new requirements. Second, the adequate training of medical personnel. And third, enforcement procedures. So to summarize, I would submit to you that the suggested amended language simultaneously makes the bill stronger and yet less onerous for our state's medical facilities. In closing, I want to say what an extraordinary effort it has taken for the Citizens Coalition Volunteers with Disabilities to engage in legislative advocacy. And I want to thank the many people who have made it here to testify today. Many of them need to expend extraordinary amounts of energy just managing the basic tasks of daily life, and many are struggling with additional problems of wheelchair repair delays and scarcity of reliable caregivers. I know how weary they are. I would strongly urge you to act now. Please don't make them wait additional years for what is rightfully theirs, equal treatment under the law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and please read the alternative bill language attached to my written testimony. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. But please stay with us, if you would, because we know we're going to have a few questions for you. Ms. Groby, could, there you go. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by saying thank you. What a tremendous advocate you have been, and you've got a great partner in Reptomico, of course. Um, but truly, thank you. Your written testimony is wonderful. You went through a few things that were related to the compliance board standards, um, and then you have a few additions to that, and then some new language, which I appreciate the way you frame that, that it would be the ability to strengthen the bill while at the same time making it less onerous, which is just an example of how you've been willing to work together. So I thank you. I, I have a feeling we may have a few questions or comments, starting with Senator Amar. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Ruth, thank you for being here, and thank you for being a force of nature on, on all of these important issues. Um, how would we respond to somebody who would say that let's wait for the federal government to give us a very specific black and white regulation and we should continue to wait. How would we respond to that? The 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 standards in the in the rulemaking that has been published by both the Department of Justice and the um, Department of Health and Human Services, um, there is no question that the compliance board standards are the standards that would be used. There are some questions um, about um, how long it should take for facilities to acquire equipment. There are some questions about the, I think it's called scoping, the percentage of equipment that a facility would be required to provide that is accessible. Um, but all of those are, uh, could be, uh, incorporated into Connecticut law. And as long as there was nothing that contradicted the eventual rulemaking by the federal government, the, the two could st stand, the two, the state law and the federal laws could stand together and there would be required compliance with both. 
Th thank you for that. And, and uh, how would you respond if, if uh, we were to say that there's a small group of three or four physicians or clinicians who have a practice and 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 we want to change the structure and, and they're barely surviving, they can't even make their uh, payroll, how would they make those changes? And this is why we are recommending changes to the language in HB 5200, because the federal exceptions that are in the federal rulemaking include that one of the exceptions would be a medical facility with a staff of 15 people or under. They would be ex exempted from the re requirements. Thank you. Do, do you foresee having a conversation um, with the uh, uh, DSS on the Medicaid uh, role in, in helping out in some of those components or patients with the um, special needs? Uh, I'm not sure how that, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with Medicaid. I mean, I'd be more than willing to, but somebody would have to educate me a little bit about how Medicaid works and what we could do. Okay. And and um, when the last question again is, uh, you, you've suggested a, a fund, and, and and I think the fund is going to be something that we are hoping that various uh, private as well as public entities would be able to uh, help with to implement this. Yes, I, I will say that we are sort of secretly hoping that um, if if we include it in the language of the bill, the exceptions, um, for example, undue burden is one of those exceptions that perhaps a fund might not even be needed. But that would be something that, of course, I would you know defer to the public health committee's decision about. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for your advocacy. Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Amar. Representative D'Amico to be followed by Senator Gordon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ruth, for coming to testify. And I just want to echo uh, the, the comments of, of the chairs. You have been a champion for the uh, for the disability community for, for many, many years. And, and um, uh, these efforts would, would not would not be even close to fruition if it weren't for for, for, for what you have done. So uh, you, you are to be commended, and I wanted to publicly commend you for that. Okay. So and and my contribution it pales in comparison to yours. So anyhow, um, so I, I just wanted to j j just to clarify. Um, the, the suggestion has been made uh, in past years, and it's being made again this year that we can't. And this follows uh, 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 Senator Anwar's uh, question um, that we 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 have to wait until we get uh, more specific guidance from the from the feds. And and as I understand your testimony, you're, you're telling me that there are at least two federal agencies that have already adopted uh, th these federal standards that that have been. Would you want to expand on that a little bit? Yes. Well. In the, the, the rulemaking that they have published, um, and, and they asked for public comment, and that public comment period has closed. But in the public comment, they asked all kinds of questions about different aspects of the rulemaking. But the one thing they didn't ask questions about were the standards. They are they are a given in this rulemaking. Um, and so they, they will not change. And recently, the... Um, the compliance board finalized. There was one standard that had been left unfinalized in 2017, and they finally and they did more research and they interviewed many more people and got more public comment, and then finalized the the last standard, the the minimum height of an exam table. They they finished that this year, so those standards are complete the way they are, and that's the way it will stay in federal regulations. Th thank you for that. And, and um, Madam Chair, if I could ask one or two more questions, uh, I would appreciate it. So, so, so the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Ruth, um, uh, has to do with the availability of medical diagnostic equipment that's accessible to people with disabilities. It has been suggested in past years, and I think it's been suggested in some testimony again this year, that that that, that equipment is just, just isn't going to be available through the through the manufacturers. Uh, is that accurate? And and would you like to um, would you like to uh, comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, I would say that, um, first of all, several health 
healthcare, large healthcare facilities have already started to acquire medical diagnostic equipment that meets the standards. The Sutter Health in California, which is a very large healthcare um, provider in the state, just um, went through a whole process of becoming more accepted accessible in a vo voluntarily. And then the Department of Veterans Affairs in their facilities, they have adopted accessible medical diagnostic equipment as a requirement to be provided in their facilities. And so there must be some accessible equipment available. But again, in the exceptions uh, that are in the federal rulemaking that we would recommend for um, HB 5200. In the exceptions, if you can't find a piece of equipment that, you know, if it's not for sale or it's unavailable, that would count as an exception. Um, so there, and, and I just went online and put in accessible exam table and immediately one popped up that was a combination exam table and weight scale, and it was only $8,500. So I, 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 I think it's available. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and then the other question I, I would have for you um, uh, has to do with um, again, there was there was some uh, discussion, I believe, in testimony that that will be presented later. Um, that that uh, the expense of 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 um, of uh, reworking the the building spaces uh, that that would that 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 you propose uh, in order to accommodate uh, uh, larger wheelchairs and so forth. Uh, would you would you like to comment on how that expense can be um, can be ameliorated? Well, clearly that 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 is a a big issue here. Um, and what I would say to that is that. Um, it, I would at least like to have that that provision as a preventative measure. Our advocates have been telling us for years that even when big medical facilities go through a, a rehab rehab or open new new facilities, um, they often aren't any more accessible than the old facility was. In fact, the, no attention was paid to physical accessibility. So I would. Uh, it would be very helpful to have a statute in Connecticut that would make uh, when, when new facilities were built or when um, facilities were rehabilitated, something that made the, the planners pay attention to physical accessibility as part of the planning and building process. Thank you. And, and, and I, I just wanted to just reiterate for the benefit of my colleagues as well as the chairs um that that uh so some of the testimony that 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 or, or the the proposal that that you submitted uh that 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 um uh amends uh a house bill 5200 would actually uh, actually uh rather than hinder it would actually help medical facilities to be able to meet these guidelines because it does provide for exceptions and it does provide for financial assistance uh if if, if that's necessary so, so uh, I just wanted to to uh, thank you, thank you for that contribution. As I said to a previous person testifying on a previous bill, we are here uh, to to listen to the public and to try to make these bills better. And uh, I think that your contribution and the contribution of the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access actually does make this bill better. And I, I hope that this committee will consider it. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, and thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ruth, we have one more question from Senator Gordon. Senator Gordon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for your advocacy. As a doctor, I've been well aware of folks with all sorts of disabilities, and it's just not physical, but also intellectual as far as getting them the tests they need. And I know a couple years ago, we spent a lot of money in my office uh, to get new exam tables. I think it cost around $100,000 overall, which is a lot of money to get um, um, good exam tables that actually would meet the federal uh, provisions uh, because we knew that there was a need. Uh, so the equipment is you know, certainly um, there. And I think it's very important as was discussed. And one of my questions to you is, you are looking to have in to this bill the, pr the provisions that's in the federal uh, rules as far as the exceptions, because there are private practices that are struggling. I've heard from a lot of those doctors, my colleagues, where they're just not able to either afford that right away 
and they might have to do it in piecemeal. They buy one and then they can budget for another, you know, given some of the expenses, but also they may not have an exam room large enough, for example, and they can't change their layout easily. Uh, but it sounds like my question to you is you're looking to have some of those exceptions put in for people who would want to in good faith try to do it, but they either can't do it right away or they just might have to phase it in depending upon you know, some of those aspects. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely right. Okay. Undue burden, fundamental alteration is another exception. So there, yes, th that's, we really want to work together with the medical community, not be at odds. Yep. And the last question I have real quick is who would be making the determination here in the state? Would that be DPH would review and say, yes, you meet the exception? Is that how if we're going to put this in the bill, would that be what you're envisioning? Is that I, the agency? I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a social worker. So I'm not sure how the enforcement would work, but presumably um, the same way. It, I, 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 My understanding, and this might be wrong, on the federal level is you submit th that the, the undue burden request or whatever, and it's usually honored unless there's some kind of litigation associated with it. But that could be wrong. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm I, not sure. I appreciate that. I just want to make certain that, you know, it's clear in the process. I think having the exceptions would be important, especially, again, those who in good faith want to make the effort, but they can't do it in one fell swoop, especially for small practices. But I do very much appreciate your advocacy and the advocacy of others on this because uh, it is still an unmet need, even though I know the profession has made a lot of strides in general, uh, but there's certainly more to, to see what we could do, and we just want to balance those different interests so overall we can see what to do together. So thank you for advocating for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. Ruth, thank you so much uh, you. for being here with us today. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, uh, Rep. D'Amico, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and move that chair back over, if you don't mind. Um, next on our list is Suzanne Garafa. Suzanne, you are... All right. We're so happy that you are coming up. So, Suzanne... So I'll, I'll read the list off so that everyone knows. You may know your order already, but Suzanne is followed by Charles Hutchings and then by Jennifer Kane. And after Jennifer is Carmen Myers. So speaking of needing space to maneuver, the legislative office building is not necessarily the most user-friendly, is it? Yes, we had a bill in planning and development on that to have a task force. Not sure that task force ever was seated, but. Hi, my name is Suzanne Garafa. I'm with the Equal Access Group. I also have Suzanne Fight to Change. I'm going to ask Ruth Groby to read my testimony because I'm unable to, okay? Yes, Suzanne, thank you. And Ruth, you are more than welcome to sit in yeah. the seat where you were or okay. whatever you're more comfortable. So can we move? No, no, you're fine. Good afternoon. I am testifying in favor of what will hopefully be a modified version of HB 5200, an act concerning healthcare accessibility for persons with a disability. Two and a half years ago, I was referred to the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access by my advocate at Independence Unlimited because I wasn't able to find an accessible weight scale at Hartford Hospital. I had drafted a petition and gotten 100 signatures, but I never heard anything from the Hartford Health leadership in response to the petition. My primary care physician has been concerned about my weight and diet for approximately three years. Even though my doctor is part of Hartford Health and his office is in a building with many doctor's offices, there is no accessible weight scale in the building, and I am never weighed when I go for a checkup. I currently do not know what my weight is. 
When my doctor referred me to a dietitian, there was no accessible scale in her office either, and she scolded me for coming to her without knowing my weight. My doctor told me to go to the emergency room to get weighed, but did not give me any help in how to make an appointment or what to do. When I called on my own, I was told by the ER that this is not possible. This is not the only accessibility issue that I have had. In fact, because I cannot stand and pivot on my own, I have been refused for x-ray service by Jefferson Radiology. I have gotten so desperate that I filed an ADA complaint. Because I have severe dyslexia, doing this was very hard on me, and I don't think that my fellow advocates with disabilities should have to go through this process when many of them already have to struggle with the basic tasks of daily living. Inaccessible medical diagnostic equipment is a problem with the healthcare system, and the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access has been working for years to get legislative remedies, including in the present session, when we are advocating for some different language for HB 5200. Please consider our recommendations and please support HB 5200. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And Ruth, I love that we're hearing from you. And uh, Suzanne, did you want to add anything else? No, I just need you to really, really support this so we can make a difference in our lives and others. Thank if you, you. If you don't support it, we're going to have really big trouble because we can't get around in our doctor's appointments or doctor's places. Okay? So please think of us when you're doing this and please support this. Thank you so much for taking the time and making the effort to be here with us today. We're so grateful. I hope it works. I didn't mean to get that bad. Come on. No, you're good. So next we have Charles Hutchings. And again, Charles will be followed by Jennifer Kane. Is Am Charles here? Or can I go back? Oh, hi, Charles. Okay. We'll just wait just a moment. Come on. I'll Hello, Mr. Hutchings, welcome. I want my friend. I need all my man. Did you read it for you? Okay. You would like your friend to be able to read your testimony? I'm Myers. Okay. Hang on one second. We're Senator Amor is going to help make sure that the microphone is able to pick you up, um, pick up what you're saying so that everyone can hear it as well as those who are watching. Thank you. Hello, my name is Charles Hutchings. Testimony on HB 5200. Good afternoon, members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Charles Hutchings, and I live in Unionville. I have had cerebral palsy all my life. I have a speech disability and use a wheelchair. In addition, over the past few years, I've had multiple health issues, including developing lupus, as aspirating, aspirating, being catheters, using a feeding tube, and experiencing two broken lumbar vertebrae. Recently, third, a third one showed up. All these health conditions have resulted in my having multiple x-rays and MRIs recently. I went to the outpatient pavilion at UConn Health for an x-ray of my back. In order to try to take the x-ray with me in my wheelchair, the medical technician kept telling me that I should keep moving forward in my chair. Even though I tried to warn him several times that my chair was too big to fit. My speech disability makes made, makes it difficult for them to understand. So I had asked to bring my friend Carmen into the x-ray room so that she could help, but my request had been refused. Afterwards, we called Carmen and after I ran my wheelchair into the x-ray, then they called, then they called me in. Machine and made a dent in it after he made a dent in it. 
while following the attendance instructions. This story is an example of two issues that are included in HB 5200, the need for lifts to transfer a patient to the x-ray table and the need for medical personnel to be trained to listen to what a person with a disability has to say about his accessibility needs. Even in medical facilities where there is a lift present, present, it doesn't always work for me because my legs don't bend. I need a Hoyer lift, not a Sarah. When I try to tell medical personnel what my, need, what my needs are and what doesn't work, they do not take the time to listen. One time, some medical attendant tried to force my legs into the Sarah lift and did my yield. In the process, medical facilities need to be prepared for the diverse needs of people with disabilities. And the staff needs to be trained to listen and respect what the patient tells them. I'm glad that HB 5200 addresses the issue of space in doctor's offices. I am a large tall man and my motorized wheelchair is large as well. When I go to the dentist, I stay in my wheelchair because they recline and tilts, but staff has, has to move everything out of the room in order to accommodate me. I also have to go to the pulmonologist for checkups on regular basis and his office is not set up to accommodate a wheelchair. The doorways are very narrow and the examining room is so small that I have to back my wheelchair into it. There are obstacles such as chairs, stools, so I frequently steer my chair at the exam table by mistake. I would argue that not only the medical diagnostic equipment needs to be accessible, the office space needs does as well. Thank you very much for your considered considering my testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Is there anything else you would like to add? Did you want to add anything else? Only that they need to come up with a better plan. Yes, we need to come up with a better plan. And we hear you loud and clear and that the, we should be listening to you about what you need and that our providers should as well. So thank you so much for yeah. sharing your testimony with us and for being here today. Right. So next on our list is Jennifer Kane to be followed by Carmen Myers. Want me to read it? Please. Good afternoon, Ms. members. Irby, may I ask, are you going to read the testimony yeah. for Jennifer? Please. Did you? Would you? That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Do you mind if you are you able to uh, be at the chair just so that people watching can see you? It's not necessary. Oh, Whatever oh, is easiest you. for you, honestly, for the for both of you. I'm coming over here. Good afternoon, members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Jennifer Kane, and I live in Unionville. I suffered a brain injury at the age of 24, and it has affected my mobility so that I have to use a wheelchair. I have been submitting testimony for several years about the issue of inaccessible medical diagnostic equipment, and I'm here today to ask you to support HB 5200 especially if you adopt some of the language submitted by the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. A patient with a disability should be responsible to request any special accommodations in advance of their medical appointment. But by the same token, a doctor's office should be responsible to provide the accommodation. And frequently at the moment, this is not the case. I already have a brain injury. I need to stop banging my head against a legislative brick wall. Please support HB 5200 and language that would make it stronger and easier to pass. Am I saying no? No, you sure? No. Well, that was very well done. 
Thank you for that. We have a couple questions or comments. So if you can stay there where you are, that would be great. Senator Amwar. If I, if I can ask you for a favor, would you be able to just speak um, in the mic and speak about the legislative brick wall sentence again, please? No, you say at this time. You said it to me. <laughs> I don't know where it is, though. Oh, here you go. I already have a brain injury. I have, I have a brain injury. Please stop. I need to stop banging my head against the legislative brick wall. <laughs> Please support HB 5200 and language that would make it easier to pass, stronger and easier to pass. <laughs> Thank you so very much. We appreciate you and all of the effort and time that you took to get here today. Thank, Thank you. you. So next up, we have Carmen Myers to be followed by Alexandria Bodie. And forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. You will correct me. Welcome, Carmen. Good afternoon, members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Carmen Myers. I live in Farmington. Today, I want to tell you why I support HB 5200, an act concerning healthcare accessibility for persons with disabilities. I have COPD, means chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and congestive heart failure, and arthrogryposis, which is a congenital muscles and joints disease from birth, and I use a wheelchair. I have had a lot of health issues in recent years, and I have had some bad experiences because I cannot count on the availability of accessible diagnosis equipment, even if I call ahead and warn of my disability. At one point, my doctor wanted me to have a stress test, but I couldn't do it because there was no way for me to get on the machine. You gotta literally climb up high. At another time, when I had an MRI, the technicians had to force my neck and head into a cage, and it was very stressful, a little painful. Because of my health issues, it is critical for me to watch my weight. My primary guard doctor does not have an accessible scale in her office, so I have to find alternatives, let alone I have to go in through the back door to get into the bottom level because there's no accessibility upstairs. But I'm grateful that at least she has a room and actually a table that's a little low, which I was very amazed by. But there is no way to get um, weighted. When I have an appointment at a hospital for special care, I can weigh myself. But even there, I have to go to a different department in order to find an accessible scare, scale. But at least I found one. Please help people with disabilities to access the care we need by supporting HB 5200 and by considering the alternative language that has been suggested by the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. Thank you very much. Carmen, thank you so much for being here today for your testimony and sharing the specifics of your story, which um, are very compelling. So we appreciate I appreciate you being you here. Thank Very, you. Thank you. Next on our list, we have um, Alexandria Bodie. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and then followed by Valerie Rumpf. Uh, Hello. Welcome, Alexandria. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? 
I'm very well. We are very happy to have you here. And it looks like you have someone with you. Hi. Yeah. Um. And someone who will read your testimony. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Executive director of a nonprofit called Peace, Love, Accessibility, and it focuses on access for all. So, if I can ask you if you don't mind moving the microphone, there you go. Good, thank you. And if you would also just share your name, please, that would my, be wonderful. Yes, yeah. is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, my name is Olivia Del Basso. I'm one of Alex's many PCAs. Um, Welcome, and I'm going to read her testimony on behalf of Alex. Madam, Madam Chair, can I suggest just for ease of um, hearing that that uh, maybe you could move over and, and to to a different microphone, just so we'll all yes. be able to hear you more clearly. Thank like you, a, thank Representative D'Amico. That would be wonderful. Alexandria, we're just going to have um, and. Alan, just moving over to a different microphone. Great. Thank you. My name is Alex Bodie. I'm writing to passionately advocate for passage of HB 5200, an act concerning healthcare accessibility for persons with disabilities. My experience during a recent medical sleep study underscores the urgent need for this legislation. Despite assurances of accommodations, my disability was met with disregard and discrimination. Upon arrival, instead of including me in any decision, staff unilaterally decided to physically move me by picking me up, although a patient lift was available and in the room. This was done ignoring any of my needs or preferences. When I required access to the bathroom during the night, I was informed that it wasn't reachable via their patient lift, which meant I did not have access to any bathroom. The solution to their inaccessible bathroom presented to me was humiliating and degrading. Regrettably, this experience isn't an isolated incident, but rather a common occurrence of disrespectful treatment endured by individuals with disabilities within healthcare settings. The passage of this bill is long overdue. It would bring about essential changes to ensure that individuals with disabilities are treated with the dignity and respect they deserve in healthcare settings. I ask you to please support this bill and consider the stronger language proposed by CC equals A. Please work towards a healthcare system where everyone, regardless of ability, can access care with dignity and equality. In closing, Alex would like to recite a quote from her favorite disability advocate, Judith Human. Disability only becomes a tragedy when society fails to provide the things we need to lead our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for that powerful testimony and for sharing your experience with us. And what's clear and a theme that we're hearing today is that your voice and your wishes are not being heard. And we're here today to help address that. It looks like we have a question for you or a comment from Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's probably more of a, of a comment. Um, and I just wanted to, I was listening um, out of the room to everyone testifying. And I just want to acknowledge the uh, indignity that you've all been treated with um, and the lack of respect that you have been treated with in sharing your stories, um, in, in your experiences, it's been hard to listen to. And I just appreciate you all taking the time to be here today to explain what you've been going through and how um, you are advocating not only for your own personal health, but 
um, for the betterment of, of everyone. So um, I'm sorry that these situations happened to you and Alexandria specifically, I'm sorry about that situation at the sleep study. Um, and I, I do hope we can make things much better moving Thank forward. You. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Lee Lander. Thank you for being here with us today, Alex. Oh. Next on our list is Valerie Rump to be followed by Maureen Emerald. Hello, welcome. Oh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Valerie Anrum, and I'm with the, the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. I'm here to support um, House Bill 5200 um, regarding accessible medical equipment. Um, I do have some personal, I do have some personal stories that, that I've had with the healthcare system in the past year, especially dealing with diagnostic medical equipment. Um, I recently had to, to go for an, for an MRI of my lower back because I have cerebral palsy and I have all the, the quote unquote wonderful orthopedic issues that go along with it. And, and one of them was I had I did have to go for an MRI on my on my lower back and and from me trying to to transfer out of my power wheelchair and into the manual wheelchair that they had at that that they had at the MRI facility over at Yukon. Um that um that was a pain in the butt because first of all the chair that they had me transfer into was was extremely heavy and clunky, but I, but I do understand why I couldn't take my own chair into the MRI room because of, you know, because of obvious safety reasons. But I, but it got me, but it got me thinking what, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what if a pa you know, what if a patient with a disability couldn't treat couldn't transfer into a manual chair by themselves. You know, is you know, is there a lift or anything available? And also, I've had to have X-rays done too. And and for me trying to get on the X-ray table, that was a pain in the in the you know what too. Uh, oh boy. And also, um, I've. You know, I've had a couple of other, you know, diagnostic images done and all, and also tests, and just trying to actually, fit, you know, physically get on the on the equipment, especially when it's not adjustable. It's, 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 it's not, it's, it's not a good situation. And I've also had to go for an I. For an eye exam, well, um, at, at one of my doctor's offices, and just trying to get into the room with and you know, with my power wheelchair. That's I I felt like I had to Tetris my way into the room because the room was so small. <sighs> I'm I'm just I'm just hoping that this bill passes so that people with disabilities don't have to go through all of this rigmarole just to. Just to get help, just to get, you know, just to get the proper health care that we deserve. Thank you. 
Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you again for sharing your story and explaining the difficulties that you face in trying to access care. Mm -hmm. And we're grateful that you took the time to get here and made the effort to get here today. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Next on our list is Maureen Emerald, and Maureen will be followed by Gary Gross. Hello, Maureen, welcome. Thank you, Representative McCarthy Behe and Senator Anwar and members of the committee. My name is Maureen Amiro. I am a resident of Wethersfield and I have muscular dystrophy. Before I make a new appointment with a new medical appointment, I have to call ahead to ask about the accessibility of the office. Does the equipment raise and lower? Will the exam room be large enough to accommodate my wheelchair? Will I be able to transfer safely to an exam table or chair? I traveled to a dentist's office this past summer. They assured me they were accessible, but when I got there, my chair could not fit into the exam room or into the hallway. And while the dental chair was adjustable, the stationary arm rest prevented me from a safe transfer. I went through a total of three dentists and five eye doctors in a period of six months before finding offices that were accessible to me. And actually is lucky in this case because despite the hassle, I was able to find locations that met my needs. But with other medical appointments, it hasn't been as easy. When a facility is not fully accessible, the solution I'm given time and again is that we'll just do the best that we can. And I've learned that sometimes that means we can't do anything at all. And there have been many tests and cancer screenings that I have not been able to do because of inaccessibility. And here are a few examples of other issues. I had um, a few years ago, I had a melanoma, but the best that we can do to monitor my skin is a less than thorough skin check. I have lymphedema and I need ultrasounds to check for blood clots, but because I cannot get onto the exam table or turn over, the best we can do is get images of just the tops of my legs. I went to the lymphedema specialist. I could not get onto the table. So the best that we could do is just get a few measurements of my legs and just eyeball the rest. I had an urgent endoscopy and colonoscopy scheduled, not for a routine test, but because I had symptoms. They scheduled to admit me the night before to help with the prep. This was not something I could do on my own, but um, they're supposed to call me when they were ready for me to come in, but they never did. And they did not return my phone calls. When I finally talked to them a couple of days later, they said they explained that they no longer help with the prep. And when I followed up with my specialist, he said, well, we'll just assume that the stool test was a false positive and we'll just closely monitor your situation. But how do you closely monitor a situation when you don't have accessible testing options? And the answer seems to be you don't. I haven't had an endoscopy or any further tests and um, and we're just gonna wait and see what happens with this uh, GI issue. We're not monitoring for my lymphedema, my lymphedema and blood clots, even though my lymphedema is getting worse. And there are no alternative forms of testing, monitoring, or treatment that have been offered to me. At the end of the day, the best we can do is nothing at all. And that's not good enough. In fact, it's pretty terrible. Without the intervention, and the basic standards, the revised standards outlined in HB 5200, it will only get worse. It will get worse for me and the tens of thousands of disabled residents in Connecticut. Please remember us and our stories and support this important bill. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful testimony. Uh, the best we can do is nothing else is not an answer that any of us should ever hear. And, um, it's concerning to hear what you're sharing as it has been to hear all of the stories today. 
Thank you very much for being here. And I apologize for mispronouncing your last name. I, I, was, I was way off. Our next uh, guest here today or visitor testifier, I always wanna say witness. It's I think being raised by a lawyer. Um, Gary Gross to be followed by Andrew Bate. mic as I can. Hang on. Okay, go for it. Thank Hi. you, Mr. Gross. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to say a couple of things, and then I'm going to have Ruth read my testimony, because I like what I wrote better than what I'm going to say. Um, it seems like we've been here uh, a lot of times talking about the same, same thing. Um, we need to have the 5200 um, pass so all the people in Connecticut who have physical disabilities, you know, can have exam tables and, and lifts that really work. Now I'm going to have Ruth read my testimony. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Almost every C sequels. CC equals A member has a story to tell about inaccessible health care, but many of us are also very discouraged, isolated, and dealing with many problems. Many people with multiple disabilities, like myself, face tons of problems, including delays in wheelchair repair and difficulty finding caregivers. I want to thank my fellow advocates who are here today because it is stressful and difficult. Now let me share my personal experience about medical diagnostic equipment. Every few months, I used to go for a Botox shot to help alleviate spasms in my inner thighs and tightness in my knees from my cerebral palsy. I brought my aide who had to lift me onto my doctor's exam table because it was not accessible. This is dangerous for both her and me. When I lost my aid and had to hire somebody else, the new person was not willing to transfer me manually, so I had to give up on the shots. I like my doctor and have a long-standing relationship, but I don't think that he will get an accessible table or lift without some kind of incentive. As I age, transferring becomes increasingly difficult because my body has started to break down even more. This makes me aware that HB 5200 could be as important for seniors as it is for people with disabilities. Thank you for considering my testimony. And I just thank want to say, I say one more thing. I want to thank um, Ruth Roby very much um, and Senate Representative Mike D'Amico very much. So thank you, Ruth and Mike. Thank you for that, Mr. Gross, and thank you uh, for talking about and acknowledging the the difficulty of getting here and sharing this message. And we hear your message, and and we're very grateful for you being here in person with us today. Next, we have Andrew Bate, and then finally will be Mary Ann Langton. Thank you. Very well. Yep. That should work. Thank you, Senator Ann. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Senator Ann Ward, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and all members of the Public Health Committee for the opportunity to speak in support of HB 5200 not concerning accessibility for persons with disabilities. <laughs> In my personal experience, I now recognize that I have not had 
a comprehensive physical exam since going to because I have been unable to get up on an examination table since about my mid twenties. Um, in my professional experience as a social worker, I can say that while I'm not aware of any deaths, I am aware of several close calls where treatment was delayed and there was a longer treatment course or recovery time. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, my apologies. One second, please. No need to apologize. Take your time. Uh, um, uh, there we go. Um, due to the access to uh, to due to the lack of access to accessible medical equipment, <clears throat> um, that would be such as. Um, and in, in, the, in these instances that I'm aware of, they involve depressed pelvic and prostate cancer screening. And we all know how, how important that is, or at least people with disabilities are told all the time to, are told all the time to get those through the media. <clears throat> um, I would ask you, please pay particularly attached to a proposed amendment attached to the testimony of Ruth Proby, the Secretary of the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access to it. The proposed amendment provides for additional protections for small private practices um, and undue burden exception for those um, practices or hospitals that cannot demonstrate uh, that can demonstrate that they not financially comply and establish and it with the uh, with HB fifty two hundred and establishes a fund in order to help practices comply with uh, this legislation. Some of all of you may be aware of the federal regulations written by the United States Office of Health and Human Services to address these issues. And some of you may be asking, why not wait for the federal government? In my opinion, is that if the Connecticut State Legislature takes no action on this issue, it may already be too late for some people in this room. And I I just want to add that I I think it was Maureen that mentioned that she didn't have access to the proper medical equipment to get a colonoscopy and an OCD. Well, that's what I mean by close call, is that delay is gonna cause a problem. <laughs> um I attached to my testimony a report done in 2021 by the National Council on Disability uh, entitled Enforceable Accessible Medical Equipment Standards and Necessary, and necessary Access to Health Care Needs of Persons with Disabilities. <laughs> and I, I want to say that in that, in that in that table, it indicates that various federal agencies have been working on this issue since 1991. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. And you, as your fellow testifiers, have raised so many very powerful and important points to us here, as Senator Amwar. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Co-Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments for the Connecticut Coalition for Equal Access. Um, it takes a lot of effort to come here and look at the logistics and the work. And I'm sorry you had to come here to ask for what is your right. I'm so sorry that you had to come here to ask for what is your right, what should have been your right, and you should have been 
taking care of your average daily activities rather than being here to say, how long are we going to wait for this? And, and also uh, all the advocates, all the people who have spoken about uh, um, how long we're going to wait for this. We are, our hope is that we should be able to address this as a body. We should be able to address this as a public health committee. You are equal partners, equal citizens, and more equal citizens than others at times because you need our help. We need to work together. And then your asks are very simple. You're asking that you just get the care that you deserve. You get to be able to wait, to be examined just like anybody else is. If you get an examination, a radiologic test, you should be able to get that. You should have equipment that should be able to address your needs according to your needs. And, and all the, the healthcare workforce should have the empathy, kindness, and willingness to work and recognize what your experience is and to be able to help you through that process. So your testimonies, your, your efforts, it, it is something that we are all heard. We will, we, I'm touched. I know my colleagues are touched. We are here for this purpose. And, and we are hoping that we will do the right thing going forward and, and, and listen to the very fair suggested new language that you've talked about and then get this out of the committee. And then after that, hopefully advocate to the rest of this body to do the right thing. And then, then also ask the state government to be able to put resources so that that fund would have money so that we can create a mechanism to address this. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. And, and, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Thank you, Senator Amar. Representative Wielander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Andrew, may I ask a question? Yes. Is it safe to assume that you and um, your colleagues who are here today and those who are not able to be here today have all had to skip routine health care over the years? Um, yeah, I think I think that would be accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the <laughs> regular testing that we are all encouraged to do and um, sort of sometimes chided by our physicians because we recognize through decades of scientific research that early detection is key those exams and those tests you have not been able to attend to. No. Okay. Um, like in, in my rehearsal experience, when I was at the Hugh Rapoza Hospital as an intern, oh, ah, it, was, um, it was known that uh, if you lose 30% of your body weight um, over a three month period, you have to get reevaluated. You have to be evaluated for a change of condition. And, um, you know, I haven't weighed since my mid-20s. So while it may seem like a great idea for somebody that wants to hide their weight, uh, <laughs> um, it's not a good idea if you want to stay healthy. I appreciate your sense of humor in this very much. Um, but I think it's important to note not only are for people who may be wondering how what kind of burden are we going to be asking medical facilities to take on what are the long term costs if we have to take something that is a very human issue and break it down to a fiscal issue what are the long term costs of a large group of people unable to attend to early screening and early diagnostic is, uh, medical um, procedures that can not only improve their own quality of life, but also save money for the insurance companies and individuals and different providers in the long run. Like this is, this seems to be a, a bit of a, a no brainer across the board. And I think um, Gary, I believe made the very mm -hmm. smart point that this is also for people who are just senior citizens who have mobility issues. And this is a growing population. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for your your time today, Andrew, and your testimony. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Gary. And to everyone from the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access group for being here with us today. We do have another, actually one other person. I'm sorry, Mary Ann Langton.
Welcome. Hello, co-chairs, Anne Suar and McCarthy and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Mary Ann Lengthen and Jill Bentevango, who is my assistant, will be reading my statement that I have written for today's hearing. I am extremely supportive and excited about HB 5200, an act concerning healthcare accessibility for persons with disabilities. But I would also urge you to adopt the alternative language that will be proposed to you by the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. There are 55,000 folks with mobility disabilities in Connecticut that are not getting adequate medical exams and so forth due to inaccessibility of medical machines and or equipment. In addition, people who are obese and the elderly would find these accessible features useful too. The state of Connecticut is failing in their responsibility of requiring that medical facilities be accessible for people with disabilities. According to the American with Disabilities Law, this federal law requires full and equal access to healthcare facilities. Not only is accessibility legally required, but also medically imperative so that minor issues can be addressed before turning into life-threatening problems. Imagine being a person in a power wheelchair and not feeling well. Your head is throbbing and your doctor has ordered you to have a CAT scan test to see if you might have a sinus infection. You roll into the testing room with your power wheelchair and there is a gasp from the medical assistant because he or she does not know what to do with you. Then you see medical assistants huddle together trying to figure out how to assist you on the high table. This is a true story that has happened to me many times when I go for various medical tests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you both. And again, uh, really on behalf of the entire Public Health Committee, thanks to all who have testified today to give voice to the support for 5200 and in particular for the work that's been done um, with the language that will be something that we can really move forward with, as Senator Amor said, and continue to remain in discussion that will make the bill stronger and also more practical in many ways. So thank you, uh, Ruth and all who came to testify today. With that, we are going to go back um, into our regular order. And oh, I am sorry, Representative Rader, I missed you. I am remiss. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to take just one minute. I've been sitting listening to all these incredible people here with Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. And as someone who um, had a dear uncle in my life with cerebral palsy, it is quite shocking to me that unfortunately you are all dealing with these challenges every day in terms of what should be just your right as Senator Anwar spoke to. So I just want to thank you. I know it's not easy for you to physically get there, to here to testify. And please know that I'm, I'm glad that Madam Chair just said this, but the entire committee um, is so thankful for your testimony. And um, we will do everything we can to strengthen this bill and to make sure that this is not something that you continue to have to deal with. So thank you for indulging me for just a minute, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Rader. Next, we have Jim Acabellis um, up here in person. Welcome. Thank you. First, I'd like to say it's it's humbling and inspiring to fo to follow the advocacy I just followed, and I just think that that's that's important important to say at the outset. My name is Jim Acavellis. I'm the senior vice president of government and regulatory affairs at the Connecticut Hospital Association. I'm pleased to be here to testify on Senate Bill Nine, an act promoting hosp hospital financial stability. We are aware this is a bill proposed by the governor. Um, in, in, in our working relationship with the governor, we also know that he has always been one in, throughout the pandemic who is interested in making things work and work well and is interested in partnership. And it's with that spirit that, um, um, that I testify on Senate Bill 9. When, when, when I first read the, the bill in the title, an act promoting uh, hospital financial stability, I was uh, kind of thrilled and hoped to see a bill that would actually help um, hospitals ensure 
their financial stability and deal with what is a fragile hospital community. How could it not? In September of uh, 2023, the Office of the Health Strategy published an annual report on the stability of hospitals. And I quote, the growth in operating expenses far exceeded the growth in operating revenue. 29% increase in contract labor, 26 in, in growth in salaries and wages, 17% growth in drugs and supplies, and statewide margins down. Um, but Senate Bill 9 doesn't do anything to assist and address those issues. Given that I have three minutes, I, I will not go through our concerns line by line. I'm happy to if someone wants me to, but I expect that will be for further conversations. Um, but let's talk about some some themes in this bill. Uh, Senate Bill 9, out of its six sections, adds three new civil penalties for hospitals and institutions. Senate Bill 9 substitutes the judgment of clinicians on clinical matters and health and healthcare experts with that judgment of the state. Um, it dramatically increases the financial data submitted to the Office of Health Strategy, even given the fact that in September of uh, 2023, and as long as I can remember, every year we see a 123-page report which looks at hospital finances and goes back five years. Um, and it doesn't do anything to address what are the foundational broken parts of the CON process. In fact, it expands regulatory oversight. So we're, we're hoping this committee will be that bridge to not simply identifying problems, but solving them. With, with respect to hospital diversion, simply having the state decide when a hospital will can and is allowed to divert a patient to work with us to add provisions about prior authorization, about the needs for community resources pre and post hospitalization, especially in the area of behavioral health. Um, to look at Medicaid rates for community providers so we can ensure that patients are treated in the most appropriate setting. No assistance for those hospitals that are in financial distress that we're gonna sign, uh, provide information on. No grants, no loans, no assistance, no increase in Medicaid rates and no assistance to look at the workforce struggles. And, um, and finally, no solution to the, as I said before, the broken CON process. I would like to highlight um, language that we've talked about, the committee has talked about before, lines 323 to 330. We read them the way Senator Looney reads them. We read them the way Senator Summers lead, reads them in the way um, uh, Senator Gordon reads them as well. What they will do, let's be clear, is between now and December 31st of 2025, it will say anyone but a hospital, whether you're private equity, whether you are a billionaire in Idaho, whether you're a physician practice in Texas, or whether you're a corporation, you can come in and acquire a physician practice without going through CON. So those hospitals that have been in the state for over 200 years are the ones that will be going through CON, but it allows all of those entities to come in during that time frame. I, I was here and listened to Dr. Gifford talk about the need to understand um, the process uh, and how many applications are coming in, but let's be clear on what that's going to do. And all the talk about private equity, we are opening the door and we put notice for all those individuals that between now and December 31st, come into the state of Connecticut without regulatory oversight. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot to talk about there, isn't there? I yes, know sir. we have a few questions. Uh, I'll begin with Senator Amar to be followed by Rep. Claritas Dietria. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your testimony and, and speaking. I thought all the billionaires from Idaho had moved to Connecticut but uh, not quite. Um, um, we appreciate your testimony and appreciate your, your thoughts. Even in the past when there have been bills where we are trying to find common ground, um, this committee has been part of that conversation. To um, I, I think we are all trying to solve similar problems and, and we may have a different way of approaching them. So we hear you. We hear the, the challenges the hospitals are experiencing as well. Um, and there may be opportunities to to address some of that. I think 
from what I heard uh, Dr. Gifford say is that as of right now, there is no law having an impact on practices. And, and, and that's part of the weakness that they have. Um, and um, putting that language, their intention, what I heard was to start to collect the data but not have any intervention yet because they there is a workforce issue that they are having, which CHA understands better than probably any other body. Um, uh, that uh, the the Office of Health Strategies need more personnel or more processes improvement. So adding another burden or responsibility, sorry, um, may require more workforce and they're trying to gather data to say what workforce needs they may have. And and I think that's a rationale for it, but I, I, I hear that there's an opportunity to fix that. They will, if we change the language, the workforce issues will get even more complex. And then that's the part I'm worried about. Can you, do you want to reflect on that aspect? I understand that, but I don't, I don't think I, and or we understand or are perplexed by if we need to understand what the workforce impact will be, why they decided to focus on Connecticut hospitals versus new out of state players and allowing them to go through the process without going through a CON versus Connecticut hospitals. If we're looking to understand what the workflow is, I'm not sure how that does it. Believe me, we submitted testimony in support of 5319, an act concerning private equity um, in, uh, in the health. It, it is important. We need to understand it. If we look at, around at what our neighbors are doing, um, uh, uh, neighboring states, they are all trying to get their arms around it. But this, that provision will have the absolute opposite effect. It could have the absolute opposite effect. So we are, we, we are really concerned about that. And in relation to the certificate of need process, and I know we're going to have um, at least two other bills to talk about, that provision is in the Office of Health Strategies bill as well, so it will come up again. But until we fix the foundational problems of the Office of Health Strategy, you heard about the year it took to acquire a CAT scan. We want to just hearken back to the conversation we just had in order to acquire a piece of diagnostic equipment to take a year to get through CON uh, is problematic. And that's simply acquiring a CAT scan. This We can't simply not add into the fact that we, it, we can't simply keep adding things to the CON process and expect the timeline and the process to get better when we're not making any efficiencies in the process. One of the things that we'll hear is we think there are things that should go from the Office of Health Strategy to the Office of the Attorney General. Yes, we're saying things should better off in the Office of, of the Attorney General. That's rare that we say that, but we think in order to make suggestions on how to make the process work better, we have to come up with some some solutions. So that's a little tease for next week or the <laughs> or the or the week after. And we I understand the issue about we need an early warning signal if hospitals are in distress. We think there is enough information that is any of the hospitals that were part of the conversation about providing financial assistance, if you look back on those reports to the Office of Health Strategy, that information is there. Granted, there is a, there is a, a lag. I think it can be done in an, in an easier and more simplistic way as opposed to a complete, a, a significant amount of data being given to the office health strategy by every hospital, whether you're financially secure or not, as opposed to really digging down and figuring out what is what is the trigger that means you're in distress and putting that onus on somebody who is hitting that trigger, as opposed to every single hospital, every single quarter, providing every single invoice that is past 90 days due. There are ways to get at this, but we think it is... It, 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 it can be improved, and we don't think we need to have civil penalties in every step of the way. Um, 
we hear you loud and clear and 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 um, i'll just say that there have been some hospitals who have functioned in a manner uh, that has probably triggered parts of the bill I, I say this many times that bad actors make great bills and and, and uh, unfortunately that's part of the reason that uh, the governor has put some of the provisions because end of the day when things fall apart the state has to intervene and we have to figure out in our budgets how do you make the healthcare system survive so but these are very valid conversations and i think it's a beginning of uh, because this is just one bill and there are about five other similar bills that are floating around and we'll probably put them all together and start to have some real conversations with rolling up our sleeves and, and looking at uh, multi-pronged uh, aspects to this. And and I don't want to leave the impression at all that we would not and could not support provisions related to some of the issues that you're talking about, but we simply can't keep adding that to the, to the plate, the plate's already bending one year to get a CAT scan approved. With you, 100%. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Anwar. Representative Clara Distitria to be followed by Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I just want to know if you can discuss or comment on that Section 2, Lines 24 through 43, uh, in regards to hospitals going on diversion, is there are we having an issue with how hospitals go on diversion now, and how would this change it? And especially, my concern is that it says in the language that hospitals, before they go on diversion, they have to notify DPH they're going on diversion. I just don't understand how that would be possible. I have not had any conversations with the administration of the Office of Health Strategy or DPH on specifically why that is in there. However, we know and we've read articles about the cyclical increase in behavioral health patients going to Connecticut Children's Hospital and what that means and how they handle those patients. And if you if your ED is overcrowding, where do those patients go? So we I would guess that part of that conversation is what may have sparked this. However, you're absolutely right. If you are a, a hospital and there something happens, I mean, I think an easier way, easier way to talk about it is if, if you're a hospital and your CAT scan goes down, right? your CAT scan goes down. So those individuals that are coming in, the needing stroke care, you want them to go, you don't want them to come into the hospital and then find out the CAT scan's going on. You want to divert them quickly. So simply by making the decision that it's better to get that hospital to go from Derby to Bridgeport because it's better for the patient and you haven't called DPH and told them or provided them notice on the form, $25,000 penalty. The system can be improved, right? There are issues and it's sort of what I was talking about if we have, we need to get to the underlying issues. If we have issues related to significant number of behavioral health patients, the answer isn't to simply move them around as the state decides they should be moved around. It's let's make sure we have the services in the community that prevents someone from going into crisis and helps them after going in, into crisis. So it it's sort of a this bill does a great job, if you will, of identifying issues, but it doesn't do anything to help solve them. More information, whether it's last week's 340B, this week's um, um, financial um, in, uh, financial information, and these, these new diversion are all sort of more state oversight and control and taking judgment away from the physicians that can do it better every single day. Thank you for that explanation. And I, I don't know if you mentioned that at all, but have you heard of any hospitals having issues with how they're diverting? I mean, patients? I do. I, I think the on a on an I think frequent basis, we know that sometimes the the cat cat the cat scan example does happen, but and we know that Connecticut Children's is having continuing problems on behavioral health, and the hospitals in Connecticut have jumped in. But outside of th those sort of examples, I have not. 
Okay, thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank but, you, Madam Chair. But we did have a whole conversation about ED overcrowding, right? These two things are not unconnected. Thank you, Representative Claritis Dietria. Indeed, they are connected for certain. Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Jim, for coming to testify. I I'm going to turn your attention to a different bill, if I may. Uh, my favorite bill, House Bill 5200. Um, uh, the, the Hospital Association uh, submitted testimony uh, on this, so I, I, I presume you're familiar with the testimony. You may have even written the testimony. I, I will say that uh, my colleague Karen has been the point person on that, and she apologizes for being here. She's taking care of a, um, a, a very sick family member who has mob mobility issues. So she understands all of this, but but I'm happy to try to answer your question. Fair, fair enough. All right. Th th thank you. And and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. I appreciate Karen's um, diligence. So so um, so I, I'm looking at the testimony from the Connecticut Hospital Association and and, and um, with regards to uh, House Bill 5200. And, and um, uh, I'm just looking at some of the some of the um, uh, a couple of the paragraphs, uh, and I, I won't read it back to you, obviously, but but it talked about the fact it, it the testimony talks about the fact that the, the the federal rules are not final. There are many open questions that remain. Um, um, federal rules need to be finalized. Uh, questioning the availability of medical equipment, and um, I, I just wanted to, to just point out to you. I don't know if you were around for the discussion that, that we had uh, earlier. Uh, I know you were in and out of the room, but um, in, in discussing these issues with um, the the um, the, the uh, secretary of the uh, Citizens Coalition for Equal Access, uh, she said, and and it's also uh, I believe in her her testimony that that the, that the federal government has has um, accepted the, the technical standards that have come down from the U.S. Access Board, uh, which have been around for seven years, by the way. And, and, and to, to go a little further, uh, just to put a little finer point on it, the, the, uh, um, my understanding is that, that, that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has adopted in their entirety all of these technical standards from the Access Board, as well as the U.S. Department of Justice. So I guess my question for you is, if, if, if the Department of Justice has accepted these, these technical standards and the Department of Health and Human Services has accepted these technical standards, why in the world can't little old state of Connecticut accept these technical standards from the U.S. Access Board? My, my understanding, again, I'm not the expert. My understanding is you're correct. They have accepted the what are the standards what they haven't yet decided is to whom it applies and when it will apply right so th the standards for the diagnostic equipment our understanding is have been accepted but to whom that will apply to when it will apply and what are the exceptions that that's part of the conversation that is that is going forward I, I, I think it's important to note that we absolutely are support and understand and appreciate the need to make sure everybody gets the appropriate care, whether it's a physician's office, an eye doctor's office, or a hospital. We need to do this together. I, I, do, I haven't seen, and I know my colleague hasn't seen, the changes that were uh, going to be applied to this bill. And that may remove some of our concerns. And my guess is it does when we talk about when we talk about state support. However, we we know of a hospital that spent six hundred thousand dollars and waited eight months in order to reconfigure an, an office space for four inches for a piece of imaging equipment. So let's we need to, at the same time as we're dealing with the standards, be able to deal with some of the other regulatory issues, the certificate of need requirements for acquisition of diag certain diagnostic equipment, the Department of Public Health's requirement to come in and look at the building to make sure it complies with the building code and building safety. $600,000, eight months, because with four inches for a piece of radiology equipment. So it, it, it's a long way of saying we need to look at what the proposed amendments are. It may take 
care of some of our concerns. But in and of itself, that the bill, if passed, even with the money, does not solve the red tape, which is a significant issue. But not not to be argumentative, Jim. But but if these standards have been around for seven years, and I I, I think it's fair to say that 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 no one is questioning whether or not these will be the final standards. Th these are going to be the standards, from what from as far as I know. So why can't we take those standards and and apply them to Connecticut? I I I, I don't understand the I, reticence. I, I really don't. No, I apologize. I probably wasn't clear enough. I what I had said was. We agreed that the standards were there. And we agreed that your characterization and the previous characterizations about the standards is accurate. However, the comments and the conversation that's still going on at the federal level, my understanding, again, I'm not the expert here, and that my understanding is that to whom they apply, I mean, do they apply to Dr. Jim or Dr. D'Amico, hasn't been decided. When will Dr. Jim or Dr. D'Amico have to comply with these standards, which we all agree on? And what are the exceptions? That those are the items. I'm not arguing about the standards themselves. It's those things that I think are still up for discussion. But would it not be possible for Connecticut to decide on its own that these standards apply to Dr. Jim and Dr. D'Amico and all the other doctors and just put them into effect? And w w without uh, a any harm uh, ensuing therefrom? I do not doubt that the state has the absolute ability to do this. The question becomes, if we put this these requirements on Dr. D'Amico and he goes through and makes all of these changes and we find out that for whatever reasons they don't apply to Dr. D'Amico, is is that going to be a problem? Why would they not apply to Dr. D'Amico? Because if... that's the conversation I understand that's happening at the federal level, because they're going to make a distinction between who it can apply to. That's my understanding is what they're out for comment. But I'm happy to have... But to have... Would, you not agree, you. would you not agree that the state of Connecticut can, can, can forego waiting for the feds who can't get out of their own way and just make its own decisions as to who to, to whom those standards would apply and just go from there? I, I apologize. I, I, I was probably not clear enough. I do not doubt or question the authority of the state of Connecticut to apply those standards and any standards. However, we need to be cognizant of what that will mean in terms of our state agencies coming in and making sure that they can work and they have the ability to do that, right? If you if if you say everyone needs to by January first, twenty twenty five, have an accessible piece of imaging equipment under our current CON program, that will not happen because it takes a year to go through that process, and it takes eight months for the for the for the reconfiguration of the Department of Public Health. So there are other things that need to be added in there. I did not question, and say it again, the state's authority to put these on. We're questioning sort of the appropriateness of how and when we do it. Representative D'Amico, would you like to conclude your question? Yeah, I, I, Yes, Madam Chair, I, I apologize. I, I'm, I, I know we're not supposed to debate, but I, I, I was really curious to get the perspective of the Hospital Association on this. So thank you for your, for your um, for your forbearance. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. And certainly when uh, Ms. Buckley is available, we will have additional conversations with her directly as well. Seeing no other questions, thank you for being here with us today and for waiting uh, earlier. We appreciate that. Happy to. Thank you. Tremendously. Next, uh, we have Mira Cohen, who's here in person with us, to be followed by Mary Ellen Conway online, who we also thank for waiting for us today. Welcome, Ms. Cohen. Before you proceed, if you could press the button right in front of you so we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is my first time doing this, so. Um, good afternoon, Senator Anwar. Representative McCarthy-Vehi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. 
My name is Mira Cohen. I'm a resident of West Hartford and a student in the MSW program at the University of Connecticut. I'm here today to speak in support of House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. Medical debt is a major and growing contributor to the cycle of economic and health inequity. Racial inequities in income, wealth, and insurance coverage play a role in the prevalence and burden of medical debt. Financial assistance policies, also known as charity care, can help reduce how often patients incur medical debt and ensure that people eligible for assistance don't, do not end up in collections. Medical debt is incredibly widespread and can impact anyone in this room. As many as 40% of U.S. adults, or about 100 million people, are currently in debt because of medical or dental bills. In Connecticut, roughly 280,000 people have medical debt. A study in 2023 found that people with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level are particularly vulnerable, um, often lacking insurance coverage, and having to delay or forgo medical care due to cost. However, people with health insurance still struggle to pay medical bills. The same study found that middle-class families with incomes between 50000 and 100000 are hit the hardest. As an emerging social worker, I see the complexities in navigating the healthcare system without adding medical debt. This is why I support the measures outlined in House Bill 5320. The committee should also consider mandating hospitals offer a reasonable payment plan for anyone not qualifying for assistance. This ensures that patients do not have to cut back on basic living necessities to pay their bills and can decrease hospitals' bad debt. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance um, policies. I urge the committee to favorably pass this bill. Thank you so much, Ms. Cohen. As a fellow social worker, I hope that this, is, while it's your first time testifying, I hope it is not your last, and I hope that you will have this experience and share your advocacy many, many more times. Seeing no questions, thank you for being here with us today. We appreciate it. Next online, we have Mary, Mary Ellen Conway. Forgive me to be followed by Christopher Arnold. Ms. Conway, welcome. Please proceed. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator Anwar, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Mary Ellen Conway, and I'm a social worker speaking testimony in favor of House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. I currently work within the health sector directly assisting the HIV AIDS community, a community which has been consistently failed by the medical community as a whole. Early in the AIDS epidemic, their fight for survival was in their own hands. They were untouched by those with the medical experience to save them and countless died because of it. Now I watch clients be ignored yet again because the financial cost of treatment exceeds any possible fee they can afford. They have to choose between housing and medical appointments, between food and the medication they need to survive. Their lives are tied to necessary medical care that is not only bankrupting them, but creating a generational debt that their families are left to pay. More clients are scared to leave their families with mountains of medical debt than they are of death itself. To speak to the resiliency of the community would take more words than I'm allowed. The stories that I have heard from clients show loving family members, creative spirits, and activists who have given more back to the communities than we can ever thank them for. This bill would allow us to show some gratitude to the HIV AIDS community by reducing the financial trade for treatment they fight so hard through. Let us do what we can to help them and their families for the consistent battles they face every day by allowing better access to hospital financial assistance. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
Ms. Conway, I'm sure you heard what I said to your fellow social work student. It's wonderful to have you here and thank you for your advocacy on this very important issue. Uh, the numbers that you all are sharing with us as well as the stories are very compelling. Seeing and hearing no questions, we will move on to number 25, Christopher Arnold, who is with us online. And Mr. Arnold will be followed by Marcus Palumbo. Welcome, Mr. Arnold. Thank you, Madam Chair. Christopher Arnold, United States Department of Defense State Liaison Office here on behalf of my colleague, Melissa Willett, your New England Region Liaison, who is on maternity leave. In a time when military families face constant relocations and unique health challenges, interstate compacts such as House Bill 5058 offer a beacon of stability and excellence in health care, reinforcing Connecticut's unwavering commitment to those who serve our nation, including Connecticut residents currently stationed in other states. On January 5th, 2023, the president signed the Veterans Auto and Education Improvement Act, which allows for recognition of out-of-state licenses. The law specifically states that interstate occupational licensure compacts are preferred. Additionally, while Connecticut's licensing agencies are now required to recognize out-of-state licenses as valid for the duration of a military spouse's residency due to military orders, Connecticut's employers and insurers are not. Congress required DOD to enter into a cooperative agreement with the Council of State Governments to support the development and passage of interstate compacts. Congress also required us to consider membership in the Nurse Licensure Compact as a factor considered in the Military Department's Strategic Basing Scorecard. I'll explain why. Frequent moves associated with military service disproportionately affect service members and families who are covered by state-specific credentialing requirements. These cause delays and gaps in, in employment. House Bill 5058 will have a substantial positive impact, which not only benefits military spouses, but all eligible professionals who call Connecticut home when seeking employment as a nurse in a compact member state. In addition to supporting the drafting of model compact laws for professions, federal law requires DOD to support professions with developing database systems to make the compacts more efficient and operational, which allow states to share information about practitioners using compact provisions to work in member states. House Bill 5058 advances an important policy to support the economic security of Connecticut's military families stationed around the country, while simultaneously providing qualified individuals to address the broader issue of the nationwide nursing shortage. As always, as liaison to the Mid-Atlantic region, I stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Arnold, I'm grateful for your testimony. As the spouse of a 21-year Navy veteran, I am so thankful for the work that you do. And in fact, I often took issue with the term that the military used, which was dependent. And this bill actually will help those military spouses to be able to continue to further their careers and continue to uh, be able to support their families as well. So I appreciate your testimony today. Um, there is one question for you, Representative Mara. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony uh, today. Just curious, from a military perspective, you know, really appreciate you speaking on this, but are there any other professions that you foresee um, a compact would be useful for in the future from a military perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for that excellent question. And uh, in 2022, um, I've quoted uh, extensively in the DPH report uh, to the General Assembly uh, on this subject. But the cooperative agreement we have with CSG has led to the development of seven compacts so far. We have another grant out right now uh, for number eight, and we can fund up to 10. In total, there are 15 uh, compacts, uh, which we support. Um, and there's not a compact for every occupation, nor is each state a member of every compact, which is why the department pursues a variety of approaches to reciprocity uh, simultaneously. Regardless of a military spouse's years of experience in an occupation, boards often look to test scores and academic records to assess competency, and military spouses who have maintained a successful career in an occupation in a variety of locations and circumstances express frustration over having to justify their credibility and competency in the same manner as first-time applicants. But other than the compact, 
There's no law that Connecticut can pass to help the thousands of other Connecticut residents stationed around the country to obtain a license in another state. So our current effort to develop the compacts through the cooperative agreement is a collaboration between the federal government, state governments, and non-governmental organizations representing professional associations, unions, state licensing boards, so that all practitioners of the occupation have greater mobility while sustaining that focus on assuring uh, public safety through licensure. So the Secretary of Defense has three priorities, uh, and one of them is succeeding through teamwork, and the federal government looks forward to continued uh, collaboration with the General Assembly to do just that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Mara. And Mr. Arnold, I you may have seen me in the Zoom taking a picture of this wonderful new sticker that we just have. I'm sure you can see it. For those who can't, it's a picture of a submarine. It says, run silent, run deep, submariner saying. So I just had to share that with you, Mr. Arnold. I thought you'd appreciate it. <laughs> Roger that, ma'am. And my regards to uh, Senator Marks representing the sub-base on the committee. Uh, I no longer cover the New England states. My new region is uh, New York on down to Virginia. But as a combat veteran of a uh, Connecticut uh, Army unit, go Army, uh, I, I do love the patch, and uh, I will I will have to pick one up the next time I'm in uh, in Hartford covering for my colleagues. So thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. One other question for you. I like how you got that "Go Army" in there. I'll just say "Go Navy." Um, so the you one thing that you mentioned was that the compact was part of the base scoring process. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit so that we can be really clear about what you mean when you say that? <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I'll endeavor not to belabor much of what I submitted in my written testimony, where I sort of um, expound upon that um, at length. But uh, the best evidence that we have about the quality benefits of licensure relate to occupations which tend to have more harmonized standards across states, uh, where we do not have any strong evidence is to suggest that the type of uh, licensure such as multi-states uh, before you today are associated with uh, worse quality or worse care outcomes. It's a type of well-designed licensure regime that enhances public safety while expanding healthcare access uh, in historically underserved communities. So in 2018, the secretaries of the military departments through the National Governors Association sent a letter to the states saying that they were going to consider certain factors uh, whenever they're making a basing, stationing, or home porting decision and that uh, is basically Pentagon speak for either assigning personnel and equipment to a location or removing personnel uh, or equipment from a location. And in the fiscal year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, Congress codified that consideration. And whenever there's uh, a basing action, uh, the secretary's concerns shall consider the availability of license reciprocity, uh, housing, health care, and then other factors which the secretary shall designate, which as of this time, includes um, education. So Connecticut's Office of uh, Military Affairs is um, charged with making sure that the state um, scores well uh, on that scorecard. And um, the Office of the Secretary of Defense does a qualitative evaluation where we're looking at uh, you know, whether the state has or has not um, enacted a policy. And then the military departments each have their own quantitative evaluation where they turn that um, into a score. So, for example, the Air Force looks at um, 36 occupations, uh, one of which is nursing. And as I said, uh, you still need a good state-specific law for folks that don't want to avail themselves um, of the, the multi-state license or the compact privilege, which uh, fortunately uh, Connecticut has and was passed in 2022. Uh, but then we also um, look at the compact as our optimum end state for license reciprocity insofar as our bottom line effort is getting that license out the door within 30 days, right? So we know we're gonna be uh, uh, changing station to uh, the sub base in the fall, in October. I got six months to start looking for a job. Uh, I can get to Connecticut in one October, get my license by November 1st, and, and then start applying for work. Whereas if I'm transitioning uh, from a compact state to a compact state, <clears throat> and Connecticut is a member of the compact, there's nothing I need to do. I can begin working immediately because I know my multi-state license uh, is going to work there. So uh, that is why it is um, such an important factor. I think probably 50% uh, 
uh, of the licensing scorecard, and that's articulated um, in in Title Ten uh, as well. I can send you that section of the law if you'd like. No, I thank you very much for that answer and for your testimony here today. Uh, and again, for all the work that you do. Next on our list, hold on one second, is Marcus Palumbo. Is Mr. Palumbo here with us? Constant Segovia? Constanza, excuse me. Okay, I think we're going on to Nicole Levanos. Nicole, welcome. Please proceed. Thank you so much. Co-chairs Anwar and McCarthy Vahey, vice chairs and members of the Joint Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5058, the Nurse Licensure Compact, or NLC. My name is Nicole Levanos. I'm the Director of State Affairs for the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. NCSBN's members are nursing regulatory bodies across the country, and the NLC is an initiative drafted by boards of nursing whose mandate is to protect the public. That's why we know that if House Bill 5058 is enacted, Connecticut would be joining a safe and tested compact that has been operational for almost 25 years. Under the compact, a nurse who elects to obtain a multi-state license would first have to meet their home state requirements and then meet 11 uniform licensure requirements outlined in the compact. With that one license, the nurse can practice in all 41 compact states, both in person and electronically, while the functions of licensing, regulation, and enforcement of the practice laws in Connecticut remain with Connecticut. The NLC is part of the conversation as states continue to look for short and long-term solutions for the nursing shortage, and data should guide decision-making. NCSBN conducts a national nursing workforce study, and the 2022 survey found that over 100,000 RNs left the workforce between 2020 and 2022, and 800,000 RNs have indicated an intent to leave the workforce by 2027. The NLC is a nurse-supported solution for the crisis, and in their 2023 Nurse Staffing Task Force Imperatives, Recommendations, and Actions, the American Nurses Association recommended exploring the NLC in its expansion. And during COVID, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Vermont joined the NLC, recognizing the need for a permanent solution for licensure mobility and aiding disaster response. And in 2023, neighboring Rhode Island became the NLC's 41st member following a commission report that found the compact would broaden Rhode Island's available nursing workforce in a more timely and accessible manner. The commission, inclusive of union voices and the Rhode Island Nurses Association, recommended the legislature consider enactment. And the support from nursing makes sense. For nurses who hold multiple licenses, there's an immediate cost and time savings to not have to obtain and maintain multiple licenses. And for employers who recruit a nurse, that nurse can get to work immediately, alleviating pressures on existing staff and increasing access to care for patients. And for nursing education, the NLC facilitates the hiring of faculty, decreases barriers for distance education, and increases access to clinical sites. The NLC has strong and diverse support across the country from nurses to military families, patients and providers, and the diversity is a testament to the impact the NLC has. Thank you for your time and for exploring this evidence-based and nurse-supported solution. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing your perspective here today. We appreciate your time and your advocacy. Seeing no questions, we are actually going to go back to Constanza Segovia, who I believe has stepped back in the room. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Constanza Segovia. I, I live in Hartford and I'm the organizing director and co-founder of Hartford Deportation Defense, an organization represented, representing 300 immigrant families in the greater Hartford area, and we are part of the Connecticut for All Coalition. I am here to support, um, express my strong support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. So our work in the Husky for Immigrants Coalition, we have now spent three years hearing our members' stories of lack of access to healthcare, 
listening, we have learned that it's not only the lack of insurance that becomes a barrier. Even when we know funds are available for people to get financial support to pay their med medical bills, the barriers to that support are many and often don't make any sense. For example, sometimes people do have insurance but have a high deductible and they are not offered the funds that are actually available to them. This leads to Connecticut residents drowning in avoidable medical debt. Importantly, knowledge of financial assistance also increases healthcare utilization. Regardless of these facts, nonprofit hospitals continue to bill patients who are eligible for assistance. We urgently need oversight of this process. Another barrier for our members is getting access to financial assistance to um, in getting access to financial assistance is the fact that many speak English as a second language. This makes the convoluted application process harder to navigate, especially as you have to figure out each time you go to a different healthcare facility. There is no good reason for these processes to not be standardized. For our immigrant members, it would be helpful for folks to be able to provide alternative documents to prove their income other than just a pay stub and that should be across the board. As an advocate for equitable access to healthcare, I firmly believe that this bill is a necessary and just measure that will positively impact countless of lives in our community. I urge the committee to pass it and stand with us in the fight against medical debt and healthcare inequities. Thank you. Thank you so much for your advocacy work on this issue and on so many others impacting so many vulnerable members of our community. We're grateful. Seeing no questions uh, before us, we are going to go to, I believe, Dr. Linda Naimoli. Yes. I, I may, uh, hold on one second, if you would. I just want to hear Dr. Naimoli, go I ahead. Noticed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. Good afternoon, co-chairs McCarthy, Fahey, and Anwar. Ranking members Clarides Virtria and Summers, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Dr. Linda Nemoli, a resident of Stratford, Connecticut. I've raised my children here. This is our home. Um, I had to study outside the state and also practice my field outside the state. I am a board certified dance movement therapist with a master's in science in dance movement therapy and a PhD in expressive therapies. I am here today in strong support of HP 5323 and the licensing of clinical dance movement therapists. Dance movement therapy is an embodied practice through a therapeutic lens to connect with individuals that supports a path of healing, cognitively, emotionally, socially, and physically. It's especially complementary to traditional therapies and to other creative arts therapies like art therapy and music therapy, both of which have been licensed for practice in Connecticut by this committee. DMTs are not currently able to practice or earn a living in our home state without a license, instead having to commute to neighboring states, and in my case, I travel daily to Brooklyn, New York. University master's curriculums in Connecticut for art and music therapy fall under the LPC curriculum with an emphasis in their modality. There is not a DMT master's level program in Connecticut, and so we study in other states. DMT study a full master's level program as rigorous as an LPC program, plus a rigorous dance movement psychotherapy curriculum. In my case, I furthered my education in this field with a PhD in another state. I am making a statement supporting a clinical DMT license so that we do not have to apply for licensure outside our state and practice outside our state. Title and consumer prote protection is needed for those of us who want to come home and work home. I focus on an individual's movement through a, through a therapeutic lens. I begin to understand their experiences through an embodied and aesthetic response which gives me an opportunity to embody the overarching themes and patterns that um, emerge, furthering an understanding of someone's experience. Expressive, communicative, and adaptive behaviors are all considered and addressed throughout the process. Verbal and nonverbal interactions simultaneously provides the means of assessment and the mode of intervention. 
I would like to share a quick story of a father whose 13 year old son is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, physically stiff and rigid, including facial muscles, and did not make eye contact. The nonverbal young boy gestured for the large stretchy band which I used, which we both stepped into and placed around our waist. And we began to move, swaying and turning, using the band to guide us as if swing dancing. The boy was not as stiff, he was not as rigid. His body was somewhat relaxed and flexible while stretching band out from one end to the other. The boy lifted his arms up and made a verbal sound as he continued to sway and turn. The boy made eye contact with me and he continued to dance until we both had to catch our breath. And then we kept no, dancing. Naomi, excuse me, but your time is up. Thank you. You could just summarize that last thought. That would be great, briefly. I had, excuse me? If you want to just summarize that last thought and finish your Yes, story. out of the corner of my eye, I saw the father weeping, who had been peering through the window of the studio. He had witnessed his son move a completely different way. And after the session, the father said to me, it was as if his son morphed into a butterfly flying in the air. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the work that you do to help people to be able to heal. We appreciate that. And thank you for coming to testify before us today. Thank you for having me. We're going back to Marcus Palumbo, who has stepped back into the room. And then I did miss Isaac Tate. If Mr. Tate is here with us, then he'll be next. Welcome. Everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Um, good afternoon, honorable members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Marcus Palumbo, and I'm here testifying in support of HB 5200, an act concerning healthcare accessibility for persons with disabilities. And I want to start by doing something that I don't normally do or don't do that often, which is actually to quote from the founding documents, uh, in particular, the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, those are the opening lines in the declaration, the self-evident rights. But I want to point out here that there is something that is a prerequisite for all of those. In order to have, to be able to have, pursue life, liberty, and happiness, you have to have your health first. That is the most important thing. And in order to, so in order to do those things, you have to have access to healthcare that is able to provide you with health. And that is crucial to meet a basic standard of living. And yet, currently, we don't ensure as a as a matter of law that healthcare is accessible to the disabled folks who live in Connecticut. And so this bill takes an important step in rectifying that. And it does this in a few ways. Firstly, by requiring medical equipment uh, that to be purchased to meet accessibility standards. This just is across the board going to ensure that there is more distribution and uh, incentive to for demand for equipment that meets standards of accessibility for all rooms, for all rooms in a hospital. But then secondly, and very crucially, also would require that healthcare facilities have at least one exam room that is fully compliant and accessible uh, for folks with an assistive device, such as a wheelchair. And that means having enough space and having access to a lift, which as we've heard from people today is crucial and very important uh, and uh, for meeting those care needs. Now, briefly, I also want to touch on something that some you know, criticism that people may level at the bill um, and say, the, people may criticize it and say, oh, how are hospitals going to pay for this? They're going to say it's an unfunded mandate. You know, how, how do we, how can we regulate this uh, to be a thing without uh, providing help? And I'm not saying we shouldn't provide help, but I want to just clarify for people here I think this is, we have to apply the same standard that we do to this, that we do for the, all the other requirements that we ask of hospitals, right? You know, sure, it's more expensive to require hospitals to buy actual defibrillators instead of just using like a car battery with spoons, but we require them to do that because it's in the interest of the people receiving care and it's crucial to have that standard of care. And it's the same thing here. All we are saying is that we need to mandate this standard of care and accessibility for all of our people in Connecticut to have access to, um, because ultimately that's the kind of state we want to live in is one where those 
options for health are accessible to everyone. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and for lending your voice to this very important conversation. Thank Senator you. Amor. Thank you. I love this car battery with spoons uh, idea. Did you come up with it yourself? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Love it. <laughs> love it. Great, great testimony. Thank you. Appreciate thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Isaac Tate. Uh, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Isaac Tate, and I live in Oakdale. I'm a volunteer with the Connecticut chapter of Moms Demand Action. I am a United States Marine who has been deployed to combat several times. I am also a gun violence survivor. From firearm, su firearm suicides to violence in my community, I have seen too much. My home here in Connecticut has even been struck by gunfire. It is because of my experiences with guns and the violence they wreak on our communities that I am testifying to voice my support of the Sustainable Funding Initiative in HB 5317. It is imperative that the life-saving work of community violence intervention programs be continued and sustained. The problem of gun violence in our communities and countries is solvable, and one of the solutions is community violence prevention. If I did not believe this, I would not be volunteering my time to address the epidemic of violence gripping our country. Ensuring the public health and safety of our communities is and always should be one of the primary functions of the state government. My heart breaks for those of our neighbors living in chronically underserved communities that are disproportionately impacted by gun violence each and every day because I know what they are suffering and furthermore, I know that their voices have been marginalized and silenced. I am speaking for everyone who has to live with gun violence every day. The uncertainty, the fear, the anger that not enough is being done, and the hopelessness that those who can act often don't seem to care enough to do so. Please show that you care by sustaining funding for community violence in intervention so that community violence intervention programs, which are working directly within the communities most impacted by gun violence, receive the resources they need to continue. Thank you, members of the Public Health Committee, for the opportunity to share with you why I am in full support of the Sustainable Funding Initiative brought forth in HB 5317. Mr. Tate, thank you so much. And I recognize that Marine cap uh, right away. And so thank you for serving our country in that way and serving in this way by being an advocate and lending your voice to this important conversation. We appreciate you being here and thank you. And you have a comment or a question, Representative Wielander. Probably more of a thank comment you. at this point. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for being here. Um, as the older sister of a Marine, I wanted just to say thank you. I'm not gonna try to do the, the call because that would look silly on my part. But um, I just also wanted to thank you for taking the time to use your experience um, which is a very unique experience. My brothers are, I have three younger brothers, all are combat veterans, um, and they have a very different approach to um, firearms and gun violence than I do personally. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to be here and using your voice in that way. Um, and also um, was wondering if, if there was anything that you thought we could do better on this end from your, expect, your experience and perspective. Um, I am, I've just stepped into this volunteer role in the last, um, few months, um, due to what's going on in my community. Um, it's a rural community, but it's, um, disturbing and, um, I'm just getting my feet on the ground and figuring out what's going on. Um, I really appreciate the question, um, and you taking the time to listen to my testimony. Um, I think that that is really important to, understand what is going on in our communities um, as a way to move forward and to address this problem. Um. Thank you. I appreciate that response. And um, I think I agree that the bottom up type of response from within the community is often more um, effective than a top down um, dictation. So, all right. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Wielander. Thank you, Mr. Tate.
Next, we will hear from Melissa Kane, who's with us online. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, Senator Summers, Representative Claritas Ditria, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Melissa Kane. I live in Westport, and I am the board chair and interim executive director of Connecticut Against Gun Violence. I am testifying today regarding HB 5317, which Isaac referred to, an act requiring a study concerning the funding for and effectiveness of the community gun violence intervention and prevention programs. In my role with CAGV, I am a new member of the Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention, which was established in 2022 by the Connecticut General Assembly to guide the Department of Public Health Office of Injury Prevention on awarding grants to community-based anti-violence programs and to work to identify resources to stem the flow of community gun violence. Last week, I testified at the Appropriations Subcommittee on Health in support of protecting the combined $3.9 million included in the governor's budget for DPH for fiscal year 2025 for uh, gun violence prevention grants and personnel. It is essential that this funding remain intact. We are grateful to the governor and the CGA for the much needed funding that has been appropriated and that has already been put to work to fund evidence-based violence prevention and intervention programs within the hardest hit communities across the state. Next session, we look forward to being able to share the successes of the second round of grants currently being sought. In 2021, the CGA passed SB1 with the, uh, with the support of many of you here, which declared racism a public health crisis and established this commission within the Department of Public Health because the structural racism that drives health disparities is also a root cause of community gun violence. As such, it is clear that the existing commission is the appropriate body to oversee any study on possible future funding sources for community gun violence, as well as provide recommendations on the long-term sustainability of the grant program. My understanding is that the sustainability subcommittee of the commission is well positioned to do so. And while reviewing outcomes of grants is and should continue to be part of the DPH grant administration process, it's truly unnecessary to conduct a general study of the efficacy of community violence intervention programs. They've already been proven through years of copious research to be effective. CAGV supports exploring all avenues to raise revenue and find additional consistent funding for community-based programs to reduce gun violence, particularly ones that have been shown to be effective in other states. However, we urge that the exploration not jeopardize current appropriating, appropriated funding. At current funding levels, we're just beginning to meet the very great need that exists. It's essential to maintain the continuity of care that these programs and communities need to be successful. I urge you to recommend that the Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention oversee any study to evaluate potential funding sources to increase funding for the reduction of community gun violence. Thank you so much for listening to my testimony. Thank you very much, Melissa, for your ongoing work with CAGV and advocating uh, for gun violence prevention and for your work on the commission and specifically the focus with the public health lens. And I appreciate your comment to ask that that group really direct any conversation related uh, to what we're trying to do with, with the bill. Are there questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you so much. And we'll go on to Ellen Andrews, who's also joining us online. Ms. Andrews, welcome. Hi, thank you for, um, uh, for having me. I'm Ellen Andrews. I'm executive director of the Connecticut Health Policy Project. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to express the support of the Connecticut Health Policy Project for SB9 and the governor's plans to st stabilize Connecticut's hospital finances. There are growing concerns you've heard about today um, about the spread of private equity, ownership of hospitals and other healthcare entities across the nation. Uh, one recent study found that when private equity funds purchase hospitals, the quality of care suffers. suffers. Another found that cost to patients and payers increase. Um, we're not immune from this in Connecticut. You've heard about Prospect Medical Holdings when they acquired three Connecticut hospitals in our state. Vendors, providers, and municipal taxes um, have not been paid. 
Cutbacks led to a serious cyber attack that jeopardized patient care um, and fund owners borrowed over a billion dollars against the hospital's assets to pay investors and executives hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, state taxpayers have been asked to fix this mess. Um, unfortunately, this mess is not unique to Connecticut, nor was it unexpected. Um, in September 2021, little, um, little under two years ago, the Insurance Committee held a forum outlining this problem and highlighting promising protections. Um, a uh, assistant attorney general from Rhode Island was there and was able to um, describe the um, uh, protections that they've passed to preserve their hospital's assets from prospect medical holdings, ownership, and protected patients' access to vital care. I'm happy to share the link. It's on CTN or the slides with anyone who's interested. Um, the governor's current proposals in SB9 are an important start to strengthening the state's CON process to protect Connecticut residents from pri private equity harms. Um, I go through that in my testimony, my written testimony. I will um, only uh, talk about one small change that could further improve it. The proposal to trigger a CON requirement if issuing dividends of 20% of the hospital's net worth over three years is entirely too high. 19%, uh, taking 19% of the assets out of a hospital um, it, within three years is reckless. Most hospitals are looking at private equity when they're fragile and in trouble and there should be investments. Um, it, taking out 20% is just unreasonable. Um, I was listening to the hospital's um, concerns about transparency and reporting. And I don't disagree that there are reports there that maybe you know, aren't, aren't necessary anymore. And then, um, but I've spent a lot of time in those hospital reports and there are, there are just a lot of things that are not clear and not um, understood. I don't understand why adding um, liabilities and unpaid bills and um, profit margins um, is a huge burden on them. I would hope that they offer those, uh, that they provide that to their board members at every board meeting. These should be reports that they're providing all the time. So I, I just don't see, I guess, the burden of those particular reports. And I think we should be looking at even more granular. If we'd known how much um, that cybersecurity, for instance, investments had been um, going down at Prospect, we might have been able to uh, prevent that cyber attack that was very devastating to care. Thank um, you, Andrews, but your time is up. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm thank you for your time and your commitment to Connecticut's health and hospitals, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, for your work, your advocacy, and as we, as you heard earlier in the discussion, the issue of private equity investments uh, in healthcare is going to be an ongoing conversation, not just here in Connecticut. Nationally, I think there was a Wall Street Journal article just this morning about some of the work that's being done on the federal level. And we will continue these conversations here in Connecticut. Thank you for being with us today. Next, I believe we have Don Holcomb. Don, welcome. You can unmute yourself. Okay, how am I now? You're great, we can hear okay, you. Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Dear, uh, I appreciate the time from the honorable members of the Public Health Committee. My name is John Holcomb. I'm writing as the executive director of the Connecticut Oncology Association. We support the Connecticut physicians and the cancer centers who treat patients who have cancer all through the state. We have, or I'm expressing, um, strong concern and opposition to the bill that's as it is currently written uh, regarding a uh, raised bill 5319, uh, the act concerning private equity firms and healthcare facilities. I am a resident of South Windsor, Connecticut. I fully understand the concern that the governor and the members of the Connecticut General Assembly have about the impact of private equity firms. We have all read the news about the prospect medical holdings. I know the presentation of this bill is extremely well intended, but there are actual consequences of implementation as it is currently written that could well have the opposite effect for patients and for those who deliver care in the state of Connecticut. The definition of private equity firms is, is those that raise capital and, and 
look at the margins, sell companies for a profit, and the definition of healthcare facilities that include uh, over 16 different kinds of possible facilities going from hospitals to outpatient clinic. They are so broad and they catch in those broad statements um, situations that are, are so helpful and do not need the insertion of additional oversight control. This is my concern is that we're gonna miss an opportunity if we enact the bill as it is written to support and protect very critical alternative sites of cost-effective care. Cost of care for Connecticut residents is a huge driver. It's a big concern, but we also wanna support access to quality care. We have a number of very strong health systems in Connecticut, but we still also have a number of strong private practice providers. So I'm here talking about preserving community practice as a much needed balance for cost-effective quality healthcare. Larger systems have a huge role to play. They're very important. But if we lose our private community practices, then we will have forever lost an essential component of an affordable Connecticut healthcare environment. Private practices are critical for access to cost-effective care. In November 2018 publication from the, the Oncology Primary Journal, the American, uh, American Society of Clinical Oncology Journal of Oncology, looked at over 6,600 patients seen in either a community-based cancer clinic or a hospital-based cancer clinic. And the mean total per patient per month cost was significantly of 38% lower for a patient treated in the community-based setting than in the hospital setting. And the mean per patient per month cost was also significantly lower, 41% in the community setting. So both chemotherapy and overall treatment were significantly lower. And we're talking 12,500 12, versus 20,000. We're talking 4,900 versus 8,500. See, the lower cost is in the community practice is irrespective of the community uh, chemotherapy regimen of the type. We have seen a huge number of private practices in Connecticut absorbed by Connecticut hospital-based systems. Uh, there are a few that remain strong and they restrain, remain strong in part because they haven't aligned with predatory private equity firms, but they have aligned with almost, <laughs> okay, I'll go with <laughs> physician-based networks, medical networks. They're medically aligned partnerships of like-minded other private practices. That is a distinct difference. And so what I'm doing is I would respectfully request that this bill not be passed in any way as it is currently written, that we would consider the need to um, recognize those alignments as different from a private equity firm that is like a prospect medical that we do want to grandfather existing uh, alignments that have already happened. And if any study or panel that looks at private equity activities in the state should include representation by patients and the community providers so we don't lose them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I think you give voice to the some of the conundrum that is faced because the cost of healthcare is so significant and mm -hmm. uh, it, falls on patients, it falls on uh, us here in government. And uh, I think the market is uh, looking at different ways to address this. And so we will, as I have said many times today, be continuing this conversation and appreciate your perspective today. Thank you. No questions. Next is Aaron Barthel. Welcome. Dear chairs and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Erin Barthel, and I'm a resident of Avon, mother of three children, and a pediatric oncologist at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill Number 5317 on behalf of the Connecticut Chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and on behalf of all children in Connecticut. As a pediatric oncologist, I treat children with cancer and other serious blood diseases. Cancer is tied for the fourth leading cause of death among children and te teens ages one to 19 in the state of Connecticut. While 85% of children with cancer survive five years or more, there are still too many children dying from this disease. There is no one specific cure for cancer. Each pediatric cancer is treated with specific therapies that attack unique targets. Doctors and researchers continuously work to find new therapies before this disease takes another child's life. Unfortunately, outside the hospital, firearms are still killing our healthy children. In the United States, firearms are the leading cause of death among children and teens. In Connecticut, it's the second leading cause of death among children and teens. 
This is unacceptable. Children are dying a preventable death. Like cancer, there is no one cure for this problem. We must treat this problem with specific therapies from every angle. In 2022, the state passed an act addressing gun violence, which contained comprehensive laws to reduce the number of firearms reaching the hands of children and young adults in homes and on the streets. For years, community violence intervention programs have been doing both preventative work and dealing with the traumatic aftermath of gun violence. However, they cannot continue to do this without funding. The study proposed by 5317 ensures that there will be an answer to the question of how the state will provide sustainable funding. One solution is to tax the, tax the gun industry, which makes billions of dollars in profits each year while our state and communities pay the physical, economic, and emotional costs of this epidemic. California recently passed this legislation in 2023. The American Academy of Pediatrics supports a comprehensive approach to preventing gun violence and supports measures such as community violence intervention programs, a background check on every gun sale, increasing purchase age limits, purchase waiting periods, the list goes on and on. Connecticut is a national leader on gun safety laws. We need to continue to support our community leaders that know the problem, have created creative ideas to address the problem, and are fighting every day to ensure that gun violence does not take another child's life. For all our children in Connecticut, I urge you to pass 5317. You too can do something to decrease childhood deaths. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for that powerful testimony and for the work that you do at the hospital every day. And you raise very valid and very important points. We were talking earlier today about opioids and the epidemic that they are and how they are impacting the lives of our vulnerable children. And in this committee, we have not spoken quite as much since I've been here about gun violence. The work is often done in our Judiciary Committee, but I appreciate you and others who have been here today speaking to this issue and why this is a public health issue. So thank you so much. Seeing no questions, we will go on to Michael Laughlin who is with us online. Dr. Laughlin, welcome. Can you see me? Yes, we can, and we can hear you as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Laughlin. I'm a clinical radiologist, as well as the director of MRI and CT for Jefferson Radiology. Jefferson Radiology is based out of East Hartford, Connecticut. We employ over 400 staff members. Our radiologists are medical doctors with four and at least four years of uh, specialized training in the performance, supervision, and interpretation of imaging for medical diagnosis and treatment. This includes dedicated training for understanding the physics of x-rays and in particular CT scanners and ways to utilize these for the optimum safety and benefits of our patients. Our radiologists work in a variety of settings from hospital radiology departments to private practice outpatient offices in communities throughout the state. I would like to offer public comment on the SB number nine, uh, the raised, uh, which is the act uh, concerning certificate of need with special attention to the CON provisions for acquisition of advanced imaging equipment. I support the goal of a review of the existing CON process to identify areas of improvement in efficiency, effectiveness, and alignment with the state and federal healthcare reform efforts. At the same time, as a subspecialized physician in medical imaging, I strongly support maintaining the CON process for advanced imaging equipment acquisition, including specifically CT scanners. Um, this would continue the existing benefits of the CON process for all of our patients in Connecticut. The existing CON process for imaging ensures safeguards for quality and safety, controlling imaging costs, serving the public needs that would be maintained regardless of any modifications. The existing CON process assures quality and patient safety, and through years of work, the existing C01 process mandates patient protections that ensure medical personnel will be prepared in the event of medical emergency or adverse reaction during a scan and to ensure the safest use of radiation and radiation materials. The citizens in the state of Connecticut benefit from these requirements and deserve to see them continue. From a financial perspective, the existing C01 process serves to control overall health care costs in the state, eliminating uh, elimination of the C01 requirements will lead to increasing costs. One of the most specific ways so if the existing CON process limits healthcare costs from advanced imaging is by limiting self-referral. And this is the practice of healthcare providers referring patients to imaging facilities in which they have an ownership interest. In 2012, the United States uh, General Accounting Office released a uh, mandated report showing that self-referral of advanced imaging results in markedly increased volumes of scans and the cost to Medicare and Medicaid programs for billions of dollars. 
Even when seemingly unintentional, the self-referral incentives for healthcare providers to expand services exist regardless of the demand. The existing CON process limits um, uh, this for increasing the healthcare costs. For these reasons, as a radiologist, I strongly oppose elimination of the CON process for CT scanners and strongly advocate that any change to the CON process for advanced imaging equipment strengthen protection against self-referral and maintain existing guarantees for quality and safety for our patients in Connecticut. And that's it. Thank you, Dr. O'Loughlin, and I am sorry we missed your O earlier. That's okay. But thank you for being here today, spending time, and for your advocacy. Seeing no questions, we are going to go back to the folks I had missed. Um, Madvi Raigu is here, and then we'll be followed by Norma martinez Hosang. And please correct me if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> Hi, uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, well, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Madhuri Ragu. I am a physician and a radiologist practicing in Western Connecticut at Danbury Radiology Associates. My specialty is breast imaging, where I direct our facilities program in that area. Previously, I was the Fellowship Director of Breast Imaging at Yale. I am offering brief comments to you today on Senate Bill 9, an act promoting hospital financial stability. I would like to confine my comments to line 175 in section four. What this does is exempt any computed axial tomography scanner known as CT scan from the certificate of need process. In my experience, I believe this would be a mistake. Right now, receipt of a CON for this type of equipment requires the applicant to show that they will have a commitment to serving low-income, underserved communities. We do that as a matter of practice in our office. That requirement is critical if we are to solve what we all know is a significant inequity in the delivery of healthcare processes services in this state. Yet, untethering CT scanners from CON will mean that the new owner now has absolutely no obligation to serve patients in distressed areas. You will see an avalanche of CT scanners flood the market, but they will be sited in wealthier areas that cater to self-pay and well-insured. Unfortunately, another reality is the increasing number of private equity companies entering Connecticut. They will all want a CT scanner to add revenue for their investors and, and at what cost to the patients or our healthcare system. The inequity will worsen and distressed areas will be left out in the cold. I fear that women in low income areas will find it much more difficult to get their breast cancer screenings. The proposed exemption will take a well-regulated market for CT scanners and turn it into the wild west Anything goes, you'll see offices cropping up offering cheap breast cancer screenings, but the patient won't know what the machine that the machines are old and lack today's technology, which are much better in detecting the presence of cancer, or even if the images are read by qualified um, or subspecialized radiologists. As a radiologist, I do not order a, breast, a patient's breast imaging study. That is done by the patient's primary care doctor. We perform the exam, I read it, and then summarize the results in a written report. That boundary will be lost if section four becomes law. Also, offices will be free to order an imaging exam with no guarantee that the interpreting radiologist is qualified to read the study. This is self-referral, which results in unnecessary additional testing, increasing healthcare laws, costs. That is not the kind of care I want for my patients. For the reasons I outlined in my testimony, Please retain the CON requirement for the acquisition of CT scanners. Please strike section four from the bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Agu, for your testimony today and uh, for your work every day, caring for patients. Uh, very much appreciated. Seeing no questions. Oh, there, oh my goodness, yes, I forgot. Representative Clara Destitria, who had told me before that she had a question for you. No so problem. Representative Clara Destitria. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today and providing testimony. I read through your testimony, I just have a couple questions. So with regards to the breast cancer screenings, can you just elaborate a little on why this proposal 
um, can cause delays or harsh hardships for women? So, you know, at present right now, we know that women are under screened um, for breast cancer screening, for breast cancer in general. And that this, this can be attributed to numerous um, uh, reasons, and this includes insurance, it includes access, but also, um, you know, patients have to take time and they have to look for quality places to actually get quality care. So even though access may be limited for some of these patients, we want them to go to offices where they're going to be provided high level, superb care. And when we start um, op opening offices where, you know, just the imaging is sort of free for all, it's it's going to diminish um, uh, the quality of care and it may have adverse outcomes for patients in general. Thank you for that explanation. And then also in your testimony, you mentioned, um, quote, wild, wild west. So if Connecticut scanners are deregulated, what's going to be the outcome? Can you elaborate on that? You know, I'm going to tell you everything for me is about quality, 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 quality. Um, we want to make sure that every patient that enters an office is entering an office that is highly, that is, that is well regulated with great protocols. I mean, for something like a CT scan, for example, um, you know, these are studies that are fairly complicated and involve multiple sequences, and they should be crafted very carefully and protocoled ap appropriately so that additional imaging, you know, additional radiation is not um, is be not being performed in the patient. It has a correct study for the correct amount of time that they're actually there. And this um, also extends to breast imaging because, you know, People think breast imaging is just, just a screening mammogram, but really, you know, it's not just the screening, it's a screening, it's a diagnosis, it's a treatment. We wanna make sure that we're providing quality level care for every aspect of, of breast health. Thank you for that. And, and Madam Chair, just one final question. We've heard a lot about the process of CON, of certificate of need. Have What has been your experience with this? And it has it, is the issue that most people say that it, the process takes too long? Dr. Ragu, you may have frozen. Oh, are you there? Were you able to hear the representative's question? Oh, so sorry, I didn't realize that was <laughs> for me. Um, yes, I, I mean, were you asking me if the, the process was taking too long that it was directed at somebody else? It was It was directed at you. Oh, so I, my apologies. Um, yes, I know that it does take a long time. Um, but again, you know, I think that we really have to be very mindful and thoughtful about the quality of care that we deliver to these patients. I mean, you know, the worst thing that can happen is an inadequate study, a poorly performed study that essentially may, misses a critical finding um, that may have a detrimental effect on a patient's health. And, and you know, breast cancer is, whether it's a delayed diagnosis or a missed diagnosis, is, is a perfect example of that. I mean, the doubling time for most breast cancers is about two years, but we know that we're seeing younger and younger patients with um, with cancers and sometimes with, with fairly locally advanced cancers. And so if some of these patients go in for imaging studies where, where it was not appropriately um, uh, done, then I think that the, the, there's, there is a risk that they may um, attain poor care and therefore poor outcomes in the long run. Hey, thank you for answering my questions. And just a simple yes or no on this last one. So you want to see Section 4 stricken from this um, legislation. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Representative Clara Distitria. And thank you also, uh, Dr. Ragu. Next up, we have... Norma Martinez Hosang, who is with us online to be followed by, give me one, Cindy Miller. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Norma Martinez Hosang, and I live in Hamden, and I'm the director of um, Connecticut for All. We're a coalition of about 60 labor, community, and faith organizations fighting to end extreme inequalities in our state. Um, one of our primary goals of our coalition is to win real equity for all residents in Connecticut, um, and that spans from 
um, strong public um, K through 12, um, public higher education, and of course, healthcare. Um, all these um, are essential um, services um, for our communities to live a full life with dignity. So I'm here today to express my um, strong support for HB 5320 an act concerning hospital financial assistance. A nationally medical, medical debt is one of the reasons um, families declare bankruptcy here in Connecticut. <clears throat> um, roughly 280,000 people have medical debt. Financial assistance policies, also known as charity care, can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> can help um, reduce how often patients incur medical debt and ensure that people eligible for assistance do not end up in collections. Um, this bill will help communities who need who need it the most um, access in, in charity care by um, one, creating a common application for financial assistance that all Connecticut hospitals would um, access and therefore making it easier for patients to navigate the application process. It would also, um, this bill would also automatically qualify some patients who are enrolled in SNAP and WIC um, with household income at or below 250% of the federal poverty level. And lastly, I want to just highlight that it would also make sure that people know about the financial assistance options since they often, um, people who otherwise qualify don't um, often, often know their, their, um, the, um, that this is available. Um, this bill would cost little or nothing to implement, but it would make a big difference for some of the families between um, like going into debt, um, or getting life-saving health care services. The people who would qualify for charity care are part of families that already are living paycheck to paycheck and struggling to make ends meet um, day to day, um, day to day. Organizations in our coalition focus on different issues um, and fight um, and um, focus on different issues. But one of the things that we all really care about is health care um, and, and good health um, system for all of the people in, in Connecticut. Um, we believe in equitable access to healthcare, and therefore, um, we're firmly um, supporting um, HB five three two zero as it's an, as a necessary measure um, that will positively impact countless of lives in our committee in our community. I urge you um, all to consider um, this bill and stand with us in the fight against medical debt and healthcare inequalities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this. Um, and excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy here today on this and on so many other issues uh, that, again, are facing some of our most vulnerable community members. We appreciate you being here with us today. Seeing no questions, we will go next to Cindy Miller. Good afternoon, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and members of the Public Health Committee. I'm really pleased to have been given the chance to testify along with other members of the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. Um, we are very, uh, want very badly that there be passage of HB 5200 with amendments as has been described earlier today in some detail by the secretary of CC equals A, Ruth Groby. I will not be focusing on the specifics of our proposed modifications of HB 5200, but will instead describe a little about myself and hope and how that has informed my participation in these efforts. Since birth, it was known that I had moderate bilaterally symmetric muscle weakness for which an all encompassing diagnosis was not rendered until further investigation was prompted following the development of seizures when I was 27 years old. It wasn't until I was 39 that a final diagnosis of congenital muscular dystrophy with myrosin deficiency was confirmed. I had been encouraged by my family and by my mentors to pursue my dreams. And so despite increasing weakness, I became a physician. I chose to train as a diagnostic radiologist in order that my physical limitations would not hinder my ability to perform a complete medical examination of any patient. During my years as an attending physician at Yale New Haven Hospital, my own internist asked if I'd be interested in participating in a class for second year medical students 
on the concept of disability. I have done this for at least 10 years now and have noted each time that the class has served as an introduction to disability to students who have already been in school for a year and a half. But along with the increased awareness of the types of disabilities they might encounter in their future practices, there are numerous students who begin to think about ways in which they could fashion their own practices to accommodate patients with all types of disabilities. The reality is that at the present time, I have not had a complete physical examination for at least 20 years due to my inability to move independently from my wheelchair to an examination table. As it is difficult, read next to impossible, for me to describe, for me to disrobe independently, no physician has put his or her eyes on my skin surface, surface in its entirety. I know that I have a pressure ulcer because I felt discomfort related to it, but apart from a cursory inspection of it, no attempt has ever been made to inspect the rest of my skin surface. I have a progressive muscle disorder, but I cannot remember the last time my muscles were palpated, nor my feet examined, so as to reveal the discoloration that accompanies the dependent edema that I have. When my internist reported to me that no physician was allowed to lift a patient, he had his assistant utilize a lift, and that went relatively smoothly. At this past year's appointment, when I demonstrated the capability of my wheelchair to enable me to lie in a supine position, he was satisfied to just examine the front of my lungs through a twin sweater set through which it would be nearly impossible to discern an abnormality if one were present. Before I finish my remarks, I must include a description of the process of my being weighed. It used to be that I would arrive in clinic and would be asked by a nurse's assistant as I rode in in my motorized scooter if I were able to stand up on the scale. As I shook my head in disbelief, we arrived at the realization that I would need to know the weight of my scooter or my chair in order that I could be weighed in it, and then the weight of the chair would be subtracted to derive my own weight. This works if I know precisely the weight of the chair and if the entire chair is actually on the scale. Otherwise, my weight would be underestimated. I am just one individual, but I'm one who based on her medical education is able to state unequivocally that everyone is entitled to a complete physical exam. In order for that to happen, there needs to be at the minimum an accessible weight scale, an accessible examining table, and appropriate lifts to be utilized to assist in moving disabled patients with dignity and staff trained to do so. HB 5200 with the modifications proposed in other testimony will be instrumental in achieving that desired result. Thank you. Dr. Miller, thank you so much for your testimony. What occurred to me as you were talking is that it's just the opposite of how it should be, that folks who need more monitoring or more support aren't getting even the basics of what you need. So I thank you for taking the time to testify before us today and to be an advocate and care for others. I see that Rep. D'Amico would like to speak. Representative D'Amico. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I will be brief. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller, for coming to testify. Uh, unfortunately, your testimony is not all so all that different from several of the testimonies that we heard earlier uh, today, earlier this afternoon. Um, did I hear you say that you have not had a complete physical examination in 20 years? Did I catch that correctly? That's correct. That is absolutely correct. Because part of the time people, I think, are sort of dancing around, how are we going to ask her to do these things? But the reality is my own physician, whom I've seen for this whole period of time, still doesn't recognize the fact 
that I cannot lift my arms above my head in order to take off a top that I'm wearing, nor can I disrobe from the the bottom half of my body. So it's important that physicians recognize the limitations of their patients and do what they can do around those limitations in order that they receive complete care. If I may, Madam Chair. So, so Dr. Miller, thank you. That's a good segue into my final question, which, which has to do with what you referenced earlier in your testimony about, um, about medical students uh, and, and their training and their uh, understanding of the needs of people with disabilities. C could you just expand on that a little bit? I'd be happy to. I mentioned that the talk that I give or I'm part of during the middle half of their second year of school is their first true exposure to the concept of disability. So when I became involved with Citizens Coalition um, for Equal Access, and I became aware of the disability interest group at UConn, oh, I was God. quite thrilled to recognize that such a, a group exists. And I think if medical education should include similar groups at every medical school. Maybe that'll be next year's bill, but thank you, um, uh, Dr. Miller. Something for us to think about. Thank you, Dr. Miller, and thank you for your work with the Citizens Coalition for Equal Access. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. I love how you're thinking ahead. That's wonderful. Seeing no other, oh, Senator Amor, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. This was, um, we've had multiple conversations. We appreciate your advocacy and, and, and the amazing work that you've been doing um, on behalf of uh, all the people who would need some help. So, and then your points are well taken. I, and we're just having the conversation that empathy is something that uh, it should be part of all healthcare workers, education and, and training. So um, Clearly, the medical schools can do far better. And then also, we're talking about in this bill or the proposed language to have effort on education as well. So we're going to start this process should this bill pass and then move forward. Thank you. We're the committee with the squeaky mic. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And next, we will hear from Dr. Weigert. Um, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, I, I, I just, I know I'm speaking to another topic, but I just want to comment to Dr. Miller um, that I so heartily feel for what you've been going through. And um, I, I do hope there are facilities that are available for you to get, um, as a breast imager that I am, your mammograms. And if not, that we could perhaps help that happen anyway. I'm going to move on to my topic now. Um, I am uh, dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, Senator Summer, Representative Claritas Dietria, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Jean Weigert. I am a clinical radiologist with a specialty training in women's imaging, in particular breast imaging. I am past president of the Radiological Society of Connecticut and a member of the executive board. I am past chair and still a member of the uh, Committee for the American College of Radiology Mammography Accreditation, which is an FDA uh, certification process. I'd like to offer public comment on SB9, Raised Act Concerning Certificates of Need, with specific attention to the CON provisions for acquisition of advanced medical imaging equipment, including CT scanners, um, which is involved with section four. As uh, several of my colleagues have already spoken today, I want to join them and underscore the importance of a review of the existing CON process to identify areas of improvement um, in efficiency, effectiveness, and alignment with state and federal health care reform efforts but I strongly support maintaining the CON process for advanced medical imaging equipment, including CT scanners, and continuing this process for all our patients 
in Connecticut. It ensures safeguards for quality and safety, controls imaging costs, and, and serving the public needs that should be maintained regarding any modifications. As an imager devoted to the care of women with gynecological malignancies, particularly breast cancer, I want to underscore the need for high quality imaging, which does include CT scanning in the evaluation and follow-up of treatment of these cancers. We use CT scanning as a way of finding metastatic disease, and then of course, following their treatment to see if it is remitting or um, increasing. Um, through my years involved in the ACR accreditation process, I understand the need for assessment of quality, both the technical aspect and in the physician interpretation of these important imaging studies. Yes, the process of um, acquiring a CON and applying for it can be difficult. There is lots to do, a lot of paperwork, but it is the same kind of process that we have for accreditation of all our modalities, whether it's mammography, down the line at the American College of Radiology. Um, it can be difficult, but it maintains superb uh, technological quality of both the scanning equipment and of the physicians who interpret that equipment. And this again, protects our patients um, and that it allows them to have high quality care. The other aspect of cost of obvi obviously, I'm sorry, is the fact that without a CON, we will be increasing costs to the state um, and increasing costs to our patients. Excuse me, Dr. Weinberg, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. A question from Senator Amor to be followed by Representative Cook. Uh, Dr. Weingart, thank you so much for your testimony. I wanted to clarify something. So if, if I heard you correctly, you're suggesting that a, a same CAT scan that your organization would have and somebody else got a same CAT scan um, for the imaging, the other company would have bad results or inaccurate results? Uh, can you clarify that? I think what I'm saying is that the fact that one must follow certain protocols, one must maintain um, certain uh, quality controls on a, on a routine basis. We know that we do that in our imaging centers um, and in hospitals that have CONs. What our concern is that these sites may not follow those specific criteria because they would not feel obliged to. So do you have evidence to that or, or it's just an assumption that uh, anybody else who's going to get some of these uh, imaging uh, modalities, they would not follow the protocols, even though they're required to? Well, they may not be required to if there's no um, specific formats for them to maintain. You know, these CONs require uh, a significant amount of effort. Um, and again, we don't know. We just don't know if they will do that. We also don't know if they will be maintaining a certification under the American College of Radiology accreditation for these uh, imaging um, modalities. Um, right now, uh, mammography is FDA mandated, but it is the purpose of our offices, the ones that uh, fulfill these criteria that we all do have these ACR certifications. It's just another aspect of the fact that what all of us who have testified today are saying is that we are underscoring the importance of quality, quality, and that we feel that if there are, that these other sites may not, I'm not saying that they won't, but they may not. So if, if we were to make policies about may not, then we will probably not be able to make too many policies. But I'm just going to um, uh, just share with you some of the other things that we have heard. We heard a number of individuals who have disabilities, and they are not getting access to many of the sites. And somebody actually even mentioned one of your sites to be able to get their care. And and let's say one of the other hospitals, the hospital CHA came and they said that it takes them a year to get a CAT scanner. 
So, and that's where the CON system is somewhat failing because we have a number of our citizens who cannot get the care that they need and they should get. And, and you're saying that keep the CON because they may not provide, even though they will be radiologists reading those same procedures, they would be following the, the machine will probably be from the same company. It's, it's, uh, it's tricky because the access is being impacted right now. And my fear is that if we continue to restrict access, the individuals who are hurting to get the care, they will not get the care. So that's just my perspective. Um, so I'm, I was not fully convinced from your argument yet. Um, I thought I'd just share that with you. Okay. <laughs> my apologies, Senator Amwar. I he I wanted you to know Dr. Senator Amor said thank you and I had turned off the microphone too quickly. Representative Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Doctor, are you still with us? I am. Okay, perfect. Um, so two questions. One, can you discuss briefly um what the safety impact would be by the by the provisions that you're testifying on? Well, um, I think that it is, that, that when we uh, go through the existing CON process, um, it mandates patient protections um, and uh, ensures that there are medical personnel that are trained appropriately on all levels uh, to take care of patients if there is a problem. Um, again, I am not saying that that might not happen if there if the CON if, if a site does not have a CON to have their operation. I just know from, ex from the experiences that I have had that there, that there's a lot of um, education mandated through our offices uh, because of maintaining these um, uh, protocols that we know we have to maintain. Um, I can't address whether or not sites that don't have a CON would not, of course, maintain safety protocols. Um, I would hope they do. But um, again, this is from my years of experience. So thank you. Thank you. And then my last part of that question would be section four, when we talk about the certificate of need, you would support the bill, but you would support it without section four, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Cook. And thank you, Doctor, for being here with us today and for the work that you do in the community as well. Next, we are going back to Kayla Holland, we missed, and she's here with us online. Ms. Holland, welcome. Hello, thank you. Good afternoon, Co-Chair McCarthy, Leahy and Anwar, Vice Chairs Parker, Kushner and Marks, Ranking Members Clarity, Dietria and Somers, and Distinguished Members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Kayla Holland, the Food and Nutrition Program Manager at the Center for Black Health and Equity. And the Center for Black Health and Equity is also referred to as the Center. It's a national nonprofit committed to addressing the social and economic injustices that have led to deep health disparities for marginalized communities. The center's mission is to facilitate programs and services to benefit communities and people of African descent by building community capacity, developing community infrastructure, and advocating for equity center policies. I am a nutritionist and registered lactation consultant with over five years of experience in the field, serving as an expert resource on nutrition, food justice, food systems, and health equity. I'm uniquely equipped to address the benefits of licensure for IBCLCs that this bill offers, as well as its potential impact on increasing the numbers of BIPOC IBCLCs. The center strongly supports House Bill 5318, an act requiring the licensure of lactation consultants, and we would like to extend our deepest gratitude for the committee's contributions towards the advancement of breastfeeding and breastfeeding support for Connecticut's families reflected with this bill. We applaud House Bill 5318 as a testament to your intentional efforts in addressing the current disparities in maternal and infant health outcomes and for the opportunity to provide testimony here today. Uh, we are in support of House Bill 5318 because we firmly believe that licensure of the IBCLC will promote equitable access to clinical lactation care. And we believe this bill will improve maternal and infant health outcomes and move us forward closer to pregnancy and birthing justice. We also believe that licensing the IBCLC will open opportunities for community colleges to streamline the education and clinical training required for this credential. 
making a career in this field more accessible, economical, and attainable for those in underrepresented communities. The significance of licensure for lactation consultants is rooted in the fact that Medicaid mandates reimbursable services to be conducted by licensed professionals. We respect that mandate and want clinicians to be licensed so that the state is able to monitor their work. There is risk of harm with this care. Unfortunately, many birthing families in marginalized communities are covered by Medicaid and as a result do not currently have access to clinical lactation services. It is imperative that we work towards changing this reality, and this bill represents an important step toward achieving health equity in maternal and infant health spaces. We respectfully urge you to consider modifying this bill language to make IBCLC licensure affordable in Connecticut, to ensure every aspect of this bill is written through an equity-centered lens. Specifically, we recommend a reduction in the application fee to $200 and a reduction in the renewal fee to $100, Furthermore, we express our support for the elimination of Section 3, Subsection B, and we thank you for your time and consideration of making amendments to House Bill 5318 and addressing these concerns. Ms. Holland, thank you very much for being here. Um, and it sounds like you are uh, concurrent with the suggestions made here earlier today in terms of the fees and the change in the language. I just have a question for you. You said in your testimony there is a risk of harm with some of this care. Can you just briefly elaborate on what you mean and, and say why you're sharing that with us? Of course, I will be happy to. Uh, the importance of acknowledging the risk of harm in uh, providing clinical lactation care is critical because anyone can... Um, unfortunately, at this time, go up to a breastfeeding mother and call themselves a specialist. They can um, call themselves a lactation um, consultant, and licensure will allow us to do a number of things, including um, distinguish the uh, marked differences between clinical um, practitioners um, that are able to provide quality lactation care, and um, the risk of harm is that without specific language in this bill and equitable access to lactation care, we are putting mothers and babies at risk of not getting the help that they desperately need. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, we oftentimes, I think when people think of breastfeeding, they think it just happens. So it's wonderful that we have folks in the community who are able to provide that support. And I appreciate very much you bringing up the issues of equity and access and speaking to the Medicaid issues to assure um, that as we heard earlier today from Rep. Leeper, that there is uh, safe and equitable access. So seeing no other questions, we will go on to Mary Caruso, who I believe is here with us in the room. Is Mary here? Okay, if not, I believe that Vicki Lucas is next. Hello. Welcome, please proceed. Thank you. Hello, and thank you so much. And. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, sit before this distinguished committee. I'm Dr. Vicki Lucas, and I'm a senior advisor to Nest Collaborative, which is the number one uh, telelactation company in the United States. We served over 41,000 families last year and over 2,000 families in Connecticut. And um, we are in support of, and our headquarters, by the way, is in Farmington, Connecticut. And so we have a unique place in that we serve people that uh, don't have access to personal care going into the home. We tele, tele, use telemedicine technology to uh, zoom in and we have all IBCLCs. And so we are in support of House Bill 5318 with the specific language of IBCLCs being licensed. The reason we are in support of that is it is the, the number one, the golden standard across the United States and the world. It is standardized. They have very specific curriculum with academic classes, with anatomy and physiology, specific testing, very rigorous clinical activities. So there is that standardization of care. We believe that standardization care is the safest thing for our most vulnerable population, which is our mothers and babies. Um, it's the only uh, credential that 
allows for clinical lactation consultation. All the others have variability in education, variability in, in skills. So again, we believe that our most vulnerable population truly needs to have licensure of IBCLCs. We also believe that IBCLCs will increase access to care, that it will draw more IBCLCs into Connecticut. It will allow for reimbursement for those services right now. Uh, women that have IBCLCs out of the hospital are paying cash for that, our most vulnerable population. Uh, and those that have uh, disparate outcomes and disparate access are not served because of that. If we are licensed, uh, then we'll have the ability for reimbursement and can uh, have all IBCLCs in the state serve that population. Uh, we also believe that licensure will allow a venue for citizens to file complaints and have due process. Certification does not allow for that. Uh, so in summary, we believe that the passage of House Bill 5318, but with the language of IBCLCs only, due to the standardization of credentialing and the standardization of outcomes, we believe that will increase the access, decrease the disparity uh, of care for lactation consultation services throughout Connecticut and will truly improve morbidity and mortality as well as decrease the cost of public funding. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lucas, for your testimony. Uh, Seeing no questions uh, or comments, we will move to the next person on our list, which is hey, a person over here. Thank you. Steve, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ashley Star Prashad, welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, um, Senator Summers, and Representative Claire Destiartre, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Ashley Star Frechette. I am the Director of Health Professional Outreach at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, our member, our 18 member organizations serve nearly 40,000 victims of intimate partner violence each year. I'm here today to strongly urge your support of House Bill 5322. The proposed bill seeks to provide potentially life-saving resources about intimate partner violence to every birthing person in Connecticut through birthing hospitals and obstetric providers. Part of my role at CCADV is overseeing our maternal mortality due to intimate partner violence grant project. Last spring, we released a report which looked at all maternal mortalities from the year of 2015 to 2021 in the state of Connecticut. Of the 102 individuals who lost their life um, while being a birthing person during that time, 32% experienced intimate partner violence at some point in their life. And of those individuals, 67% of those individuals um, experienced IPV during pregnancy or within that one year of postpartum care. Um, ACOG says that one in six abuse, abused women is first abused during pregnancy. With that all being said, we still rarely see or hear any resources on healthy relationships or where we can look for supports when we are pregnant. Um, IPV during pregnancy increases the risk for preeclampsia, preterm births, um, postpartum depression, and countless other negative health consequences. If we want to truly prevent this maternal mortality and support birthing people in Connecticut, we need to include IPV in all conversations around what a healthy pregnancy can look like. Existing statutory language focuses on developing crucial education materials for mental health, substance use, and IPV, preventing maternal mortality as a direct result of the state's MMRC committee. Bill 5322 would ensure that education on IPV is not only distributed to providers, but also to the patients that are being served. Um, we The research is clear that there's countless missed opportunities with screening and people not being comfortable to disclose. Educa educational materials given to every birthing person would ensure that everyone is leaving with a resource um, and educational material that they can go home with. CCADV's pregnancy-related resources are validated, developed, and ready to distribute. CCADV's health professional outreach advocacy team is ready and willing to ensure free trainings and supports to any provider that is outlined in this, um, in this proposal. This bill will provide IPV resources at a crucial point of intervention. IPV is amongst the top contributors to maternal mortality and morbidity, and it needs to be recognized as such. Connecticut simply can't sit by and afford to continue to miss these opportunities. 
Thank you very much for your time and consideration of this very important bill. CCADV always appreciates the committee's longstanding commitment to protecting victims and survivors. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Starfishet, for your testimony, and thank you for the work CCADV do every single day. It's, you've been lifesaver for a lot of our constituents and individuals. I see a question or a comment from Representative Parker. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Anwar. Thanks, Ashley, for, for being here with us and for the work that you folks do. I just want to see if you can help us understand a little bit about the work of the Maternal Mortality Review Committee and CCADV's role on that, and specifically in terms of creating this resource. As we continue conversations with folks at DPH, we just want to understand um, uh, the commitment of CCADV to doing some of the heavy lifting, because we know how resource-constrained they and so many others are. So can you just help us understand what you folks, I think you referenced maybe have already done a lot of these materials, but... Um, in terms of seeing that through, we'd love to know more. Thank you. Thank you, of course. Um, so I serve as a member on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, and I work very closely with DPH on many different projects, and we are ready and willing to do all of the work. These are resources that we use every single day already to help providers. Um, so CCDV is ready and willing to provide all of these resources, um, work directly with DPH on everything that has to do with this. And then, like I said, we have 10 health professional outreach advocates that serve across the state to help support any providers that might want education. Um, it's all free and we do provide um, credits for that as well. So thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Representative Parker, we would encourage you to ask more questions because you look good on the screen with the baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seeing no other questions or comments, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on our list is number 62, Jennifer Han. Remotely. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm Jennifer Hant from Darien, Connecticut. I'm here to support House Bill 5321 as a parent of a six-year-old child, Charlie, who lives with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In 2020, Charlie was diagnosed with Duchenne, a relentless fatal neuromuscular condition that impacts one in 3,500 boys. Without the protein dystrophin, muscles impacted by Duchenne waste away every day, leaving boys in a wheelchair by early teens and dying from heart failure in young adulthood. It's a diagnosis that changes life as you know it forever. Before diagnosis, we worried about Charlie's development, wondering why he wasn't crawling or walking or pulling himself up. Our pediatrician told us it was likely nothing, so we did things we now regret, including receiving physical therapy for Charlie through Connecticut Birth to Three. Without a diagnosis, that therapy pushed our baby's unprotected muscles too hard. Our baby, who couldn't tell us how difficult or even painful those exercises must have felt. It's heartbreaking to think about that now. Our parental intuition finally led us to diagnosis at Yale. So why am I here today when we've already had that heartbreak? First, the delay in diagnosis takes a toll. The average age of Duchenne diagnosis at five costs over $200,000 in medical expenses and productivity loss per family and hundreds of thousands in insurance claims. Without awareness of the condition, families may take counterproductive action like we did enrolling our son in PT or having more children without knowing their carriers of the condition. Duchenne also impacts behavior and learning and children may enroll in school without special supports that they need in place. Second, we're at a turning point with treatment for Duchenne. For us, once we finally got diagnosed, we got lucky. Charlie turned four just in time to qualify for a phase three trial of a gene therapy, Elevitus, which is now approved for four and five-year-old patients only. Elevitus has significantly improved Charlie's stamina and strength. Last month, he was able to walk thousands of steps with us while on, on school break. That simple family experience would not have been possible without treatment. Families should not need luck to access the seven FDA-approved therapies now available for Duchenne. They need early diagnosis. Third, high-quality care alone has improved outcomes. Numerous studies show that coordinated care for DMD has resulted in a full 10-year increase in life expectancy. The sooner patients can begin this care, the better. Finally, if we routinely screen babies, we put every patient on an even playing field with access to early-stage clinical trials and treatment to better care and to supports like the Katie Beckett Medicaid waiver. And we can immediately recognize the impact of all those things on patients from day one. 
It's a virtuous cycle that will add up to further progress against this terrible disease. Time is muscle. Every day we wait for diagnosis, patients are declining. Science has solutions, but first we need the diagnoses. And we have a simple, affordable way to start doing that now. Connecticut has a huge opportunity to lead the way toward better outcomes in Duchenne newborn screening. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I wanted to ask you, uh, the bill is talking about the early diagnosis, but what are the screening tests that you're aware of that uh, so the, help us? Yeah. Sure. So the first screening test is called CKMM. It's looking for a biomarker of um, muscle breakdown, basically. And um, they do that when they suspect Duchenne. If they do that um, in newborns, basically the process will be able, like just, just like other um, rare diseases like cystic fibrosis, where they do a secondary they do a repeat test and then patients from there would be um, would be recommended for DNA sequencing to confirm a diagnosis. Okay, so a blood test will give us insight into muscle breakdown and then you have a suspicion and then you go further to confirm the diagnosis with the tissue diagnosis? Uh, no, no tissue is necessary. It's just a DNA sequencing, another blood test. Okay, this is very helpful. Thank you so much. Rep of course. You have a question? I know. You do? Rep Cook has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows, too, we have packets that are um, in front of you that really give a lot of great information. I want to thank you for being here. I understand that as a mom with family members, it makes it difficult to come in person, and I'm happy that you could be here to join us and tell your story. Is there anything else that you think is relevant that we need to know while we're making this decision? I mean, I think it's important to remember that this test is already routinely given to newborns and adding Duchenne is is not a huge lift. I mean, it's basically, like I said, it's it's using a simple blood test to sort of uh, identify a suspicion. And then from there, there are steps that you can take and different states are approaching it differently. So there's different ways that you that we can do it in Connecticut. Um, but just identifying that this might be happening is going to um, reduce the sort of diagnostic odyssey that a lot of our family, yeah. my story, I guess I would just say my story is not unique. My story is actually very common. Everyone from, we had no idea until he was six that, you know, anything was wrong to, we knew something was wrong, but then they thought it was a liver issue. Or they thought it was this and that. And that just adds up on so many levels, cost and also, you know, psychological distress and all the things that you would think, um, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I just think this is a, um, a low lift in terms of really impacting outcomes for the better. Thank you. And thank you again for being here and sharing your story. Best of sure. luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Representative Mara has a question or comment. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate you coming here and um, I've enjoyed our discussions and, and hearing so much about Charlie along the way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I understand that it's lobby day uh, this week in DC and um, maybe some of the folks that could be talking with us here today aren't able to make it, but there's certainly testimony for them. But I just, I know you talked about um, kind of the psychological distress and, and some of the money that you've had to spend along the way between that age of birth and four. But maybe can you um, just touch on if you did have a newborn screening and if you found out Charlie uh, Charlie's illness very early on, what kind of therapy could be done since we know that um, something like gene therapy couldn't be done until um, when he was older? Is there anything else that can be done at that young age? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, uh, treatments are emerging all the time and we're learning more about early intervention. Um, for us, it would have been, we wouldn't certainly wouldn't have pushed him in BT, which actually broke down his muscles more and was really detrimental. Um, we would have gotten in with a care center earlier. We would have had more information. We would have gotten him into that comprehensive care that's so critical I think it's also important to remember right now, the treatment that Charlie got, which is was so completely transformational, is only approved for kids four and five years old. So if you look at the average age of diagnosis at five, that's giving no time to, and let me tell you, like getting, you know, getting into care and like agreeing that this treatment 
is the right step and then getting insurance approval. Like there's very little time. So if you have a kid who's diagnosed, um, you know, as a baby, then you've got that time to plan like what the, what his care will look like, you know, what treatments look like, what clinical trials look like. Um, it's just, you don't want to rely on luck for in terms of like timing your child to like make critical decisions about a really serious disease. Um, it just, it makes no sense. We have the science right now. I mean, it's not even revolutionary science. It's part of the, you know, heel prick that babies get. And it costs like $8 per child to add this on. And it's actually in terms of being a rare disease, it's a pretty prevalent one. So I just think all the, you know, everything lines up that it makes so much sense. And it's really going to have a tremendous impact on outcomes. Thank you so much. And thank you for your advocacy. And thank you for your support. For sure. Anytime. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we want to thank you for your testimony. And we will move to the next person on our list, which is uh, Louis Luna. Welcome. 61. Thank you, um, uh, Senator Anwar, uh, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Luis uh, Luna. I serve as the coalition manager for Husky for Immigrants. And I'm here uh, today to express my strong support of HB 5320. So medical debt is not just a financial burden. Uh, it is a barrier to equitable health care access and perpetuates cycles of economic and health inequities. As someone deeply involved in advocating for immigrant communities, I have seen firsthand the devastating impact of medical debt. Over the years, countless individuals we've worked with, um, including my own father, have found themselves drowning in medical debt after receiving me uh, necessary healthcare services. Three years ago, my father, uh, who is undocumented, suffered a heart attack. He had an emergency procedure and made it through. After returning home, he was sent a bill of over $15,000. He applied for financial assistance, but he was denied. They told him that the best thing that they could do is put him on a payment plan. This story is not unique. Uh, this is the reality for many people in our community. For example, Sandra, who is a member of one of our, one of our organizations, owes over $30,000. Uh, she's undocumented and a homeowner. She also has applied. Uh, she has sent documents. Um, she um, has also begged for some type of financial assistance and has not found relief. Of course, her example also highlights a larger systemic issue. She does not qualify for Medicaid because of her immigration status, which could also be a pathway to address her medical debt. In Connecticut, approximately 59% uh, 59 of undocumented immigrants are uninsured, compared to uh, just 5.9% uh, of residents with citizenship or a social security number. This staggering disparity highlights the urgent need for legislative action to address the issue of medical debt and to ensure access to healthcare for all residents, regardless of their immigration status. Passing HB 5320 uh, would be a crucial step towards providing relief to individuals who are disproportionately affected by medical debt and lack of access to essential healthcare services. Moreover, implementing measures such as creating a common application for financial assistance, uh, ensuring language accessibility, and automatically qualifying certain patients for assistance based on income level or enrollment in, progr in programs like SNAP or WIC are vital steps towards making financial assistance a more accessible and reducing the barriers faced by marginalized communities. As an advocate for equitable access to healthcare, I firmly believe that HB 5320 is a necessary and just measure that will positively impact countless lives in our community. I urge the committee to favorably pass this bill and stand with us in the fight against medical debt and healthcare inequities. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to testify uh, today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Louis, uh, for your testimonies. Uh, there is a question. Representative Zupkus has a question for you. Wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, thank you for coming today. I'm just trying to understand what you're asking for. Are you asking for 
a payment plan to pay off the debt? Yeah, so so what I'm what I'm asking uh, for is uh, to some type of relief for families who don't have um, uh, insurance, uh, but also like for the larger uh, community. I think like what we see uh, is that uh, folks who don't have insurance, in 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 our perspective, as uh, you know, fighting for folks who don't have access to insurance, is that uh, folks need to see the doctor. Um, and when they return home, uh, either for emergency or, or uh, any uh, type of uh, specialized uh, care or any type of um, uh, encounters that they have with, uh, with, uh, with medical providers, that they are burdened uh, with debt. So then this causes a really big issue uh, because uh, folks then have to choose. And sometimes they think, should I see the doctor or should I, should I ignore uh, what I'm feeling or the things that I need to see um, uh, that I that I need uh, in terms of uh, of, of seeing a uh, seeing a doctor. I mean, in, with my father, for instance, he after he had the heart attack, yeah, he came home. He had a he had a stent uh, placed in his in his heart, and he he made it through. But then after he came from the hospital, he was questioning on whether like he should see and follow up with the cardiologist because he received a large bill. So this is the reality that we see with a lot of folks. So if we are able to, uh, you know, this is a larger systemic uh, issue, but if, we, if we're able to uh, find some relief uh, where folks are able to apply for uh, for financial assistance uh, in their language, uh, creating a common application where hospitals across the region can use the same so then so then they can the so then patients can uh, apply for this uh, assistance in a in a more equitable way and in an easier way i think this will go a long way so what, I, what i'm advocating is to uh, to make sure that we um, try to find uh, relief with with this with this bill uh, for uh, many of our community members Thank you, because I think uh, there's a lot of people that need relief, maybe more than even in just your community. Um, but I, because I think as you said it, it's a bigger systemic issue um, than just that. So, but I'm glad to hear it's more of a payment plan and to help with payments because medical expenses are extremely high for everybody. Um, so, thank you. I just wanted yeah. to clarify what you were asking. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I, I agree with that. I think like there's a lot of work uh, to do uh, to make uh, health care. Thank you for, so much. Uh, I, I think uh, this is good. Uh, we have no more questions or comments. We appreciate your testimonies, uh, Louis. We move to the next person on the list is uh, number 63, Lila McGeorge. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, <laughs> great. Hi, everyone. My uh, name is Layla McGeorge, uh, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. Um, I am a resident of Trumbull, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in social work and master's in public health at the University of Connecticut. And I stand in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. So in 2020, hospital and physician visits together comprised more than half of an individual's average uh, annual health care spending in Connecticut. The cost of health care in Connecticut has increased within the past few decades, disproportionately impacting low-income adults, adults ages 18 to 64, immigrants, and Black and Latino residents. Those experiencing medical debt are forced to delay or forego needed medical care, which can lead to worse health outcomes. Hospital financial assistance for medical costs can alleviate the heavy burden of medical debt for many vulnerable Connecticut residents. So medical expenses have touched all of our lives, I'm sure, and mine included. In 2018, my mother was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer, and this really shook the foundations of our family and was a time of uncertainty and fear. So after an intense bout of surgeries, chemotherapy and radiation, my mom is now proudly a breast cancer survivor. Throughout her journey, the thought of medical expenses was not on the forefront of our minds at all. We just wanted my mother to heal and survive. However, my mother was shocked to learn that after all of her surgeries and various treatments for her cancer, the total cost was over half a million dollars. 
Thankfully, my family has insurance that covered most of those expenses. However, even after the coverage, we were left having to pay a significant remainder insurance would not cover. Without the surgeries, chemotherapy, and radiation, my mother may have not survived or would have prolonged going to the doctors until she had stage three or four breast cancer. We are so, so lucky to have insurance that covers most medical expenses. However, having insurance with decent coverage is hard to come by, let alone having insurance at all. Imagine we did not have insurance. Imagine we had no way to even begin to pay off the medical expenses she incurred. That is a stark reality for roughly 280,000 Connecticut residents who have medical debt. The key provisions of this bill will help the most disenfranchised residents by making financial assistance more accessible. So like creating a common application for financial assistance that all Connecticut hospitals would accept would make it more accessible, as well as automatic qualification for assistance for certain patients who are enrolled in SNAP and WIC or with a household income uh, at or below 250% of the federal poverty line. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance policies. I urge the committee to favorably pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, just wanted to comment that uh, MPH and MSW is a pretty, very interesting combination. You're, you're gonna do good work. Um, thank, thank you. you. Uh, no questions uh, or comments. We'll move to the next person on our list, which is Ellie Mulpeter. Welcome. Thank you. As as I think everybody can figure out, I am not Ellie Mulpeter. Ellie had to step away from the, conf the conference call. And I'm my name is Eugene Curry, and I'm testifying in her place. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Academy of Lactation Policy and Practice, which certifies qualified lactation support professionals known as certified lactation counselors, otherwise known as CLCs. We support the overall goal, and I'm testifying on behalf of HB 5318, and we support the overall goal of increasing access to breastfeeding and access to breastfeeding care professionals. However, we have some concerns about the bill as drafted. First of all, as a general proposition, we would like to see both CLCs and IBCLCs be reimbursed based upon their certification. And based on testimony today that I heard, it's my understanding that at least some healthcare professionals in Connecticut are being re reimbursed with med by Medicaid without licensure. Uh, in New York, legislation was passed to, that specifically allowed for reimbursement uh, Medicaid reimbursement for both IBCLCs and CLCs based on certification. To the extent that licensure is necessary, we would want both IBCLCs and CLCs to be licensed, and we would also recommend that that licensure be voluntary. Um, there are a wealth of economic evidence suggesting that mandatory licensure has, re restricts access to care and raises prices for care. Um, there's a a bill that was passed in New Mexico that provides for voluntary licensure for IBCLCs and CLCs, and we suggest that might be a useful model to consider. Um, I want to respond to some of the comments that have been made about the relevant, relevant qualifications of IBCLCs and CLCs, particularly the comment that IBCLCs are clinical and somehow CLCs are not. There was a case decided last year in Georgia where those very issues were at stake. And the Georgia Supreme Court concluded a couple of things that I think are relevant to this committee's deliberations. First of all, it, it concluded that uh, it rejected the argument that IBCLCs and CLCs were not, uh, IBCLCs were clinical and CLCs were not. It declared that both were clinical. It further concluded that the record before the court supported the conclusion that CLCs are trained to provide safe and competent lactation care and services within the scope of their practice, which is similar, by the way, to the scope of practice of IBCLCs. And my last point is that uh, Rhode Island, has, which is a voluntary licensure state, has been pointed out as a model to be followed in connection with this legislation. And I thought it might interest the committee to know that there are amendments to the Rhode Island licensure bill pending before the state legislature that would include CLCs in their licensure scheme. I'm available to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. We have noted your concerns. Um, 
seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list. Thank you uh, for being there. Um, next person is Mark Schaefer. Uh, welcome, Mr. Schaefer. Mark, you there? Yes. I am. I'm sorry. I thought you all had the control over muting and unmuting. So I learned that now and we'll begin. We, we do have the control, but we don't want to let you know that. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so good evening, uh, Senator Anwar, Senator Fahey McCarthy, Representative Claire DeTitra, Representative Summers, members of the committee. My name is Mark Schaefer, Vice President of System Innovation and Financing at the Connecticut Hospital Association. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity uh, to I appreciate this opportunity uh, to testify um, uh, concerning House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. Uh, CHA opposes this bill. Connecticut hospitals strive to ensure that the inability to pay for services is not a barrier to seeking medical care. And it's why they work hard to ensure their financial assistance policies are applied to all those who are eligible and to connect eligible uninsured patients with a regular source of health insurance coverage. CHA's primary objection to this bill is that it's largely duplicative. Uh, section one of this bill focuses on financial assistance for individuals enrolled in SNAP and WIC, regardless of immigration status. All Connecticut hospitals already provide free care or financial assistance to uninsured individuals who fall within the income requirements of this program, uh, these programs, regardless of immigration status. Section one also requires that hospitals use a uniform application for financial assistance. In, uh, in addition to offering free care for low-income individuals, hospitals may offer a range of financial assistance programs to help patients cover their medical expenses. And these programs vary from hospital to hospital based on the kinds of donations they may receive to cover uh, such services or programs and typically has specific requirements regarding who qualifies and the criteria for eligibility. And these may vary from year to year. So an application that took into consideration all such requirements for all hospitals would be difficult to maintain because the programs change. And it could also require the patient to complete a much longer and more burdensome form than they do for an individual hospital today. The bill also imposes unnecessary and burdensome reporting requirements that add to hospitals' administrative expenses and ultimately the costs of care we all bear. Finally, the bill authorizes the Attorney General to investigate the application of hospital financial assistance policies when these policies are already subject to the oversight of the Office of Health Strategy. CHA will continue to focus on hospitals' efforts to make their financial assistance programs as easy to access and navigate as possible raise awareness about these programs with patients, and ensure that hospital staff remain well-prepared and trained to articulate these policies to patients. Uh, thank you for your consideration of our position. Thank you so much for your testimony. So can I clarify, so, so the, the CHS position is even the universal form is not acceptable? Yes, and discuss and talking with our members, there are uh, beyond uh, simply the free care that they all offer, uh, for uninsured individuals below 200% of federal poverty level, uh, or in some cases, 250%. There may be special unrestricted donor funds that, or restricted donor funds, for example, that might support a particular medical assistance opportunity or financial assistance opportunity. And so the application forms are designed to help identify folks who might be eligible for more than just the basic free care or financial assistance that they would otherwise be uh, entitled to. So, so uh, Mark, what are the things you guys like about this bill? Um, uh, I, I think there isn't a provision in this bill that we're voicing support for because we believe our uh, the, that the hospital's uh, free care and financial assistance policies are actually some of the best in the nation. And that's also in part because the statutes in Connecticut are much more protective of individuals uh, around things like liens, for example. Um, and and that uh, so in Connecticut, we think we're in pretty, pretty good shape, 
even despite the fact that without question, medical debt is an issue, but that's a different set of problems requiring a different set of solutions. Uh, thank you so much. This is very helpful. I, I would just say that the issues are real and the people who have come and spoken, uh, they do have very valid issues that they are trying to bring to the table. Um, and uh, the hospitals do have a role in the picture. Um, we just have to uh, look at what is the way to find a, a, a way to move forward and, and address some of these issues that we can. Um, the idea is also not to make it too burdensome from a logistic point of view for the hospitals, but at least we should have a mechanism to um, address the medical debt and some of the other challenges. Um, that was more of a comment. So if there is uh, no other questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, next on our list is... Uh, Elizabeth Ryan. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank the chairs and all members of the committee for hearing me out uh, this evening. My name is Elizabeth Ryan. I am policy counsel with Everytown for Gun Safety. Uh, I'm testifying in support of HB 5317, an act requiring a study concerning the funding for and effectiveness of community gun violence intervention and prevention programs. I want to echo the notion that we heard earlier that we have plenty of data the community violence intervention programs work. And I would like to encourage that this study focus on sustainable funding for those programs. So as you go into this study, I would like, we're asking that you go into it with substantive ideas for sustainable funding specifically. While Connecticut communities continue to suffer from the devastating impacts of gun violence, the firearms industry continues to reap record profits as their products fuel a public health epidemic. Connecticut has already established itself as a nationwide leader in gun safety, and that includes the establishment of the expert-driven Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention. But the commission cannot continue to distribute grants to support life-saving community-based violence intervention programs or perform its other vital functions without a sustained source of funding. Community violence intervention programs far too often have to rely on changing yearly budget allocations or one-time federal funding that can fluctuate wildly and prevent them from being able to adequately staff, plan, and sustain their work. What they need is a source of funding that they can rely on. And to create this steady funding, Connecticut should look to California and impose a modest excise tax on businesses selling firearms and ammunition. A rate of 11% on gross revenue for such sales would mirror the existing federal excise tax that has been in place since 1919. That tax, which generated $1.1 billion nationwide in 2022, supports wildlife conservation and hunter education programs. That year, Connecticut was in the top 10 states in terms of contributions per capita to that federal tax. If Connecticut in instituted its own excise tax on these sales, the funds it would generate could substantially and sustainably benefit evidence-based community violence intervention programs. The Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention has the unique experience to vet, evaluate, and monitor these programs, but it needs sustainable funds like the money that an excise tax would generate. An excise tax would ensure that the firearm industry pays its fair share of the costs of gun violence without placing the burden directly on consumers. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate you being here and uh, sharing uh, your concerns. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the data of the interventions and how that's helping some of the communities from uh, um, the current uh, studies? Sure. So we have evidence. I can get you specific data studies uh, after the hearing, um, but there are plenty of studies that show that a lot of these programs make a huge impact directly in the community. Uh, the commission last year funded uh, funded some programs that do things like 
uh, place uh, care workers into hospitals, directly uh, supporting victims of gun violence, uh, uh, programs that that help uh, specifically young mothers and children who are at particular risk for gun violence, uh, and even things like safe passage programs, which helps young people get to and from school and other activities uh, safely without being exposed to gun violence. Those were all things that Connecticut funded last year, unfortunately, with some federal funds that are only one time. Uh, but we have uh, these a lot of these programs have been in place uh, for decades. But that lack of funding is really uh, potentially holding them back a lot. And we're encouraging that these uh, proven programs be funded sustainably. So the ROI is quite significant from the investments that have been made in the communities through the, the existing programs. Yes. Okay. And, and, and uh, what you're saying is that the sustainability of this is going to be critical going forward. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list. We appreciate you being here. Thank um, you. Is, is uh, number 68, Nick McLaughlin, followed by James Lawrence. Mr. McLaughlin. All right. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, Chairpersons Anwar and McCarthy Vahey, Ranking Members Summers and Claritas Ditria, members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Nick McLaughlin. I am the president of Breeze Health, and please consider this to be my public testimony in support of Raise Bill number 5320. Uh, at Breeze Health, we are experts in hospital financial assistance programs. Uh, we partner with hospitals. Our mission is to make these programs easy for both hospital administrators as well as their patients. And uh, a description of our financial assistance solutions is available on our website, uh, breezehealth.com. Um, we can help hospitals, or what, what we do is help hospitals make it easy for their patients to see if they qualify and apply for free or discounted care under the hospital's financial assistance program. Um, if I could use one word to describe hospital financial assistance programs, um, it's it's underutilized. Um, so many patients that qualify for these programs are not accessing these resources and this free or discounted care that they qualify for. Um, and I know this because I spent nearly 15 years in the hospital debt collections industry. Um, I, I started Breeze because the status quo for hospital financial assistance programs nationwide is cumbersome and complicated and often involves application forms that request more information than is needed to determine eligibility and documentation requirements that are overly burdensome as well. Uh, we act as a trusted partner to our hospital clients, taking a collaborative approach to simplify and streamline their financial assistance programs to help them fulfill their missions as organizations serving their community. Now, I mentioned I'm in support of 5320, especially with the mandate of developing a uniform application for financial assistance. Um, standardizing this often complex application form for patients will go a long way to helping residents um, of Connecticut. Uh, so a um, couple thoughts to add. Uh, medical debt is wreaking havoc on families. Um, hospital financial assistance programs are woefully underutilized, as I mentioned. And uh, we applaud the state for committing COVID relief funds to pay off old medical debt for Connecticut residents. However, uh, we need to implement sustainable solutions to prevent medical debt in the future as well. Uh, simplifying and streamlining the patient experience with hospital financial assistance programs would be tremendously beneficial and a patient-friendly state uniform financial assistance application um, would be a great step towards that. Uh, a few states that have implemented one previously um, mandated are Washington and Oregon and Maryland. Um, Ohio has one that the state developed in partnership with the Ohio Hospital Association, and it's not mandatory. However, every hospital in the state has voluntarily adopted it, and it's only a single page uh, application template. A few things that I would recommend adding um, to the bill is uh, one would be creating a statewide centralized online hospital financial assistance portal um, where Connecticut residents could apply online for financial assistance at any hospital in the state. 
uh, a portal like that alongside promotional efforts to drive awareness of hospital financial assistance programs will drastically increase engagement and access to these resources um, for patients that struggle with medical debt. Um, I would also encourage ensuring that underinsured patients, people who have insurance but cannot afford their out-of-pocket costs, are not excluded from financial assistance policies um, and also uh, create minimum financial assistance program income eligibility criteria um, that is to be utilized by all hospitals in Connecticut. Um, Washington, Oregon, Illinois, California, New York are already leveraging policies like these. And uh, a good minimum benchmark uh, would be 100% discount um, for patients up to 250. Excuse me, Mr. McLaughlin, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, I just wanted to clarify, are, is your company giving loans? No, not at all. Um, we help facilitate these financial assistance programs that exist at hospitals. So it's not How facilitating payment. It's uh, facilitating the patient experience and connecting the lower income patients that cannot afford their care um, to receive these discounts on their care. How are you able to sustain yourself? if I may ask. Uh, so uh, our fee structure is partners in partnership with hospitals. Uh, they pay us a license fee for setting up our, uh, our software uh, to make it available to their patients. So um, our clients spend some money to make financial assistance programs where um, they are largely not receiving money available to their patients. It's uh, patient advocacy is at the heart of these efforts. Okay. So, so in other words, the universal application form, you're trying to centralize it, and that's how you're connecting with the, the people in the community who need the help, and you're working with the hospitals to be able to uh, help provide it to them. Say that one more time, please. So, so you have a universal application form that's online that you've, your, your group has created, and that's allowing the services to be provided to the the patients who need help, and then you collaborate with the hospitals to do that? Um, not exactly. Uh, we facilitate the financial assistance applications of our client hospitals. A uniform, a universal application form would make that um, simpler for the residents in Connecticut and simpler to execute a state uh, centralized financial assistance portal. Okay, this is helpful. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on the list. Uh, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Mr. James Lawrence. Welcome, Mr. Lawrence. Hi. Hello, I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, I'm we sorry. can. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I had the class today. Um, good evening, esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is James Lawrence. I'm a current candidate for Master of Public Health and Health Policy at the Yale School of Public Health, an incoming medical student and the son of two disabled parents. Um, today I'm before you virtually in support of HB 5200. Over the last few years, my work has taken me from Connecticut to California and Connecticut again, a place I've come to call home. I've had the pleasure of working with health equity experts from Gallaudet University who champion disability rights within the healthcare sector and have been involved at the ground level in both outpatient care and emergency department services since my undergraduate studies. From the perspective of someone who spent the better part of my childhood helping to make up for the shortcomings of an ill-fitting healthcare system, this bill is an opportunity to implement equitable healthcare practices that foster the well-being of not just those who are most convenient to care for, but all who seek it. In caring for patients during vulnerable moments where they may be awaiting a diagnosis that could change their life forever, or in seeking compassionate, compassionate continued care from healthcare providers they have placed their trust in, Cost and access should not preclude provision, regardless of perceived difficulty of implementation. Illustrating this need, I wanted to point out that in Connecticut alone, a striking 613,853 adults have a disability. These patients account for nearly 37% of the state's healthcare spending, which amounts to $21,000 per person annually with a disability. As I'm sure you are all aware, in 2017, the U.S. Access Board issued new standards for the utilization of medical diagnostic equipment. These are minimum guidelines, but not hard and fast rules, as stated by those who testified before me. To ensure that these important suggestions are implemented, I urge the committee to consider including language in HB 5200 that more closely affirms these recommendations by explicitly including accessible exam tables, 
scales and lifts, an avenue for enforcement of the statute through the Office of the State Attorney General, a requirement to train healthcare staffs on the need of disabled populations, and regarding Senator Gordon's earlier questions, a safety valve for smaller practices that may experience a greater cost burden, referred to in these guidelines as an undue burden, and a highlight of the tax credits that can be claimed for retrofitting facilities to ensure that every patient has the opportunity to receive the care they deserve. At our academic program, we're educated on how resources are allocated, how medical practices may help but also harm, and that sometimes profit comes before patients. One in four 20-year-olds will become disabled before they retire. This could be your friend, your spouse, your coworker, or your child. Today, I'd like you to place yourself in their shoes. Imagine coming into an exam room for a mammogram, afraid for what the results might show, and being turned away because you entered the room in a wheelchair and forced to seek care elsewhere because a decision was made to cut marginal costs and accessible diagnostic imaging equipment was not provided. Today, we have the opportunity to ensure that healthcare in this state is characterized by being more than just a commodity, but serve as an example for the rest of the country for how you, your neighbor, and your loved ones should be treated. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony, um, Mr. Lawrence. Um, could you talk, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the models that we have spoken of in, in, um, in the past about retrofitting healthcare facilities in, in California, perhaps you, you talked about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there have been a couple of different examples, especially within, you know, comparable healthcare facilities. We can look to Sutter Health in Northern California, uh, who voluntarily retrofit their entire facility uh, following a change to the California Building Code, I think in the early 2020s. Um, and they did this voluntarily and with relative haste. Um, and this was in compliance with the Building Code. There is also a couple of other examples where, especially with regards to enforcement, um, in New York, there were partnerships with the state attorney general and nonprofits that facilitated enforcement to ensure that standards were met. Um, they built these capacities through community-based organizational partnerships that already served and built trust with these communities that had physical disabilities. And as noted in previous housing cases, using programs like proactive rental inspection worked really best with a complaint-based system. So um, in terms of enforcement and in terms of looking at to other states for precedent, um, California and New York could serve as good examples for how we might be able to implement this here in the state of Connecticut. And and uh, you're aware of the the recommendations from um, the the coalition, and and um, are they similar to what some of the other states have done, or or are we at a different uh, pathway? No, they're they're very similar, um, and especially with regards to how they're taking this conversation. Um, really, you know, after listening to what the coalition has testified on earlier today, really, they're only asking for compliance with the access board. You know, we're, we're seeing that despite these being federal regulations, they aren't actually being adhered to. They're not being enforced. They're not being um, encouraged. So at the state level, it makes sense to sort of get ahead of the federal level and ensure that these folks get the, the care that they deserve. You know, that's been recommended, you know, as stated before by the DOJ, by the HHS, but hasn't been adopted yet. So um, at the state level, it does make a lot of sense. There's precedent in states like Texas and Minnesota that have passed similar legislation or are planning to pass it in this le legislative session. So there's absolutely precedent in other states. Sure. And my last question is, you probably heard one of the testimony to, to change the language to be inclusive of uh, individuals who have experiencing, uh, who, are who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I am some somewhat biased. Both of my parents are deaf and or hard of hearing. Uh, my mother was hard of hearing, but progressed into deafness later in her life. And, you know, language and accessibility on that front is a huge burden as well. Um, personally, I served as their interpreter for most of my childhood. Um, you know, despite having the availability of interpreting services, most of the time it was quite difficult for, you know, for my parents to coordinate care. Uh, often it was on them to have to provide those services for themselves to coordinate interpreters to come to their medical visits. And as a result, um, frequently they would just have me tag along instead, instead of having a qualified medical interpreter there to explain to them. And I think, you know, if, if this is another provision that's being considered, I would like to highlight the importance of having disability education, or at least that lens within medical education training. Um, because quite frequently and surprisingly, despite being a 16-year-old or 17-year-old, 
often the providers would look at me instead of my parents when they were speaking to me as the interpreter. They wouldn't look directly at them despite them being the patient. So I think, you know, if if those language provisions were included, if there was a sort of requirement to uh, at least coordinate interpreting services or make sure that those needs were noted and that healthcare professionals were required to understand what it was like to be treated as an other, despite the care being about you, um, I think that would make quite a big difference. Thank you, James. And I, I can tell you that earlier we were having conversation about some of the physicians and other healthcare workers not having the empathy. Um, listening to you gives me a lot, a lot of hope. So thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Um, next person on our list is uh, uh, Sianju. Oh, welcome. Hi, uh, dear Santo Awar, and represent you, my car, Siwei Hei, and the distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Sian Zhou. I am also a Master of Public Health candidate at Yale. My study focuses on maternal health. I'm here to express my support for House Bill 5318, an act requiring the licensure of lactation consultants. So breastfeeding reduces the risks of many health conditions for infants and mothers. Uh, however, many mothers discontinue it prematurely. Data from the CDC indicate that in Connecticut, only one in five infants is exclusively breastfed through six months, as recommended by WHO, which is 20% below the national average. The low breastfeeding rates impose additional 3 billion medical costs to mothers and babies annually in the United States. So therefore, there must be effort to support breastfeeding. The IBCLC certification, which requires coursework's 95 hours of lactation education and at least 300 clinical hours ensures quality services provided to families in need. And I also want to stress that uh, this is not only a health issue, but also an active issue. Also from the CDC, breastfeeding rates are notably lower among Hispanic and Black communities. Low-income, single, and the high school graduate mothers are 30% less likely to breastfeed their children to the recommended time compared to their counterparts, respectively. So enhancing access to lactation support helps address these disparities. Currently, it can be exhausting and frustrating for families to search for reliable lactation support since there are many programs award credentials after only a short didactic education. And for those who lack the sufficient time and resources, it can be difficult to understand and differentiate different certifications. And licensure also provides the foundations for service access and financial reimbursement. Many physicians will not refer patients for lactation care, and many insurers will not reimburse when such services are rendered if they are not able to verify qualification. So, with this action and with this change, uh, mothers may enjoy lactation services more easily and at a lower cost. And also, the for the profession, lactation consultants can can potentially be benefited as well by being reimbursed for their services and potentially receive more job opportunities. And thank you for the privilege of testifying today. Thank you so much, uh, Sianju, for your testimony. Um, my co-chair has a question or comment. Mm -hmm. Just a quick comment and a word of thanks for your amazing work and your advocacy today. I appreciate you and appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank so, you. And seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next person on our list, which is Johanna Schubert. Welcome.
Good evening. Good evening, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Johanna Schubert, and I'm the director of the Connecticut Hospital Violence Intervention Program Collaborative, or CTHVIP, at Hartford Communities That Care. I'm also a member of the DPH Commission on Community Violence Intervention and Prevention. Our agency, Hartford Communities That Care, is joining other advocates here today in support of HB 5317, an act requiring a study concerning the funding for effectiveness of the community gun violence intervention and prevention programs. Hartford Communities That Care was founded in 1998 with a youth program at Fox Middle School called Stump the Violence. Our CEO, Andrew Woods, and others recognized that tensions that began during the school day were spilling out and leading to violence in the streets. We understood then that early intervention, mentoring, and supporting the whole family would be key to stopping this violence. One of our youth leaders likes to say that youth development is violence prevention, and we couldn't agree more. Over the last 25 years, we've worked hard towards that goal, and today HCTC supports four complementary programs that focus on our mission of creating a drug-free and violence-free environment. Our work has helped shape national best practice models and is a contributor to making Connecticut a nationwide leader in violence prevention. According to Giffords Law Center, effective CVI programs are associated with an up to 40% reduction in gun violence. When we measure this in human cost, it means more birthdays, more gainfully employed citizens, more small businesses and communities, and less trauma overall. Less violence also has a monetary value. According to data from Hartford's three level one trauma centers, up to 85% of victims of community violence are eligible for or already on Medicaid. In fact, according to Every Town for Gun Safety, gun deaths and injuries cost Connecticut $2.6 billion each year, of which 57.1 million is paid by taxpayers. That's a staggering $742 per person. The evidence-based and community-centered violence prevention programs here in Connecticut can go a long way to shrinking that number, but to be most effective, community violence reduction programs rely on sustainable funding to provide the quality and continuity of care that communities deserve. Thanks to leadership from the governor's office and the legislature, including many of you around this table, we now have the infrastructure to support a consistent funding stream. In 2021, with the leadership of Senator Moore and others, SB1 established a Commission on Community Violence Intervention and Prevention that would make recommendations to the legislature on best ways to attain and focus resources to stem the flow of community violence. That report was, support, was submitted to the legislature at the end of 2021 calendar year, and chief recommendation among them was the establishment of a permanent commission, one that would continue to advise the legislature and help maintain healthy and sustainable sources of funds for community violence work. Such a commission was formed in 2022, and uh, the Connecticut Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention sits at the Department of Public Health. The DPH Commission is made up of experts in the field of violence prevention who have been appointed by the legislature. Its subcommittees are the right vehicle in the right place to receive and allocate funds from a consistent source of state funding. In its first year, as you heard previously, the DPH Commission considered proposals for a first round of grants and awarded eight agencies multi-year funding that will have a major impact on the communities they serve. It's a great start, but it's not enough. Okay. Excuse me, Ms. Schubert, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you if you yes, can sir. summarize your last couple of sentences? Absolutely. Um, so... The money that was awarded and allocated through the DPH Commission is a great start, but it's not enough, and we're fast approaching the ARPA fiscal cliff that many others are approaching as well. It's time for the state of Connecticut to step up and provide consistent, sustainable funding to keep these CVI programs going. Thank you. Ms. Schubert, um, from a complete public health lens, why are these programs necessary, and can you tell us, because you, you've been part of this for over a year now, what are the things happening in Hartford or parts of Hartford? Yeah, so the DPH Commission has been established for over a year now. My membership is relatively new, um, but I've been uh, observing and part of the meetings and contributing um, since its inception, and I've been part of the CVI field for about 10 years now. So community violence, we recognize as a public health issue because we see it as a reaction to other um, 
other forces that are happening around people. When people don't have enough to eat, when people are facing poverty, when people are facing powerlessness, they turn to violence. It becomes a reactionary um, and systemic um, symptom of a larger problem. And so as we address issues of public health, things like making sure people have safe and secure housing, that they have enough to eat and that their basic needs are being met, we find that trends in violence come down radically. So, okay, we have one year program. Is there any experience outside which has been much longer where it shows that it, it's uh, the data to show that it works? Yeah, so I can speak specifically to our agency. Hartford Communities That Care has put an emphasis on data. Uh, we were founded by an MSW, a social worker, and we really understand the value of, of tracking data and understanding that adapting to trends over time is going to help serve the community the best way possible. It's also going to help us use our limited resources in the best way possible. So um, Gifford's Law Center tells us that up to 20% of those who are victims of violent crime can become shooters themselves because of uh, the trauma that they experience. And so we tracked over 200 clients that we served in 2020. And of those 200, only three either became justice involved or were re-injured. And so we know that that's uh, far smaller than the national average and it's the intensive uh, intervention, prevention, treatment, and recovery continuum that CVI programs like ours follow that allows for these better outcomes. So um, I'm going to ask a question, and I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to ask so that it gets clear. This is not about taking anybody's rights away for, for having guns. It's about taking care of the individuals who are suffering and have been hurt from violence in the communities. That's correct. Um, there's no provision that talks about um, legislating guns, taking guns away, restricting access to guns. All we want to do is to continue providing the services we know make a difference and an impact in the communities that are already vulnerable. Okay, okay. just wanted to clarify that. Thank, thank you for that. Seeing no other questions or comments from anybody, uh, thank you for your testimony and thank you for being with us uh, this morning, afternoon, and evening. <laughs> thank you, and <laughs> thank you for uh, listening so kindly and intentionally. Thank you. All right. Moving to the next uh, person on our list is uh, uh, Ms. Lori Atkins online. And Hello, I'm, can you hear me? I can hear you and I love the name of your organization. You may wanna <laughs> share that too. <laughs> to oh baby lactation. So I am here this evening. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for all the esteemed um, members of the committee. I am here in support of House Bill 5318, an act concerning licensure of lactation consultants. I am Lori Atkins. I am a nurse and I'm an RN and an IBCLC here in Connecticut. I have a private practice in Glastonbury and Old Lyme and also a member of the MAPOC Committee on IBCLC licensure. Um, in my practice, we take care of hundreds of Connecticut families a year and we offer everything from prenatal education to expert troubleshooting for postpartum breastfeeding families. We screen for postpartum depression. We discuss maternal care recovery, compliance with the six week postpartum visit and contraception. I employ one contractor, IBCLC, and we are full time in this woman owned business. Despite our expertise in caring for the most complicated of babies, I cannot bill Husky for this care. Medicaid and other private insurers as well, some do not cover clinical breastfeeding care. Because we are not licensed healthcare providers in the state of Connecticut, and it should not be this way. I know how painful it is to turn families away because they have to pay out of pocket, especially our Medicaid population. And is this healthcare equity? I don't think so. Um, I received a referral from CCMC for a newly discharged mom and baby. This is last year. The baby was born at 27 weeks, dangerously close to not surviving. This was a young mother of color that was reaching out for help for feeding her baby breast milk, and I could not give her the care that I wanted to, and it broke my heart. The IBCLC is the highest level of clinical breastfeeding certification in the field. There's nothing close, requiring many hours of mentoring, college-level study, a rigorous exam, and recertification every five years. This preparation is far above what other breastfeeding helper certificates require. We need everyone at the table, but the IBCLC is far and away more clinically competent and prepared and ready for licensure. Um, and licensure elevates the credential we currently have and equals us to the other licensed healthcare providers we work with every day. 
There are many professional licenses required for Connecticut workers, taxidermists, HVAC professionals, nail technicians require licensing, licensing for public health and safety. Shouldn't we at least expect the same for healthcare professionals that manage tiny, new, tiny newborn babies? We carry an important and impactful role and we are vitally important to maternal and child health. I do object to the present bill language concerning fees. This has been raised before me, I know that. The $315 application fee is cost prohibitive and not at all equitable. Again, I echo many people ahead of me with a $200 initial application fee and $100 a year. I think that that would be fair. Um, Rhode Island requires a $50 fee for application and covers two years of an IBCLC licensure. So that's that's what our sister state is doing. There will be opposition to this bill for a myriad of reasons, but I ask you to continue to put Connecticut families and babies first and at the center of any decisions you make. That's what ultimately matters. And I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for um, speaking and about this important uh, uh, bill, mm -hmm. but also being part of the work, uh, the, the working group uh, for the MAPAC. So thank you so You're much. You're welcome. It was an honor. And uh, seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is Amy Gagliardi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, Public Health Chair's Representative uh, McCarthy Vahey and Senator Arnoir and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For the record, my name is Amy D. Gagliardi. I'm an international board certified lactation consultant and I'm employed by Community Health Center, Inc., a federally qualified health center. I'm here in support of House Bill 5318, an act requiring licensure of lactation consultants. As an allied healthcare professional, I have worked as an IBCLC with underserved families at an FQHC for almost 30 years. As you all know, FQHCs primarily serve underinsured, uninsured, and Medicaid insured people. When I received my board certification, I chose to work in an FQHC in order to render clinical lactation services to underserved populations. At that time, there was a large gap between who breastfed and who didn't, and it was based on race, income, and payer type, with Medicaid having the lowest rates of women who breastfeed their babies. Unfortunately, this gap still exists. People with private insurance coverage and those who can afford to pay out of pocket are the ones most likely receiving clinical lactation care. With licensure, I believe this highest IBCLC standard of care can be received by more people who don't currently have access to the service. We do not want a two-tiered system of care in Connecticut. Prior to becoming an IBCLC, I volunteered as a mother support group leader. I have also trained and supervised breastfeeding peer counselors. I provide trainings for community health workers and healthcare professionals. I am very aware of the ecosystem of breastfeeding support services and of the over 20 certifications, most of which require anything from a one day to one week training with no clinical component. The IBCLC is considered the gold standard in lactation care, and this is endorsed by HRSA, the CDC, the Surgeon General, and I can go on and on, but I only have three minutes. So I support House Bill 5318, um, with some provisions that I would like to see that I think Rep. Leeper has already recommended around language. Um, and what is important is that we create equity and access to clinical lactation services as breastfeeding renders both short-term and long-term health benefits for both the mother and the baby. Most importantly, though, licensure will help protect the public as they access IBCLC services and licensure is required in our healthcare system for all independent healthcare practitioners. Additionally, licensure will open the door for Medicaid coverage, which will help close the important healthcare gap in maternal child outcomes based on the research connecting maternal child outcomes and breastfeeding. So vulnerable populations, they really have a right to this gold standard of care um, and also have a right with for the assurance of public safety. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate your your work. I, I just wanted to ask a few questions just to clarify things. One is that the, the, the best quality of training is for the IBCLCs? Yes, sir. 
and and this bill is going to expand the best quality trained individuals to the most vulnerable in our state. Well, we, we hope that licensure would open the door for expanded coverage, particularly um, with Medicaid um, coverage, so that we can reach the most vulnerable people who don't who can't pay for this out of pocket. And I, I'm aware of the patient population that you're seeing at, at the FQHC. Um, would it be fair to say that your presence and your expertise is truly helping uh, the first few critical uh, times of our infants with who are low birth weight infants and, and then subsequently helping them uh, get healthier? So I think, you know, me as part of a team of, um, of healthcare that has values that support uh, maternity, maternal health and maternal outcomes and in infant health, I will say uh, that we have very high rates of breastfeeding, which are equitable. So we don't have higher rates of one, one, among one group over the other. Um, so we have been um, successful, but again, it's been a it's been a long term goal that we continue to expand. And you know, they tell us ninety nine cents ninety nine percent is not a hundred, and we're trying to get to a hundred percent. Amen. Thank you so much. And I have Representative Gilchrist who has a question or comment. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good, uh, Amy. Just wanted to say thank you so much for your continued advocacy um, for this important uh, policy. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gilchrist. And and my uh, esteemed co-chair has a comment or a question. Thank you, Senator Amwar. And Amy, thank you. It is a comment just to say thank you so much for your ongoing work in this area and for co-chairing the working group with Representative Leeper and continuing to bring this forward to provide equity and access. I think that there's been a lot of great conversation today. I will offer you the opportunity if there's anything else that you heard today that you thought we need to particularly hear uh, a differing viewpoint on. Well, I mean, there are several things that, you know, people have perceptions vary as Queen had said, um, perceptions vary and people um, practice differently and people practice with different populations. My perce perception is through the eye of equity and vulnerable populations, because that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Um, and so I think what somebody in private practice who is accustomed to working independently, um, it's really a paradigm shift to look at something like licensure and a, um, having you know fees that you would pay um, for your license and being accountable, having somebody have the ability to file a complaint. I mean, all these are a paradigm shift for um, a profession that's worked pretty much under the radar. And so I'm very sensitive to their comments and to their needs and their perceptions. But again, my lens is through a, a, a lens of equity and I know the good work that can be done. And I think all mothers and fathers and families and babies are created equal and they have a right to equal services. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Senator Amar. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions or comments, we want to thank you for your testimony and your work. And uh, the next person on our list is number 74, Paul Kidwell. Welcome. Thank you for being here in person with us. Thank you, uh, Senator. I always enjoy being here in person because I leave the room much well, more well-informed than I, I walked in. And so it's um, always fascinating experience. So thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Paul Kidwell. I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy at the Connecticut Hospital Association. And I'm here to support Governor's Bill HB 5058, an act adopting the Nurse Licensure Compact. Um, Connecticut is an exceptional uh, healthcare workforce. Uh, that you've heard that already today that is committed to serving patients every day. Uh, a robust and growing healthcare workforce is required to support healthcare delivery throughout our state. Uh, unfortunately, the current system is not training or attracting enough individuals interested in healthcare careers that are in demand. And we all have a role obviously to play in um, supporting that infrastructure. Uh, certainly hospitals do. And we are working individually together and with uh, partners across the state to support the current workforce and create new ways to improve and enhance retention, recruitment, education, and training. Uh, together, we can build on the investments already made to expand educational opportunities, ease the path to careers in, in healthcare, support retention, 
and enhance the safety of our current and future healthcare workers. Joining the nurse licensure compact is required by 5058 and is an important part of maintaining the momentum we've built to grow and, su and support our workforce. Uh, as we consider the best ways to build the nursing workforce of the future, joining the other 41 states and jurisdictions that are already part of the compact will help make Connecticut more competitive as we work to attract nurses into the state while embracing new ways to provide care, such as through telehealth. Uh, as the legislation advances, uh, CHA looks forward to continuing to work with committed parties to ensure that nurses in Connecticut continue to have access to and the confidential confidentiality of the of the Haven program. And if you're not familiar with the Haven program, it's a really important program for healthcare professionals in Connecticut, used many times as an alternate to discipline for individuals um, who need assistance with substance use disorder uh, treatment, et cetera. And we want to make sure that that um, confidentiality is is uh, maintained. And we do think there's an opportunity uh, to do that, to both maintain the confidential, confidentiality of the program and join the compact. So in, in final and conclusion, uh, participation in the licensure compact is an important tool to address workforce shortage issues. And CHA looks forward to working with a committee to couple this action with other steps to improve the education pipeline, support retention, as I noted, and improve opportunities for career advancement. And I appreciate the time this evening and happy to take any of your questions. Thank you so much. And I do have one. So um, th this bill is an important bill from the workforce perspective. It almost has a few issues with it. One of them being that we have looked at multiple other compacts and, and, and for most of the other compacts that the public health committee has looked at, uh, you, you have some limited component to change them. Yeah. There have been confidentialities protected, but this one for the nurses has the least protections for the nurses. Uh, and, and that's part of the challenge is that uh, the, the, their confidential information related to Haven would not necessarily be protected the way the others are. So can you speak yeah, our, to that? It's a, it's a, thank you for bringing it up because it's really important. Um, so our understanding is that a, a nurse in Connecticut would then hold two licenses, right? One would be the Connecticut license and one would be the compact license. And so all the rules related to the nurse's Connecticut license remain in place. And the nurse then can uh, attain the compact license and um, work in Connecticut, work in adjoining states. To the extent um, the nurse would want to avail themselves of uh, an alternate to discipline, discipline program, they could basically turn off the interstate compact license, retain their Connecticut license, go into the program, complete the program, come out of the program, and the license would be turned back on. It's our understanding that no information is shared related to why the nurse, the compact license was turned off. And so um, certainly would be happy to speak with you about that and go further, but we do think there's a way to maintain the confidentiality within this compact. Um, while also getting the benefits of the compact. Okay, so I, I'm I'm not sure if that all of that language is in the bill right now, uh, but uh, we definitely are very interested to get insight into how do we make sure those protections are in place yeah. because that's a big, very big hurdle. Uh, it's not um, something that everybody wants to have a protection. That's your right. Yeah, and we're, we're very interested in working with Haven with the governor's office. Um, to find a, a solution here. We think there's one um, where we can join the compact. We can make sure Connecticut law is is clear around these conf this confidentiality and, and uh, basically protect what we think is really important while also getting this added benefit of the compact. Can I ask for a request? If, if when you're having those conversations, I would love for the Connecticut Nurses Association representative to be there in that gathering when you're looking at the solution, but also have uh, the the uh, labor uh, representative representing the nurses in the state to be in the room as well, because uh, this bill's actual success when passed is going to be dependent on that aspect. Yeah. Too. I'll defer to you, you, members of the committee and uh, um, the governor's office related to negotiations, but certainly CHA um, would like to be at the table and be productive in those conversations. Good. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move to the next person. Thank, Thank you. you for being here in person. Um, next person on our list is uh, Rania Alboslani. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? 
very well. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. I am Rania Albaslani, a resident of Glastonbury, a student at the University of Connecticut pursuing a Master of Social Work degree and the public policy intern at Universal Healthcare Foundation of Connecticut. At Universal, our, mention, our mission is to accelerate the movement for health justice for everybody because health is a human right and core to social justice and equity. We are here today to stand in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. Medical debt is a major and growing contributor to the cycle of economic and health inequality. Racial inequities in income, wealth, and insurance coverage play a role in the prevalence and burden of medical debt, disproportionately impacting people of color. Financial assistant policies, also known as charity care, can help reduce how often patients incur medical debt and ensure that people eligible for assistance do not end up in collections. My mother still has medical debt that is owed to a hospital for a small but necessary procedure. She fell a couple years ago and had a piece of glass stuck in her palm. At that time, my mother was laid off from her full-time job and was ineligible for private insurance. She had qualified for Medicaid, but the process was taking a while for her approval. That resulted in her not having insurance for a few weeks. She was in a lot of pain and refused to go to the hospital at first. After urging her to go multiple times, she listened and went to New Britain General, which is a nonprofit institution under Hartford Healthcare. When we arrived, the surgeon used an ultrasound to see how deep the glass was. We, re we realized it was right next to a nerve and that it was dangerous. The procedure was needed to remove that small piece of glass that was embedded deep in her palm and required a surgeon. If she had waited any longer, that glass could have cut a nerve in her palm. She waited because she knew she did not have insurance and could not pay out of pocket. She feared it would end up in collection, and she was right. That day, she acquired over $1,000 in medical debts. She was never offered any financial assistance by the hospital, nor did they even acknowledge that it was an option. Instead, my mother was billed the full amount. Despite, despite me speaking with the staff and explaining she could not pay the bill, uh, at the hospital, the staff uh, said that Husky would cover the bill if she was qualified, that they would send the bill to them first. However, that never happened. I tried for a few weeks to correct this wrong with both the hospital and DSS, but neither were hel held accountable. If hospitals were held accountable, my mother would not be in medical debt and struggling to find a way to pay. This is a health in inequity. People should not have to postpone care or fear seeking medical treatment because of financial aspects that they have no control over. I hope you consider my testimony and my mother's story. It is just one of many examples of why we urge you to pass this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance policies. Thank you so much, Rania, for your testimony, and thank you for sharing your personal experience. Uh, um, and that, that gives a lot of uh, more credibility and, and value to us. So we appreciate your insight. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on the list, which is number 76, John Brady. Welcome. Good evening, Senator Anwar. I represent McCarthy Bay and members of the committee. I wish I could be with you tonight, but I'm traveling for work. Um, my name is John Brady. I'm the vice president of AFT Connecticut. We are a union that represents healthcare workers, among others, and we represent about 4,500 registered nurses in the state of Connecticut. I've submitted written testimony on three bills, but I'd like to comment on 5058, 50, 50, the nurse compact, which we oppose. Uh, many of our concerns are spelled out in a DPH report to the General Assembly two years ago. That report was based on a task force comprised of a wide spectrum of stakeholders from unions, hospitals, professional associations like the Connecticut Nurses Association and the Hospital Association. I've included a link in my testimony. The recommendations from two years ago was to move forward with the physicians and the psychologist compacts, but not the nurses compact. And the reason is simple. Not all compacts are created equal. For example, the Physician's Compact provides an expedited process for a physician 
to obtain licenses in other states. This is what Connecticut did for military spouses, including nurses, in 2021, and we supported that action. However, the nurse compact is unlike the physician's compact. The nurse compact is a single license for multiple states, with Connecticut giving up some of its autonomy over the regulation of nursing in the process. One big issue with the nurse compact is how nurses would be treated when undergoing treatment through the Haven program. Haven is an alternative discipline program. It's vital in helping all Connecticut healthcare professionals who need support due to chemical dependency, emotional or behavioral disorders, or physical or mental illnesses. Its success depends on the pr promise of confidentiality, which was deemed so important that it is codified in Public Act 7-103. Unlike the physician's compact, which allows continued confidential treatment, the nurse compact does not. The nurse compact requires disclosure of such treatment, including self-disclosure by the nurse, and a relinquishing of the rights to practice under the compact license. Our fear is that this will discourage nurses from seeking treatment, endangering the nurse and their patients. Another issue is a loss of revenue. The 2022 report estimates the yearly loss of $177,000 yearly for Haven and just over $5.2 million a year for the state. This is because when a nurse switches to a compact license, the license fees are lost to the state and to Haven. In some compact states, that loss has been passed on to nurses through increased licensing fees. I've included a link to a report from Vermont, which entered the compact two years ago, which shows a similar loss of revenue. Lastly, we recognize the desire to make Connecticut a desirable place for nurses to move to and to work in. We believe that there are other ways to achieve this, which do not carry the same downsides as the nurse compact, as we have done recently with military spouses and with te telemedicine laws. Excuse me, Thanks, Mr. Brady, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can answer any questions, I'd be glad to try. Yeah, John, if you want to summarize the last couple of uh, sentences. I was at the end anyway, Senator. Okay. So, so uh, John, I wanted to clarify a couple of thoughts. So if the confidentiality is protected and the cost to the nurse, financial cost to the nurses is minimized, uh, would you be on board with the bill? Yeah, and I've heard that that people are working on a workaround for the confidentiality. Um, you know, the devil's in the details. We haven't seen the language. We've been promised language, but we haven't seen it. I mean, what the, what the language we have is what's, you know, before this committee today. And the language before is, this committee today is not acceptable. If there is a workaround and <laughs> if the state... If the state could come up with, you know, $5.2 million a year, I have a few other uses for it too, but... Um, you know, and not pass that along to the nurses and increase fees, then that helps a lot. Um, we're not opposed to solutions. Um, I, but I do want to caution that I have reservations that this is a fix for the workforce, both the, the nursing workforce and the nursing educator workforce. Um, I tried to find um, statistics um, from other states that have the compact that showed that there was an improvement on anything. And I could not find anything. The only statistic I could find was that about 30% of the nurses who get a compact license end up using it to be a travel nurse, which I'm not sure is something we really want to encourage. Um, we have to remember that compact license is a door that swings both ways. It's just it's easy for a nurse that lives in Connecticut to go work in another state if they have a compact license, as it is for a nurse from another state to come work in Connecticut. Um, the reason we have a shortage of nurse educators is because they don't make enough money. They make more money at the bedside. That's just the fact. You really have to love being a nurse educator to give up the money to, to go work, you know, in a university. Um, and the reason we have a shortage of nurses at the bedside is what we tried to address last year with our staffing bills and what we're gonna to try to address this year with workplace violence bills. The compact isn't the solution to that. So I just wanna caution people not to get their hopes up that it is. 
and and can I just say that um, are you around the table where there's a workaround being figured out or or being addressed? Are you guys involved in that process with Connecticut Nurses Association and your group? No, we had one meeting with the governor's office, the Connecticut Nurses Association, us, um, and several stakeholders who have spoken today. Um, AARP was there. The the nursing home groups were there. There were a lot of people there. We had one meeting with them, and we spelled up we spelled out what our what our concerns were, and they were basically the concerns that are spelled out in the you know the the DPH report uh, two years ago, and on that DPH report, you know. Connecticut Nurses Association was a part of that. The Connecticut Hospital Association was a part of that. And so were many other groups in producing that, including us. Thank you. And I think Representative Kennedy has a question. Or, no, you don't. He answered that. All. Okay, you answered that already. So again, uh, I, I think this will be a conversation that will continue on, John. This is hel helpful because uh, um, you're right. Uh, Confidentiality is critical, and and uh, we want our nurses to be protected, and we want yeah. the compact to be there. And and uh, how that's going to play out uh, is is a different story. But with respect to the confidentiality, that's probably a critical part of that entire effort. So, yes, it is to us. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions or comments, we will move to the next person on our list, which is uh, Joe Pandolfo. Welcome. Mr. Pendolfo. Thank you. Good evening, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy, uh, he, Senator Summers, Representative Clarities Dietria, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, thank you for your service on the committee and also for this opportunity to provide testimony on Senate Bill 274, an act concerning opioids. Our organization, we fully support and applaud the subcommittee that you've proposed to establish with this bill. We feel that the attention and the efforts of this type of subcommittee would surely benefit families in the state that are affected by the opioid epidemic, as well as the providers and agencies and organizations that they work with. We would also offer our expertise and experience to this effort to serve as participants or advisors to the subcommittee that's established. Uh, credentialed acupuncturists have a long history of providing evidence-based, effective, and sought-after pain treatment, which has proven in various studies to reduce the use of opioids. Uh, a number of our members also have recent experience serving patients in the Medicaid program and report that their patients express profound gratitude for an alternative to costly and risky opioid prescriptions. Um, the treatments that we provide are used extensively by the VA and are now approved as Medicare services and can play a part in a comprehensive system of opioid alternatives here at the state level. And this, this part we could play has been recognized in earlier uh, legislation related to this bill, uh, the governor's opioid bill from a few years ago. We'd welcome the opportunity to share materials with the committee and to assist with the goals of this good bill in any way that we can. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Pandolfo, and we will take you up on that. If you can send us uh, um, any of the data and information that you're talking about, that would be very helpful. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is uh, Mr. Sheldon Taubman. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Sheldon Taubman. I'm the litigation attorney at Disability Rights Connecticut. We are the protection and advocacy system for Connecticut, serving individuals with the full range of disabilities. I'm here to testify about the impact of HB 5200 on people with mobility disabilities. The hospital industry has for years deflected any mandate to acquire the essential accessible medical diagnostic equipment per the 2017 Access Board Standards, arguing that states can't regulate in this area absent federal re regulations because we just don't know what the standards would be that they would adopt. Well, finally, proposed federal regulations are out and they adopt the Access Board standards in whole. The only thing of substance that the proposed regulations add 
is a timeline for implementation and scoping rules. Scoping rules refers to if it's not going to be that 100% of the devices have to be accessible, what percentage have to be. Besides that, the only thing the federal regs really added was incorporation of longstanding exceptions to compliance with, re with these new standards under the ADA and the Rehab Act. So now the federal agency has had agencies have confirmed they intend to apply all the access board standards. No one disputes that these are the right standards. So there's nothing standing in the way of passing HB 5200, which just adopts those standards. But the hospital association wants to continue to delay any mandates stating in their written testimony today, quote, because these federal rules are not final and there are many open questions that the federal government is working through on talk topics as diverse as scoping and thresholds, timelines, and applicability of the rules, it would be premature to adopt as state law the proposed federal rules before they're finalized. And they also say we need to, again, quote, wait for the federal rules to be finalized before moving ahead. It is unrealistic and will be extremely costly to do otherwise, close quote. Well, not exactly. It's possible that HHS, while firmly adopting the access board's long-standing standards may, in its final regulations, change the scoping requirements a little bit and may change the compliance timelines. However, this will not present any problems for regulated entities in Connecticut if the bill as drafted is adopted because any entity always has the obligation to apply to with both state and federal regulations if it can do so without a conflict. In this situation, it can readily do that by acquiring the amount of equipment which meets the most stringent standard under either the state or federal regulations in terms of scoping, and similarly by acquiring accessible scales and exam tables at the earliest date under either of the rules. No conflict as, if, as there would be if there were actually varying standards, but we don't have to worry about that. Finally, the amendments to the bill as drafted, which are attached to Ruth Groby's testimony for the CC equals four group, particularly tracking the proposed federal regulations resolves the hospital's remaining concerns. One, it will Excuse provide- Excuse me, Mr. Tubman, but your time is up. Thank okay. you. If I could just wrap up, please. Yes, please. I, I think you came to the most critical part and then- <laughs> Right. The one big thing it does, uh, the, the, the amendments do, is they um, just single out two kinds of equipment which are referenced in the federal regs as well for a duty to affirmatively purchase them, scales, exam tables, but do not require affirmative purchasing of anything outside of that area. But most importantly, they directly address, these amendments directly address the CHA claim that compliance with the access board standards and HB 5200 adopting it those standards would be extremely costly because their amendments would incorporate the three significant exceptions to compliance with the new mandates, which are already included in the proposed federal regulations. There's three of them, undue burden or fundamental alteration you heard about, small practices under 15, and where a reasonable percentage of a given type of diagnostic equipment has already been obtained in accessible versions, and the amendment suggests 20%. With the amendments proposed, by C equal, C equals A, HB 5200 will be right in the mainstream of state regulation working effectively in tandem with federal regulation and without unduly burdening any regulated entity. Thank you for letting me go over. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. So, so uh, I'm just going to ask you a theoretical question. So let's say we move forward with this bill and, and let's say hospital A invest into something and and uh, uh, the federal regulations theoretically come in in 2026 and they say that um, you are seven inches short on on some goal the implementation of the law is going to be through dph in in connecticut um, is there language that we can place in to have some opportunity to grandfather people in in, in the state, should, should there be a, a future regulation that may have a negative impact on them? I'm just talking in hypotheticals to try and get buy-in from people who are concerned. I understand. And I think that when you, you say inches, and, and that's where we really don't have to worry. And the reason we don't have to worry is the access board has 
detail that. They spent years, and in 2017, after much discussion and debate, they came up with the technical specs for all of this equipment. So there's no dispute that what those standards are. The only issues are how soon do we have to do this, right? Do we have to do it like affirmatively or can we just do it when we're replacing anyway? And lastly, what percent of our devices have to be like that? So there isn't an actual con in the hypothetical I think you're talking about doesn't exist because there's not going to be any kind of disagreement about the number of inches. It's already been decided what all of these technical specs will be. It's just a question of when you buy it, how many you have to buy. That's very helpful. I, I think we had heard a testimony that made me ask that question, but I, I appreciate your insight. And I want to thank you for your advocacy and the work uh, that you have been doing with the community. Uh, so truly, uh, you're a leader in your work. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, Representative D'Amico has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about the last minute nature. So Sheldon, thank you very much for your testimony and thank you for your good advice. So I just wanted to, if, if you could, uh, and maybe you did it already and I missed it, could you just clarify a couple of things that were, were spoken about earlier this afternoon in, in the public hearing? So, so uh, who would be the entity that would decide if there's a, a, a what constitutes a fundamental alteration if we do decide to go forward uh, with this bill and, and fundamental alteration and also who would decide if it's an undue burden on a uh, on a medical facility so this the the amendment it wasn't in the original 5200 as it's drafted but in the, the amendment from cc equals four they have a detailed if you look at it, i think it's sub subsection uh, e um and it's a detailed laying out of fundamental alteration, undue burdens, and what the process is. And that is taken verbatim, I think, verbatim from the federal, the proposed federal regs, 84.92, um, the section 504 regs from HHS. And what it's laid out very clearly is that the burden is on the recipient, in that case, recipient of federal funds or under this bill, the provider, um, the burden is on them to establish that, that fundamental alteration or undue burden is met but it specifies that it must be that that basically the head of the uh, of the entity, um, you know, not a lower level person, has to be making the call after looking at all the resources and after making the decision, it has to be documented. So the decision really is with the entity, and it by itself, if it's not if it's not then contested, that's sort of where it stands. If there were a contest, then of course it would be all documented. And then if there were a complaint filed with un, under the federal regs with the Office of Civil Rights of HHS, um, where we can talk about in Connecticut where the enforcement would likely be, such as CHRO, um, then, then they would look at, you know, okay, what was the documentation? This The, the bill as amended, if, if you adopt those amendments, says there's going to be that same kind of documentation, <clears throat> excuse me, that same person, higher level person makes a decision and then puts it in writing, and then we'll have that to review in the event of any contest. So I, I think that that's really what your answer is. I also think that if you adopt these um, provisions, I think we should assume good faith. And I think we should assume that there's going to be compliance. Um, and if, if an entity thinks that it's a fundamental alteration or undue burden, they will go through the process and they will document it. And, and, and that will, in most cases, be accepted of course, if it's under 15 employees, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but I think that's the answer. Um, you know, as far as enforcement, uh, which I just talked about in Connecticut, I think right now, at any kind of non-compliance with the civil rights statute um, is goes to the CHRO or can go to the CHRO. And that includes disability discrimination, failure to make reasonable accommodations. So if this bill were to be passed and, uh, and, and there was a conflict on fundamental alteration or just non-compliance, um, I would presume it could it could go to CHRO now. And then if and if you wanted to make that absolutely crystal clear, you could you could clarify that right now in the law with a sentence just saying that um, non-compliance with this provision shall be deemed to be um, a a, a um, uh, non-compliance with uh, disability discrimination laws and that jurisdiction shall lie with the CHRO. 
with any complaints. Thank you, uh, Sheldon. Can I one more question, Mr. Chair, if I could? Please go ahead. Oh, thank you, sir. So, so just one more, uh, Sheldon. Uh, j just because it, again, it came up uh, in the uh, earlier this afternoon. So, the the the, the federal regulations um, uh, th that have been, uh, uh, as you said, you know. Um, it's taken them years to 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 finally uh, come up with these regs, uh, the access board regs. Uh, uh, to whom do these regs apply? And the reason that I ask is because a, a previous testifier uh, was questioning uh, whether Connecticut should even go forward because we don't have any clarity as to uh, which entities are, are going to be, uh, which entities that these regs would apply to. Could, could you shed some light on that? Um, I wasn't there for that testimony, so I'm not sure exactly, but but they were talking about, but if they're talking that the federal regs, the proposed federal regs are not clear, I, I think they're quite clear. They Those apply to any recipient of federal funds, that's Medicare, Medicaid. If you're a recipient of federal funds and you're a healthcare provider, then the standards apply to you subject to the three big exceptions. Um, and this statute, this bill that you have before you, 5200, is also very clear. It says that you, and it's, there's a definition right at the beginning, healthcare provider, healthcare facility, I should say. And it also says you have to have two or more exam groups. So that it's very clear. Eve, I don't agree that there's anything ambiguous in the proposed federal regs, but this is even more direct. I don't think there's any ambiguity as to who this would be, who this right. would be applied to. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mr. Chair. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Mr. Tobin, and we'll move on to the next person on our list, uh, which is uh, Matt Pagano. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Matt Pagano. I'm a practicing chiropractor in Winstead, Connecticut, and a past president of the Connecticut Chiropractic Association. I testify today on behalf of the association wishing to comment on Senate Bill 274, an act concerning opioids. As the General Assembly is revising the Alcohol and Drug Policy Council within the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, the Connecticut Chiropractic Association urges members to include chiropractors in their deliberations, noting that the intended purpose of this proposed legislation is to reduce the number of accidental opioid overdoses we feel that it's important to also acknowledge that for many individuals addicted to opioids, their addiction started subsequent to an appropriate prescription given to mitigate a pain complaint. Our belief is that if the public were made more aware of the variety of non-pharmacological strategies for pain management, perhaps some who ultimately end up being addicted to opiates might not have started down that path in the first place. We note that the language of the bill specifies the composition of this proposed standing subcommittee, and we note that the language also specifies such individuals that also might be added to subcommittees or other working groups under the council. Therefore, I come before you today to state our suggestion that chiropractors should be specified in the language as one of the providers who could help people suffering from addiction in the state of Connecticut. Since the late 1800s, the chiropractic profession has, by definition, been a pharmacological free type of healthcare. Especially in the last several decades, there is a considerable and growing body of research which substantiates the efficacy of our interventions in the realm of musculoskeletal injuries and pain complaints. Consequently, it seems appropriate to include us as part of the discussion. I urge you to consider that you have hundreds of willing providers in the state who wish to be part of the solution by which we as a society decrease the incidence of opioid addiction and deaths caused by opioids, specifically including us in the proposed language in this bill and acknowledging our important potential contribution to society in this regard would be appropriate and timely. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Representative Cook has a question or a comment. Hi, Matt. It's great to see you. Absolutely. You too. Thank you for being here and taking time out of your day and for everything that you all do. So being part of the solution and recognizing that you're saying that you all definitely do help with pain management, um, do you have suggested language change or just adding you all to the to the table? 
in in this bill there's they they do get in um i don't have it in front of me presently but they do get into some specificity with respect to certain types of providers who might be implemented in this regard and so the, i mean i'd like to see us perhaps listed explicitly there um i mean we appreciate the fact that your committees recognize the utility of chiropractic and providing these sorts of non-pharmacological treatments to uh to reduce patients pain in 2019 um when passing the provision that's now in statute that prescribers of an opioid greater than 12 weeks um, get counseling and discussion with patients of the availability of treatments that can reduce pain without drugs so that statute specifically references specifically references chiropractic which which is wonderful and 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 a similar re recognition of our ability to help in this regard in this proposed language would be would be definitely uh what what we would like to see happen okay i appreciate that so if you have anything further um if you want to send it over or you know where to find me um i'd be happy to continue the conversation and we'll um continue to make this a hot topic for our committee thanks Absolutely. man take care yeah thank you you too Seeing no other comments or questions, we'll move to the next person on our list. Thank you for your testimony. Next person is Dean Howe. Welcome, Mr. Howe. Good evening, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Dean Hull, and I live in Vernon, Connecticut. I want to encourage the Public Health Committee's support to support SB number 175. I understand and believe in the work the Rare Disease Advisory Council does and strongly feel they need to have proper funding to accomplish their mission. I am the president of the Moya Moya Foundation, which is a nonprofit charitable foundation located in Connecticut, focused on rare disease called Moya Moya. I am also the father of a child living with this rare disease. My daughter has had seven strokes and three brain surgeries over the past 10 years because of this disease. Today, she's doing well post-surgery. Moya Moya disease causes the main internal arteries to the, and intracranial branches supplying the brain with blood to narrow, reducing the blood flow to the brain. There is no cure for this disease and patients with Moya Moya are at increased risk for stroke. Our foundation's primary mission is to promote awareness of this disease and to raise funds for research and to help find cures. Moya Moya disease is only one of over 10,000 rare diseases affecting 25 to 30 million Americans. Again, I urge your support for SB 175 and appreciate your efforts in raising attention for rare diseases like my daughter's. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier. Uh, Mr. Hull, um, this is more for my knowledge who's the 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 where do you send the patients for surgery for this who have the surgical technique for revascularization intracranially that's pretty complex it is and there's uh, several uh, locations around the country but uh, most recently um, we've learned of the um, procedure being performed at Harford Hospital in Connecticut um, there is a surgeon there now uh, who trained by one of the best out in California, who has brought it to Hartford. Um, unfortunately, when my daughter was first diagnosed and had her surgeries, uh, he was not in Connecticut. and We had to go out of state to get the uh, surgery. Is that Dr. Qureshi? It's uh, Dr. Sussman. Sussman. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no questions or comments, we move to the next person on our list which is John Bilchak, if you're here. He's not. We'll move to the next person, who is Laura Cabell. Cable? Cable. 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 Good try. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, not good afternoon. Good evening, chairs and distinguished members of the Connecticut Public Health Committee. My name is Laura Cable, and I was born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I currently live with my husband and our four children. In my professional life, I'm an educator and have spent over 20 years serving families in city schools across the country as a teacher, administrator, and district curriculum leader, including Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven. 
In my volunteer life, I have worked as a gun violence prevention advocate with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America for the past six years, working with a variety of incredible and impactful community gun violence prevention groups. I am here today in support of 5317 to study the sustainability of funding for Connecticut's community gun violence intervention and prevention program. I started my career in urban education over 20 years ago because when I was a child, a member of my family involved as a teenager with street groups was responsible for a gun homicide in Bridgeport. The differences between our lives in terms of the choices that seem possible and available to each of us struck me deeply and ultimately led me into the classroom with a resolve to help my students find a way or make one to build the lives they wanted. While I love my education work, as I continue to watch the number of students who lost loved ones to gun violence increase year after year, it became clear to me that I needed to get involved much more directly in the fight to end gun violence. Each year in Connecticut, an average of 211 people die from gun violence and 308 are wounded. In America at large, we see 120 people die from gun violence and 200 wounded by guns daily, with a person being killed every 12 minutes with a gun. While our Connecticut numbers are considerably lower, the picture is quite different when we consider race. In Connecticut, Black people are 27 times more likely to die by gun homicide than white people, compared to 12 times more likely nationally. We know that the majority of gun homicides across the country are happening in our cities, which is why consistent and adequate funding for this program is so critical. This program ensures that local grassroots groups like YANA, Project Longevity, Street Safe Bridgeport, Compass Youth Collaborative, and Mothers United Against Violence have the support they need, including increasing their staff and building their capacity. They do street outreach, group violence intervention, hospital-based violence intervention, and cognitive behavioral therapy. I firmly believe that given the billions of dollars in profits that the gun industry makes each year, placing a small excise tax on the sale of guns and ammunition is appropriate in order to ensure reliable funding for the life-saving work being done by these groups. Over the past six years, I have found works of organizations such as these to be life-saving, inspiring, under-celebrated, and inconsistently funded. I implore you to pass 5317 so that we can address the critical funding piece and so that these groups can go about their work of saving lives, particularly those of Black people living in our cities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Laura, thank you so much for your testimony. It's great to see our Bridgeport crew here. And I know Mark is right after you, Mark Donald, as you probably know. Yes. Um, Laura, I want to thank you in particular for highlighting the racial disparities in the fatality rates and the death rates. Um, it's really, it's something so important. And I appreciate you bringing that up in such a specific way. Also appreciate you calling out our local grassroots groups, particularly in our urban centers, and for your commitment and work um, is tremendous. So thank you for being here today to testify before us. Absolutely, thank you so much. We have one question, Representative Rennington Hughes. Well, first, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for being here so late. Um, I, I just have one question. Um, it, the, Funding that you get right now, uh, where does that come from? I know that you're referencing, you know, different ways of acquiring new funding, uh, mm -hmm. but where are you getting your funding presently from? So my understanding is that the funding that is there currently is not sustainable over the long haul. Um, Mark might be able to speak more uh, specifically than me, Mark Donald, who's coming up next. I can see him smiling at me in the Zoom um, to give you the specifics on where that's coming from currently. Um, but I do know that this bill proposes to study sustainable funding over the long term. Um, and that my understanding is what is there currently is not going to be sustainable year after year. And we're going to need the work of these organizations year after year. Sure. I just, you know, with nonprofits, you know, they do fundraising, they, you know, will have benefactors that that was kind of where I was trying to go with this. Yeah, no, I hear that. I think that what I've found is like, 
you know, it's a case of like competing causes always, right? Like where's the funds going to go? And like as somebody who works in charter schools um, and does like spends a lot of time thinking about where the funding is coming from philanthropy, um, it's just not consistent and it's not reliable. And we need consistent, reliable funding if we're gonna change that 27 times more likely number um, in terms of black people dying in Connecticut compared to their white peers. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Representative. We do have ARPA dollar issues in terms of the funding. So that is part of the issue that we face. Thank you, Laura, so much for being here with us today. Thank Next you. Up, we welcome Mark Donald. Nice to see you, Mark. Mark, we, for some reason, cannot hear you. Is your microphone turned on because you are unmuted? How about now? New yes. microphone? Yes, we can hear you now. Great. Apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Mark Donald, and I'm the executive director of RIASAP, um, which is the parent organization of uh, Street Safe Bridgeport, which uh, Laura Cable just mentioned. Uh, and it's great to follow her because Laura was part of our Youth Gun Violence Task Force, um, uh, received state funding up until 2022. Um, and then back in 2022, I actually, um, excuse me, I'm speaking in uh, support of Bill uh, 5317, an act funding a study of community gun violence intervention programs. <clears throat> um, so as I was saying, we had a youth gun violence uh, task force composed of uh, members of the police department, members of the community, grassroots organizations, uh, as well as uh, members of our Street Safe Bridgeport uh, program. Uh, in 22, Bridgeport was one of six cities across the country where youth gun violence went down. Uh, I actually wrote an op-ed asking why um, and advocating for public funding to study why. Um, and speaking to uh, Representative Reddington Hughes questions, part of our programming is publicly funded. Uh, part of it is privately funding. And uh, over the last year, um, our public funding has actually declined um, and we haven't been funded by the Gun Violence Commission at this point. Um, so the competition and uh, for funding in my role um, is, is super important and, and paramount. However, uh, regardless of the funding source, we need to study uh, what we're doing, uh, if it's working or not, and, and what are the factors that go in. Um, and certainly in, in Bridgeport, there are a lot of factors uh, involved in, in terms of proactive policing, in terms of um, the intervention efforts of our um, out gang outreach and gun intervention program at Street Safe. Um, but there's other factors involved, including the schools and the, the social emotional learning uh, efforts that led to a 10 year decline in suspension and expulsions. And young people who are in school are less likely um, to fall further off track. Um, but the, you know, the question is why and, and what can we point to best practices from a true public health perspective, uh, which is what makes me excited that, that this lives in public health because it is a public health issue. Uh, I had a conversation with a, with a mother one time in one of the public housing units who uh, lives about two miles away from me, who said that she asked for a move from one side of the projects, uh, as she used uh, the term, to the other because there's less shooting and she wouldn't let her 13-year-old son go outside. Now, if that's not an, a, a, a summary of a public health issue and its impact on gun violence uh, within the community. I don't know what is. Um, so studying these efforts, I think, gives us an idea of what the best practices are, how we can improve. Um, and that's why I think this legislation is so key as we seek to address it. Happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, I've long been a supporter of the work at RIASAP. And I know that you've done a lot of prevention work and you do work in prevention of all sorts. I'm thinking about opioids right now. We we talked earlier today about opioids and um, Connecticut is going to receive hundreds of millions of dollars to address the opioid epidemic. Um, we don't, we're not seeing that in the same way when it comes to the gun violence epidemic. So I wondered if you could talk just a little bit briefly because it's late and I know we do have a question from Rep Reddington Hughes 
in terms of you, you public and private dollars and the kind of volume just your organization has seen and on balance who's providing more funding to you at this point Right. And thank you. I only had three minutes on the first jump, so I couldn't speak about the hub or RBHAO, which works across the public health spectrum and opioid, cannabis, uh, other addiction services as well. So, you know, that program is mostly publicly funded um, and we do use that the those funds in terms of education and capacity building. Uh, in regards to that. And I think that, you know, for me, that's where this lives in the public health uh, arena, um, because so often we think of, of these issues as separate when they're so interrelated. Um, and when you have opioid deaths um, in urban environments, they tend to look a little bit differently, uh, particularly along, along racial lines um, <clears throat> that uh, Laura so eloquently outlined uh, overall, but um, our opioid efforts are entirely publicly funded. Your gun violence prevention efforts, in contrast, if you could just specifically. So um, we have a hundred thousand dollars in that. That's um, that funding is expiring, and um, other than that, we're about thirty percent publicly funded, seventy percent uh, privately funded, including funds from the the Dalio. Foundation, Connecticut Opportunity Project, um, which I don't know if that's been spoken about, the Unspoken Crisis Report, uh, which also in my estimation is also uh, a very much a public health uh, report aimed at uh, opportunity youth or disengaged and disconnected youth. Thank you for that. I highlight that in part because as we understand gun violence as the second leading cause of death for children in Connecticut, the first leading in the country, this is an epidemic for our young people, yet we are not investing in the same way that we are, and we need to invest when it comes to, for example, the opioid crisis. So I'm hoping that we can look at how we fund this going forward. Um, I think it's it'll be a difficult question, but it's a conversation worth having. Representative Reddington Hughes, followed by Rep Subkits. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Going back to the gun violence program um, and the monies that are allocated only to that, what percentage of those funds go to administration costs versus the programs? Uh, very little, um, probably about 10% uh, at the end of the day. Um, most of that administrative time uh, would be for back office support. Um, all of my time and all of the kind of senior management time is allocated to private funding. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Zupkis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I'm very glad to hear um, about the work you're doing in the inner cities because I know you're right, that's where a lot of the gun violence happens. And I live next to Waterbury and I pick up the paper every single day and it's always gun violence and people are still out on the streets and they're being arrested with guns in their cars and drugs and um, it is terrible. It's a terrible situation. Um, but in does your group um, or these groups, it, I always seem uh, when I see gun violence, it's always drugs involved. And so is part of your work uh, include drugs and, um, you know, a, a, arrest and juvenile, the crime, all of that really is compacted up together. Um, in every article that I read in the Waterbury paper, it's all of that combined. And I'm wondering, are y'all just focused on the guns or are, do you look at the whole picture? Because I do believe it's the whole picture. Um, so I think that that's a great question in regards to how it really is a public health issue. And, and certainly there is a component of, uh, of drugs and what, what we see. Uh, generally, it's, kind of, it's more territorial which can include some of the, the drugs and, and the sales. Um, but, you know, for, for us in Bridgeport, a lot of it's generational. Um, and you actually just jog something in, in my mind that I think speaks to Representative McCarthy Vahey. Um, uh, under RIASAP, we also run the Regional Suicide Advisory Board. 
um, which very much is a gun violence issue, and that is entirely publicly funded, right? And then if we talk about the demographics, the demographics of suicide, while they're changing a little bit, um, the, the people impacted by that tend to look like me, not like the victims of youth gun violence who tend to be black and brown young men. Um, so I think that's that's one thing we need to, um, uh, I, I think, lift up. Uh, and then, you know, it, especially when you're talking about um, urban gun violence, youth gun violence, um, some of it is impacted or does involve drugs. Uh, a lot of times when with the older gentlemen, um, one thing we're still seeing in the trends in Bridgeport um, is the, the victims of homicide and the perpetrators of homicide tend to be between the ages of 28 and 49. Um, and those instances tend to be later at night and often involve alcohol um, as the number one, um, but certainly other drugs as well. Well, thank you. So I guess drugs and alcohol, right? All of it. Um, alcohol is the biggest factor. Yeah. So I do appreciate it because it is a, um, it, it's, it's horrible is what's going on. And most of it, I do believe you're right. Uh, happens in the inner cities. Um, and we want to protect those kids. There was, you know, I read three articles in a row from the Hartford Current that um, a three-year-old was shot at drive-by and that's unacceptable and so there has to be something done um i and i believe it does consist of um you know not law-abiding citizens with guns but most of those guns are probably illegal um from what i've read and the drugs and the alcohol um all of that so it's a big task to undertake but it does need attention and i won't go into it now because i know it's getting late but i would like to know um, for example, when your organization started and the progress that has taken place. So um, at some point, if you could send that along or in all these agencies, it would be great to see um, you're being funded and what really um, has taken place with those funds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Representative Zupkus. And uh, that is exactly why we're doing this bill is to be able to take a look at some of the efforts that have occurred and what kind of effectiveness. And the one thing that is so wonderful about RIASAP and the Hub is they use data to inform their decisions. And I'm so glad, Mark, that you referenced alcohol as the number one factor because we see over and over again in the data that is alcohol far exceeds any substances uh, other substances in terms of these issues, the data that we see in our region, um, which obviously we share our region, supports that. In addition, the framing of gun violence in terms of suicide is so important, and I appreciate that. Um, and as you said, Mark, um, people who look like you, namely your age and your race, um, and we had a very sad and unfortunate incident in Fairfield. Um, just this week. So when we talk about gun violence prevention, I think it's important that we understand the full spectrum of issues when it comes to gun violence. And I appreciate you speaking to those issues. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Senator Omar. Thank you. I see Representative McCarty has unmuted himself. Is that because you had a question? And you get yeah, okay. He reads my mind very well. Um, I just wanted to make a Quick comment and thank you so much uh, for coming in and stressing the importance of uh, continuing to study gun violence and prevention and what programs work. I, I think it's such an important issue today and um, I'd like to just thank you for mentioning the relevance and the importance in our schools of looking at uh, social emotional learning. I know Representative McCarthy Vahey is a supporter as well, but that, we're, it, and you mentioned the word interrelatedness. We need to all collaborate and work together to end this scourge that we have. So I, I just wanted to take the moment to thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative McCarthy, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Donald. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is number 84, T.J. Clark. You're welcome. Come, welcome. Good evening, uh, Senator Anwar and Representative McCarthy Vehi and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. My name is T.J. Clark II. I'm a resident of Hartford, and I serve as the Executive Director at Connecticut Oral Health Initiative, formerly known as COHI, 
located in Hartford, Connecticut. Our mission is to strengthen and safeguard access to quality, affordable oral health services for all Connecticut residents. Our goal is for all residents to have equal opportunity to obtain services needed to maintain good oral health. COHI is the only nonprofit organization in Connecticut that solely dedicates its time to advocating for equitable oral health policies. Thank you for allowing me to testify in favor regarding House Bill 5320 and that concerning hospital finance assistance. Medical debt is a major growing contributor to the cycle of economic and health inequity. Racial inequities in income, wealth, and insurance coverage play a role in the prevalence and burden of medical debt. Financial assistance policies known as a charity care can help reduce how often patients incur medical debt and ensure that people eligible for assistance do not end up in collections. Black and Latino people in Connecticut are more likely to lack insurance or have a high deductible health plan due to a combination of factors resulting from systemic racism, such as disparities in employment and education. Inequities in wealth mean Black and Latino people are also less likely to have cash on hand to pay large, unexpected bills. Higher rates of insurance means the burden of medical debt falls disproportionately on Black, Latino, other communities of color, and immigrants. In Connecticut, roughly 280,000 people have medical debt, and currently 72% of people attribute their medical debt to bills from acute care, such as a single hospital stay or treatment from an accident. Medical debt can have significant impact on oral health in several ways. Deferred dental care, limited access to dental services, neglect of prevent preventative measures, impact on mental health, limited resources for dental insurance, interconnected health. In conclusion, medical debt provides a wide range of financial hardships and can create barriers to accessing dental care and maintaining good oral health hygiene practices. Addressing both medical and dental care affordability is crucial for ensuring comprehensive health and well-being. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before you and the committee, and I hope that you take my comments into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Clark, for your testimony. And yes, we will take your remarks into consideration. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is Dr. Thank you. Michael Crane, number 85. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vagy, Senator Somers, and the members of the committee. My name is Dr. Michael Crane. Uh, I've uh, been a radiologist in uh, Connecticut for the past 35 years, working out of Middlesex Hospital and our private offices, which currently uh, is just one uh, Guilford Radiology. Uh, I was also the past president of the Radiological Society of Connecticut. And uh, uh, also uh, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit uh, charity to promote compassionate healthcare in uh, Connecticut uh, called The Patient Is You. I'm offering brief comments to you today on Senate Bill 9, an act promoting hospital financial stability. I would like to confine my uh, comments to section four, uh, specifically uh, the line exempting CT scanners from the CON process. Otherwise, I surely support Senate Bill 9. From what I understand, Dr. Gifford had suggested that since all the CT CON applications in the past three years were approved, that the CON is not needed anymore for them. And I would suggest that this precisely is why we need CONs. Uh, I've been through the CON process various times from when I brought the third MRI scanner to Connecticut in 1989 uh, uh, to uh, our recent uh, CT and MRI scanners at Guilford, uh, that uh, the CON process, very wise people are on, uh, on the CON committees. And uh, I think that they, they have wise advice. Um, I think without the CT, CON, CT scanners will increase uh, in Connecticut and uh, new scanners will bring more scans. Uh, and whether this is in private equity or entrepreneurs, uh, I think that the number of scans will be done and may be unnecessary. Um, I, I look at my private office in Guilford as an example. About 10 years ago, all of the 
uh, CTs and MRIs were going to the, to the hospital systems and uh, Guilford Radiology was going to close because we couldn't do everything else we wanted to do and having unused uh, CT scanners and MRI scanner uh, in our office. Uh, we've always considered ourselves to be a high quality, low cost uh, uh, office. And uh, later, maybe about in 2017, 2018, the insurance companies realized that we were a better place to send their patients. And so we started to get the business again. And now we're doing fine, but we're no means at capacity. We do about 10 CAT scans a day, 10 MRIs a day. And if a CT scan uh, little office opened up across the street, uh, it would truly make our office unstable. Uh, and there's no need for it because we can provide plenty of scanning uh, for anybody who needs it. Um, and and which gets me to another point is that we uh, service uh, all our patients, you know, whether no matter what kind of insurance they have, Husky, Medicaid, and even if they have no insurance, we work out payment plans with them. Uh, and we're a full service organization. And Excuse I think- me, Dr. Kane, your time is up. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much, Dr. Kent, for your um, testimony. Can I just clarify, you, you talked about in the absence of a CON um, for CT scans, private equity will come to the state of Connecticut. Uh, what's the official position of Radiologic Society of Connecticut about private equity and radiologists working for private equity? Um, gee, I, I, I'm not an expert. I, you, you know, I don't, I don't know what the uh, uh, what the uh, recommendations are. I think that uh, our main concern as radiologists is to provide the best care, the safest care uh, to our patients. So um, uh, I I think that uh, you know if a private equity uh, firm owns a, a practice. Uh, you know, hopefully the radiologists will work to ensure that uh, the patient care is uh, is provided uh, at a highest level. Uh, you know, and particularly the uh, the safety issues. You know, um, uh, most of these scanners that are less expensive generally have more radiation. It's all the fancier scanners that have the technology uh, that we don't need to use uh, uh, the higher doses of radiation that we used to use. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, one thing I think is, is, is so important is that the sharing of exams, I know that uh, with Connie, we're going to be sharing exams a lot more. But, you know, at, at Guilford Radiology, for instance, we always share our CAT scans and we get their CAT scans with Yale, Middlesex, and, uh, and other centers, which also improves care and decreases costs. Uh, uh, you know, uh, by uh, not just doing our CAT scans in one little office, but uh, providing full services for our patients. So, so one of the reasons I think the Office of Health Strategies had requested this is that they don't have enough workforce and they are making decisions which have an impact on half a million population directly. And, and five to 7,000 people will lose their jobs based on decisions or keep their jobs based on decisions. And there are hundreds of CAT scanners across the state. They need to be upgraded. There needs to be a change. So if their limited workforce is going to start to look at the CAT scanners to give some security to some companies, there is a bigger picture that they are going to lose out on. And there's not enough bandwidth in the department to do it. I think that's a rationale. Do you want to reflect on that? Yeah, yeah I, I guess I'm not clear. You know, for instance, at Guilford Radiology, we could do 20 CAT scans a day. Uh, so uh, there's plenty of opportunity for patients to come to us. I, I mean, I know at Middlesex, we have various scanners and they could do a lot more at the hospital. But again, you know, that's, I don't do the scheduling there. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if scanners need to be upgraded, if anything, you know, that should be a, a, uh, a you know, so, you know, something that the government should, should promote, uh, that if they're old scanners, um, uh, but to add more scanners 
is going to put the current scanners out of business. And I think that's sort of what my concern is. And I know that that's the case in, in Guilford, because if somebody put a, let's say, a, uh, a mobile CAT scanner across the street, uh, they would make plenty of money. But uh, we would go back to doing three cases a day. And then all of our mammography, all of the, all of the low reimbursement items, that we, you know, studies that we do, uh, like lung cancer screening, uh, uh, mammography, breast ultrasound, those are very time consuming and uh, low in revenue, uh, you know. I want to ask more questions if you don't mind and just keep oh, sure. short. I just want to clarify a few things. Um, some One of the radiologists earlier made a comment that the new CAT scanners, if they are brought in, the mammograms would not be as good a quality. Uh, and I'm trying to understand, is the new technology or new CAT scans not good for that purpose? Or oh. it was just a... Yeah, no, 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 it's an interesting point. The, the CAT scans and the MRI scans help to support the office. Uh, it's very hard to have an office with just mammography, X-ray, and ultrasound. I don't think that, uh, you know, the office would survive. So by having a CAT scanner brings in uh, the revenue that we need and we sort of offset, you know, I mean, for instance, uh, we offset the, the one quarter of the payment from Husky, you know, and we do those because we can offset the cost to CAT scans, which are paying by the uh, insurers. So I don't think the mammography and CAT scanning have anything to do with each other. It's okay. the uh, it's just how uh, an office can stay profitable. Uh, th th I think that makes a little bit more sense to me because what was said earlier was that uh, uh, cancers are going to be missed because of the CON allowing CAT scanners to be there. So the quality of care is going to decrease. And, and, and uh, I could not make that connection, but I think there's a financial rationale for this that I can understand, but, but it was a care rationale I could not understand. So, but you've helped clarify that for me. Thank you for that. Um, and I think uh, Representative Clarence Dietrich has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today and clarifying some of our questions. One more is, are most of the radiologists in your society, um, are they hospital-based? Um, I would say that most are. Uh, they often have private practices too. Uh, like my group of, of, of 13 radiologists, uh, we used to have four or three different offices. Now we just have one, but uh, uh, it's it's kind of a nice uh, you know experience for a radiologist like myself to have both the hospital based where there's obviously a lot more severe uh, sick patients and then also do things like screening mammography and screening uh, uh, CTs and, and uh, the, in the private practice of radiology. Um, and as you all know, the, the private practice of radiology in private offices is a lot cheaper than uh, the hospital uh, exams. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And is there, is there a difference in, and if you have a workforce shortage in the hospitals versus um, offices, private practices? I'm sorry, was that? Is there a work for, do you, do you see a workforce shortage oh. in your hospitals versus private oh. practices? Oh, uh, no, I think that uh, uh, the workforce is, is stable. You, you know, it, it's not ideal. And, uh, you know, we surely do everything we can to bring in the best radiologists into the state. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, everything everything that the state does to make uh, Connecticut friendly or to doctors is is great, and we surely appreciate that. Um, but as far as uh, you know, the workforce, I think it's it's the same, uh, and uh, you know, we surely could do for a few more radiologists uh, <laughs> coming our way. But uh, so far, uh, you know, I think we're uh, getting the work done. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Crane, it's nice to see you again. Um, 
you said something earlier that I, I may have misheard. So I was just hoping that you could clarify when you're answering Senator Anwar's questions. You made a reference that uh, your practices share scans. I, I may have misunderstood, but were you indicating that there are some practices that don't share their patient scans? Well, um, uh, you know, and and I can only speak for my group, and I think, but I think that it's the way that all groups in Connecticut and uh, work, and all the radiologists that I know of, is that we believe in. Uh, not repeating studies that don't need to be repeated and to share exams uh, with other institutions. I mean, uh, you know, and for a while, you know, years where, you know, for instance, well, well uh, you know, a certain hospital wouldn't share with Guilford Radiology. And uh, we worked hard to promote that. And, and we now share freely. Uh, we send them exams, they send us exams, and it's within the half an hour. It's really, uh, it, it's remarkable. Um, what I would suggest is that if one wanted to make a lot of money, they could put a CAT scanner across from Guilford Radiology and just read them out. And that's not what we do. You know, we, uh, we, you know, if the CAT scan is done, we might look at the other studies that the patient has had. We might look on EPIC to see if, uh, you know, other institutions in Connecticut have it. Soon we'll be using Connie to do that. But uh, you know, that's just the philosophy that we have is we're a full service center. And I think most radiologists feel this way, too, and that we're, pr we're proud of what we do. We're not just a company trying to make money. So I think that that's what I'm afraid of without this CTCON is that people are going to come from anywhere and just open up a, a CT scanner, scan and dictate out the cases. No, and, and, and I appreciate that. Yeah. I just I, I wanted to be clear. Clear. Um, if you were saying that there were still groups who were not sharing what I believe are documents and scans that actually belong to the patient, mm. as opposed to the provider, I would have taken it offline and and discussed with you. I will. I know how to find you, Dr. Crane. I yeah. will talk to you at a more reasonable hour. Yeah. Um, can, can, can I just make one point? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a matter of how how quickly the scans are shared, you know, and the way we do it now, which within an hour, it's not a matter of putting in snail mail and getting it next week. So I think that that's where the sharing is is very important. Thank you. And I appreciate that we're a long way from uh, having to show up at an office and pick up a CD and hand carry it. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions or comments, we appreciate your testimony and staying with us for uh, this evening. Next on our list is number 86, Marilee Gober. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Public Health Committee. I am Marilee Gober. I'm a registered nurse with obstetrical expertise and an attorney with expertise in healthcare law. But disclaimer, I'm not licensed for either in Connecticut. I am here today as a board member of the National Lactation Consultant Alliance, where I volunteer my time in effort to improve patient access to the clinical care that lactation consultants are qualified to provide. I offer testimony today in support of HB 5318, but more importantly, I want to highlight that over 600 of your Connecticut physicians support this bill, as stated in a published letter from Dr. Carbonari. Your pediatricians recognize the need for this legislation. Thank you for raising this bill. I have no financial interest in lactation care for mothers and babies. My only interest is in wanting mothers and babies to be able to access competent clinical lactation care when they have breastfeeding difficulty. Because professionally, I have seen unmet needs and personally, I even experienced difficulty myself as an OB nurse needing help that I did not get. In the field of medicine and healthcare, licensure is the norm for independent clinical care. Physicians and insurance companies want to know that the allied healthcare providers to whom they are referring have been vetted by the state and possess the minimum level of education, training, and verified competency established by the state to provide the care allowed within a state scope of practice. 
Licensure of lactation consultants would give physicians and insurance companies a measure of protection from claims of negligent referral should harm result from care rendered by the lactation consultant. Without a license, referral from a physician brings risk of liability to that physician for the care rendered. Without licensure, lactation consultants are off the grid. They are not part of the healthcare team and many physicians will not refer patients to them. We want our mothers and babies to be successful with their breastfeeding efforts. With regard to harm and injury, mothers who fail at breastfeeding are at much higher risk of postpartum depression. They have higher risk of health issues later in life, such as diabetes, breast cancer, and stroke. And their babies are at higher risk for many illnesses too, ear infections, respiratory infections, even SIDS, just to name a few. Without human milk, preemie babies have much higher risk of neck, which is gangrene of the intestines, which can be deadly and which in fact does kill babies every year. Those guts cannot digest infant formula. Furthermore, misguided advice can cause infant dehydration, jaundice, and brain damage to full-term healthy babies. Excuse me, Ms. Gober, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gober. If you want to just finish your thought. Yes, I'm going to say that mothers too can suffer permanent and disfiguring breast damage from abscesses that are not timely recognized and treated, and that uh, we really support the licensing of lactation consultants to be able to bring this care to mothers and babies. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I will say too that the lactation consultants are the highest trained, lowest cost clinician who can do this work competently. Thank you. You're, you're a very passionate uh, advocate and I so much appreciate you. Thank you for the work that you do voluntarily and, and, and making sure that uh, our next generation is uh, healthy and well. Thank you. Seeing no questions or comments, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is Dr. Adam Kay. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Senator Anwar, uh, Representative McCarthy Vahey, uh, Senator Summers, Representative Claritas, uh, and members of the Public Health Committee. Thanks uh, again for allowing me to speak uh, the second week in a row. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam Kay. I'm a partner at Advanced Radiology Consultants uh, based out of Shelton, Connecticut, uh, and currently the chair of radiology at St. Vincent's Medical Center in Bridgeport. Um, you've heard from a bunch, uh, several of my colleagues from the Radiology Society of Connecticut already. Um, uh, and I'm also, uh, like them, here to comment on uh, the Governor's Bill Number 9, specifically Section 4, uh, related to the removal of certificate of need for CT scanners. Um, you, you've heard a, a bunch about us already, but radiologists and the practices we run uh, and the hospitals and the hospital departments we work for and, and the thousands of employees we have across the state are the gatekeepers of medical imaging. Uh, Connecticut has enjoyed many years of a CON process that protects patient access to high quality and highly available imaging. And if the need is there, it's worth our time and our money to bring a CON to be approved and open up even more access to this vi vital and life-changing technology. The effect of removing CON can be devastating, not just to patient access to other modalities, as Dr. Crane just eloquently outlined, but can also drastically alter imaging patterns for the worse. Next door in Rhode Island, they removed uh, the CON for MRI, and sure enough, every practice, orthopedist, neurologist, everyone wanted their own MRI scanner. They're profitable machines when they're used, uh, when they're used appropriately. Uh, but utilization also skyrocketed. And as you can imagine, if you have an MRI scanner, even if you're not you know, on the fence if a patient needs it or not sure a patient needs it, it's very easy to send the patient right around to the other side of the building uh, to get their MRI. And not always the same day as a lot of them would like to have you believe in this utopia of patient e easy and timely patient access. Most times you still have to make an appointment uh, for another time, another day, uh, just like you would with a radiologist's office. Um, we will see the same thing with CT sc CAT scanners here if this if the CON is uh, pr uh, process is removed. It isn't just the growth of imaging either. One can imagine, say, um, you know, an ENT surgeon has access to their own CT scanner, and all of a sudden more CTs are being done of the sinuses, which means more surgeries of the sinuses might be done. And you know, they are the gatekeepers of who needs a sinus surgery, but they need the input from a radiologist to make that decision uh, about what, what, patients, uh, what patients need sinus surgery and when they do. 
So this doesn't just increase the cost of health. Uh, uh, this so this this increases the cost of healthcare for all of us, not just in utilization of imaging services, but really in in, in utilization of all services uh, uh, across the board. Uh, so we're asking your consideration in allowing us to hold on to this gatekeeper role so that we can ensure that our important services make it not just to as many Connecticut residents as possible, but most importantly to the right residents and at the right time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate your input. Uh, seeing no questions or comments, uh, we'll move to the next person on our list. Thank you, Dr. K. Uh, Thank next you. Person is in person. Uh, Katia Ruesta Daly. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. I hope I pronounced your name accurately. Katia? Um, yeah. um, okay. Good evening, dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Behi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Katia Resta Daly, and I am a resident of Vernon, Connecticut, and I am also a graduate student at the Yukon Social Work Program. I stand in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. Medical debt is uh, significantly contributes to the perpetuating perpetuation of economic and health disparities with racial inequality in income, wealth, and insurance coverage, exacerbating its prevalence and impact. Policies offering financial assistance, such as charity care, can mitigate the frequency of medical debt occurrences and prevent eligible individuals from falling into collections. Since 2020, I've actively participated in the Husky for Immigrants campaign, mobilizing community members to share their impactful and often traumatic stories around healthcare access. Uh, a prevailing concern among them is the burden of an affordable hospital bills and medical debt. Half of immigrant adults potentially undocumented lack insurance, heightening their insusceptibility to medical debt. Immigrants and uh, limited English proficient residents here in Connecticut encounter hurdles in navigating financial aid applications. Additionally, emergency and hospital services remain the primary resource for undocumented in individuals, yet many face barriers to access it. It is imperative to enhance hospital financial assistance policies, ensuring affordability and alleviating additional stress and financial strain on community members seeking health care. There are about 280,000 city residents with medical debt, and nationally, there are 72% of Americans attributed their medical debt to bills from acute care, such as a single hospital stay or treatment for an accident. Six out of um, Six out of the, every 10 individuals facing challenges in paying medical bills possess health insurance coverage, yet remain unable to afford payments. Implementing eligibility screenings for insured patients can mitigate the frequencies of patients accumulating medical debt. This bill will ensure that patients can receive hospital financial assistance through more accessible and equitable avenues and prevent patients seeking care from getting into medical debt and putting them at risk of economic instability. I also request the committee support to incorporate language in the bill around hospitals offering a fair payment arrangement for individuals ineligible for assistance. This measure aims to prevent patients from sacrificing essential needs to settle their bills and can reduce hospital incurred debt. Additionally, granting applicants the option to submit alternative documentation to verify their income and, that, and assess eligibility for hospital financial assistance is vital. Lastly, enhance accountability by mandating hospitals to disclose race, ethnicity, and language data concerning their financial assistance allo allocations. These data should include details such as the recipient's assistance, the number of patients referred to collection, and those facing legal actions all categorized by our, um, the race, ethnicity, and language data demographics. Uh, such transparency can foster equi equitable access to financial support. Thank you for the opportunity in testifying um, in support of HB 5320, and I urge the committee to pass this bill favorably. Thank you. Gran testimonio, gracias. <laughs> um, very good. Uh, no questions, no comments. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Next uh, person on our list is uh, Himani Patisam. Patisam, welcome. Thank you. 
Dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Himani Patisam, and I'm a student from New Haven, Connecticut. I served as director of the Medical Debt and Insurance Counseling Department at the Haven Free Clinic, which is a student run free clinic affiliated with Yale University School of Medicine that serves primarily Spanish speaking patients without health insurance in the greater New Haven area. I also intern at the Health Department of the Serving and Documented Neighbors Division of IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services, which is a refugee resettlement agency with offices in New Haven and Hartford. IRIS strives to provide support to immigrants and refugees from diverse backgrounds and immigration experiences. Both IRIS and the Haven Free Clinic are members of the Husky for Immigrants Coalition. I stand in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. This bill is really important to me because I have seen firsthand the impact of charity care programs, such as the financial assistance program at Yale New Haven Hospital. At Haven Free Clinic and at IRIS, I have served patients and clients who lacked health insurance and could not afford to pay the high cost of their medical bills. Many of the people I have worked with have had incredibly difficult decisions to make. Often they were working multiple jobs just to avoid having to choose between putting food on the table for their children, paying their rent, affording necessary medications for chronic illness or paying their medical bills. These people would qualify for financial assistance, but they are often instead overwhelmed by the lengthy application process and lack of transparency. I have worked with patients who are fearful of seeking care in the future because they had received letters and calls from debt collectors. Many patients do not know that they qualify for financial assistance or even that these programs exist to help people just like them. At Haven Free Clinic and IRIS, I have seen firsthand the struggles patients and clients face when trying to apply for financial assistance programs at other healthcare institutions. And sometimes patients cannot complete the application process, despite the fact that their income would qualify, because the process requires that they provide documentation showing that they have been denied health insurance coverage. Many patients are aware that they do not qualify for health insurance coverage, and this application requirement dissuades patients who would otherwise qualify from financial assistance from even submitting their application. This bill would ensure that our patients and clients can go through a transparent and centralized process that would make financial assistance programs at hospitals more accessible so that patients are not afraid to seek the care that they need. Some of our patients and clients are repeatedly denied despite qualifying for financial assistance on the basis of their income because of the lack of transparency and accountability through this process. Creating an oversight entity would greatly help to ensure that these programs are accessible to the people who need them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 5320 and act concerning hospital financial assistance policies. I strongly urge the committee to favorably pass this bill. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Himani. Very, very well said. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, seeing no questions or comments, we will move to the next person on our list, which is Ellen Crofts. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, uh, Vice Chairs, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Ellen Shara Crafts, and I have been a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America for over six years. I'm before you today to ask to pass HB 5317 to require a study concerning funding for and effectiveness of the Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Program. The issue of gun violence prevention in all its forms is extremely important to my family. I lost my father to suicide by gun. My dad's access to a firearm on one very bad day ensured that that day would be his last. I'm an advocate for gun safety for my family, for my daughter, in memory of my dad, and also because everyone deserves a life to live safe from gun violence. My family moved to Weston, Connecticut in 2021 from California, and my husband and I are so happy to be raising our daughter here. We frankly chose Connecticut as it had strong gun safety laws, but I know personally that laws alone can't and won't keep citizens safe. In Connecticut, in an average year, 211 people die by guns and another 308 are wounded. And in the volunteer work I do, I personally see time and time again, the gap between gun violence intervention work and legislation a gap that you can help close in part with authorizing this study and giving a commitment to sustain sufficient funding for the community gun violence intervention and prevention program that the legislator create, legislature created in 2022. We know that CVI programs are evidence-based 
backed and critical tools that can reduce gun violence across our state, but most importantly, in our cities of New Haven, Hartford, and my neighbors in Bridgeport. These cities are disproportionately impacted by everyday gun violence. And the data shows us that in Connecticut, black people are 27 times as likely to die by gun homicide as white people. And that's compared to 12 times nationwide. This is a public health crisis on so many levels. And in addition to the immeasurable human suffering, gun violence is costing Connecticut taxpayers millions of dollars every single year in healthcare, law enforcement, and other expenses. A current estimate has that cost at 51.7 million paid by taxpayers, uh, which is part of a total cost to Connecticut of 2.6 billion each year. So this is something for us to consider. The gun industry makes billions of dollars in profits each year while our state and communities quite literally pay the price in physical, emotional, and economic costs. I would suggest when the study is conducted that we also look to the gun industry as a source of funding. As it was recently done in California, Connecticut could impose a small excise tax on the sale of guns and ammunition in Connecticut and direct this revenue to support CVI work in the state. You could thus ensure reliable funding for community violence, uh, gun violence intervention and prevention program. And to note, Colorado, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, Washington and New Mexico are among the states where law lawmakers are currently considering similar bills. The time for more study on this in Connecticut is now. Data from around the around. nation shows us that when adequately resourced and properly implemented, community gun violence intervention strategies can produce the most important goal. Double Excuse me, Ms. Crafts, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Crafts. Uh um, do you have a written testimony uh, as well with some of the data that you are sharing? I do. I submitted that as well. Okay. Th thank you. This is very helpful. Um, uh, Representative Clarice Dieter has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today. Can you clarify, you just mentioned that you named a, a few other states. I don't know if you said California, Colorado, Vermont are doing similar legislation. Are you talking about the study or are you talking about taxing ammunition? I'm talking about taxing ammunition, the excise tax. It's currently passed in California, and those other states are currently considering some low legislation. Do you know what um, percent of the excise on ammo was in California? I do not. I have that data. I can send that over to you, though. Okay, I can't great. quote it at this call. Testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chief. you. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Representative Gavros de Cox. Um, I admit it's more of a comment, but I will be brief. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm very sorry for the loss of, of your father. That had to be incredibly difficult. Um, and second of all, we uh, I don't know if you're aware, but we are actually looking at an uh, ammunition tax in the Finance Committee. It's uh, HB 51, um, I'm sorry, I have to put my glasses on, 5114. So um, that may be something that you would be interested in testifying on as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time and for your questions. Thank you. So um, I don't see any other questions or comments. We appreciate your insight and I'm so sorry for your loss as well. Next, Thank you. next person on our list is number 91, uh, Mariela La Rosa. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, um, Senator Anwar and Representative McCarthy Vehi and other distinguished members of the uh, Public Health Committee. My name is Mariela La Rosa and I am the executive director of the um, Health Assistance Intervention Education Network, also known as HAVEN, which is Connecticut's health and monitoring program for our state's licensed healthcare professionals. Thank you for allowing me to testify this evening regarding House Bill 5058, an act adopting the Nurse Licensure Compact. Um, HAVEN's position regarding this compact is um, set out in the written testimony uh, previously submitted to this committee, and I would like to adopt that written testimony in full. What I would emphasize um, this evening is that Connect, um, HAVEN can support House Bill 5058 with two important caveats. First, it is very important that we have some assurance that nurses practicing in Connecticut can continue to access Haven services and to do so confidentially as allowed under existing Connecticut law. A pathway to allow this seems to have been identified. 
uh, though it does require some additional language be added to the compact legislation that states that a nurse can deactivate the multi-state compact license and revert to a single state license at any time for any reason or for no reason and without disclosing the reason for the deactivation. This would then allow the nurse to engage with Haven confidentially under existing Connecticut law without the need to self-disclose the engagement with Haven to the licensing board or to the compact uh, commission and the, the data um, based system that it has. The other um, major um, concern for Haven and the other condition here is that the projected revenue loss to Haven resulting from this compact uh, needs to be uh, addressed, preferably in a manner that's statutorily mandated and that is sustainable. The, um, the projected loss to Haven um, from this uh, compact is in the range of $175,000 to $200,000 per year. That's a loss um, from the uh, licensure fee revenues that Haven currently uh, receives. And this is about 18%, uh, sorry, it's actually about 15% of Haven's operating budget. This is especially important right now because over the last year to two years, we have seen an approximate 20% increase in referrals to Haven. Uh, so we're actually looking at having to increase our staffing and our resources, and we really could not absorb such a large hit to our um, to our operating budget. Uh, I just uh, would like to conclude by thanking um, two individuals who worked very hard um, to to try to find solutions to these issues. So thank you to Claire Botnick and Claudio Galtieri for working diligently with us uh, in coming up with uh, some solutions uh, to these issues. So thank you for your thoughtful consideration and I'm happy to entertain any questions though I know the hour is late. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Actually, many of us were waiting to have a conversation with you. So I'm so Great. glad you're here. First and foremost, you are doing some very amazing work. The entire team of people at Haven, you have kept healthcare alive in the state in many ways from individuals who are going through some tough times and you've been able to confidentially confidentially whilst protecting the patients, taking care of those healthcare workers. So I cannot thank you enough. We collectively cannot thank you enough for what you do every single day. You are not only a leader in the state, but you are a national leader. So I wanted you to hear that from us first. Thank you, Senator. Now, when you get so much good stuff done, then there comes a problem. The problem is... Um, how do we create a protection? And I think you've touched on this, but I wanted to clarify a few things. One, for the number of other compacts that we have passed, we have been able to figure out a way to protect the uh, confidentiality of those uh, healthcare workers. Is that accurate? That is, yes. So why are we treating the nurses so differently in our state? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you for that question, Senator. Actually, it's the compact uh, itself that treats the nurses differently. So um, this issue regarding access to Haven and access to our services in a confidential way um, is uh, rather unique to the nurse compact. The, um, the other compacts that have passed and been enacted in Connecticut do not contain the same language that we see in the nurse compact. In the nurse compact, there is specific language that precludes a nurse who holds a compact from engaging in a confidential alternative to discipline program. And if the nurse does need to engage with that program, the nurse is required to disclose this to the licensing board and the licensing board is then required to deactivate the compact and report the deactivation and the reason for it to the compact commission and the database, which I understand is accessible to all other states in the nurse compact. And so this is unique to the nurse compact um, statute or legislation. We don't see that language, for example, in the physician's compact. It's, a, it's actually not an issue at all. Uh, and so this is why this compact is, um, is, it is being treated differently because it does create an issue for the nurses. And the language in the compact seems to be in direct conflict with the existing Connecticut law. Our Haven statutes uh, require, in fact, mandate strict confidentiality. So this is the difference that we're having here and why we're needing to 
be creative in coming up with a solution. And uh, have have you been part of those conversations with the governor's office and, and the people who are looking at this? Absolutely, yes. And is it possible to make sure that the nurses are at, at that table too, please, to make sure that they feel comfortable going forward? Because this is um, this is going to be the lifeline for this compact if we fix this aspect. Yes, yes, of course, and and um, I, I, the nurses have been part of the conversation. Um, so uh, of course, I I will continue to um, do what I can to make sure that they are at the table. Um, there's a critical part of this discussion. And as as uh, we, I'm sure we're going to have more conversation around the compact and 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 the confidentiality. It's confidentiality is me mentioned twenty plus times or something in in the bill, where. Uh, there are there are quite a few current weaknesses in the way the bill is written right now. So we will definitely need a solution. And uh, uh, perhaps, uh, um, it, and if your testimony you wanted to modify things or send us to the committee, we would love to share it with the entire committee to see if there's an opportunity to find the way uh, and solution for this issue. The second big challenge is that your sustainability is critical to the well-being of healthcare workers in our state. Um, should this uh, public health committees look at how we can create plans for your uh, haven to get stronger and, and be able to also provide more care because the number of challenges in healthcare world with the, the trauma that the healthcare workers, the nurses are experiencing, the problems are increasing. And, and and so we need your sustainability as a very critical part. Can you speak to that and how can we help you there? Yes, thank you, Senator. So um, yes, so absolutely, um, I, I am respectfully requesting that this committee consider uh, the funding aspect uh, that uh, is is the result of this nurse compact. So as I said, as I mentioned, we are looking at um, between 175,000 to $200,000 per year uh, uh, of a uh, cut in our um, in our funding uh, from the licensing fee, and so this uh, this would not be um, um, doable for Haven. So Haven cannot absorb this large of a uh, a cut in its revenue. So we are actually meeting tomorrow with the interested parties to uh, attempt to delineate a more specific plan on. Uh, how to address this loss and how to keep Haven whole. So um, one idea that has come uh, that has been discussed um, is uh, the idea that Connecticut can, I, um, I believe, charge a uh, fee to uh, a nurse who is working in this state pursuant to the compact privilege. Um, and so if there is going to be that fee charge, then perhaps five dollars from that fee can be set aside to the Haven Fund, the way the current $5 fee is set from the license. Uh, so um, this this may be an option. I am not sure because I haven't seen the specific numbers. I don't know what the state is planning to charge for that compact fee uh, and whether um, you know this could work. But, um, but it is something that we are flushing out uh, and we are having, as I say, a meeting tomorrow for more specific discussion. Uh, so, um, so the funding is an issue, and and it does need to be addressed be before Haven uh, can definitively support this bill. Okay, this is very helpful. I I think many of the moving parts, if we can get clarity, that's going to help us uh, not having to have the LCOs change the bill too many times um, in this short yes. session. So. This would be important to keep us in the loop on, on some of these things. We appreciate your testimony. I think many of my colleagues may have had questions, but I probably asked some of them. So, and it's a late at night, so we'll probably have more questions later. So I appreciate you being here and thank you for the work you do. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. With that, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is number 92, Catherine Villeda. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Behe, Senator Summers, and Representative Clarita Zitria, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Catherine Villeda, and I am the Director of Policy at Health Equity Solutions. 
Health Equity Solutions is a nonprofit organization with a statewide focus on advancing health equity through anti-racist policies and practices. Our mission is for every Connecticut resident to attain optimal health regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. Unlike planned debts, such as mortgages, medical debts often result from unforeseen or emergency medical needs. No one should discover in the days or months after a hospital visit that the bill far exceeds their savings and be un unaware or too overwhelmed to apply for financial assistance prog programs designated to help, as we've heard many stories today. 72% of people attributed their medical debt to bills from one-time or short-term medical expenses associated with acute care, such as a single hospital stay or treatment for an accident at a hospital. At a hospital. For furthermore, medical debt not only perpetuates economic disparities, but also contributes to a cycle of health inequity and serious economic consequ consequences, such as access to credit and, decreased likelihood and increased likelihood of bankruptcy. Individuals burdened by medical debt experience heightened stress levels, poorer health outcomes, and often uh, are compelled to delay or forego needed medical care, which is particularly concerning for individuals with chronic conditions. Nonprofit hospitals are mandated to offer financial assistance to eligible patients, yet barriers persist. Connecticut hospitals have been progressively spending less on financial assistance, leading to a $339 million deficit in financial assistance and community investment compared to the value of their tax exemptions. This deficit amount could have wiped out medical debt for 69% of the roughly 280 residents, um, Connecticut residents with medical debt if hospitals had just spent their fair share on hospital financial assistance policies. Nationally, 45% of nonprofit hospitals send bills to patients eligible for assistance, contributing to over 2.7 billion in uncollected bills. Uh, this proposed bill would keep more Connecticut residents from incurring medical debt by setting standards for these policies, increasing awareness, and access to financial assistance and ensure compliance with hospital financial assistance policy requirements. Um, I know you all have heard a lot about what this bill already requires. I'm going to jump to um, explain a few recommendations and amendments that we would like to see in the bill to make sure that it is uh, more effective and comprehensive including providing flexibility for applicants to submit al alternative documents to verify their income for eligibility de determination as in Illinois and Colorado. Um, flexibility is especially important for individuals who do not get paid with pay stubs, who may be a survivor of intimate partner violence, or may be experiencing homelessness. Additionally, we recommend that hospitals should be required to direct patients to the Office of the Healthcare Advocate long, long before they are ever sent to a collections agency. Um, and furthermore, we also ask to enhance the, requ um, enhance the requirements uh, for hospitals to report the, the data that they would be reporting on financial assistance to be broken down by race, ethnicity, and language data as it relates to how, financial how much financial assistance they offer. This is already done in Colorado and in Maryland. Excuse um, me, Ms. Valida, but your time is up. Thank you. I will wrap up. The last thing I will add is that we also recommend that um, hospitals should be allowed to submit corrective plans with the Attorney General's office to make sure that there are ongoing conversations um, if corrective action ever needs to be taken. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony in strong support of HB 5320. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, for your testimony. We appreciate uh, you staying with us and, and still having the smile that you had this morning. So that's uh, miraculous. I appreciate the full room. A representative has a question for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying with us. Um, I just had a question I was hoping that you could answer. You are not the first one who suggested alternative income verification. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what you think that would look like so that we can can offer patients the uh, benefit of the doubt, and mm -hmm. but yet still maintaining um, fairness amongst individuals who would be submitting income verification. So what do you envision? So we, um, we elaborate briefly on this in our written testimony. One of the examples that we provide is that they can ask their employer for a letter attesting to the fact that the patient is employed, and the their rate of payments, right? So this might be for somebody who might be getting paid in cash, for example. So a let like a notarized letter might be a way for someone to um, attest and confirm their their income. Sure. And and 
any other suggestions? Yes, I am drawing a blank at the moment. There's like, you know, we can ask for like tax return documents um, that might, you know, it's uh, for people who might have W-2s, but also people who will have ITIN numbers, so like a tax ID number. Um, so that might be like a 1099 form, for example, versus a W-2. Um, and then we have also um, recommended, I can send more information, my apologies. I'm just like drawing a blank at this nope. point. I realize it's late. <laughs> it's late, you, yes. If you could send that. Um, yes, I'm happy to, to send the, over to more. The, to either myself or the, the committee um, administrator, that would yeah. be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Carpino. Thank you, Gating, for your testimony. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. And with that, we'll move to the next person on our list, uh, which is Kim Sandor. Welcome, Kim. And thank you for being here in person. I know you were here all day in person, but then you had to attend to something at home. So uh, yes. outside. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, hello, everybody. Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vahey, and the esteemed members of the Public Health Committee. It was great to see some of you um, up there today. I did run home so I could watch my son's first college lacrosse game tonight, which was a W. So it was very exciting and um, appreciate being able to connect with you by Zoom. We're here tonight to um, provide some testimony in opposition to HB 5058, an act adopting the nurse licensure compact as written. And I am very appreciative of uh, Marielle LaRosa, the executive director of Haven and John Brady with AFT who have recently testified and provided a lot of background um, on this. So I will try and hit the high notes. Um, as stated, all compacts aren't created equal. I think you've heard that the RNLPN compact is a little bit tricky. It has has some uh, restrictions on it in the actual standard language that needs to get dumped into every state law. And it's that language that's really causing some issues for us. Um, and these issues, um, you know, aren't new. Um, we've been exploring the compact since uh, 2018 when it was finally updated after about 18 years. We worked with NCSBN, state partners, people across the country who've had the compact for 20 years and two years to figure out, you know, how's it going and how are you handling some of these issues? We participated in the 2022 advisory on compacts same issues, no real solution, no real uh, ideas for how to make any changes in it. While we support the concept of interstate healthcare licenses, each compact really needs to be considered individually and the implications of adopting them under understood. Our big issues um, are the two, we have two major issues and then a handful of smaller issues. And the two major issues are really why we say tonight that we are in opposition of the compact as written. While Mariella alluded to hearing about some uh, fixes and addressing the, the, the funding, um, we have yet to see it. And we do not feel that we can offer support for it when for so long we've been looking for some sort of a solution and haven't been able to see it. So we really need to see what is being offered and see how it, how it works with the NCSBN compact and what that looks like getting implemented um, in the state. So the two major issues I'm going to start with first, and I'll go into the other little ones. They um, are required about the confidentiality and the funding to Haven. And really, these tweaks are so that Connecticut can not go backwards. This is all supposed to be about moving forward. And adopting the compact as is really moves things backwards for the health, nursing healthcare workforce in the state. The loss of confidentiality is Senator Onward are so appreciative you read our stuff 24 times haven was established for confidentiality it is the word confidential is included 24 times that's how important it is to the healthcare workforce that when people um, have a need to get help, they can get confidential services, just like anyone else. Why does it have to go on a public record um, and be there for other people? Let them get their services and get the help they need. Um, and so that that is not okay for nurses to not be treated like any other healthcare professional and lose this confidentiality. It really needs to be maintained. The second is the piece on uh, funding. So right now, I think it's a little confusing, but 
we have to over 26,000 nurses that Connecticut licenses that live out of state and they live in states that have a compact. So if Connecticut implements the compact, if those 26 nurses that live in those compact states that get a compact license no longer need to purchase a Connecticut license. So Connecticut loses the $26,000 in the 26,000 nurses that are buying all the money from those 26,000 nurses buying a Connecticut license, plus Haven's losing the five dollars on those you know whatever percentage of those nurses leave so it's a it's, it's a it's a huge consideration and it kind of needs to get figured out as Mariella said it is critical to haven funding because the state has never paid for haven funding the only reason haven gets that money is because the healthcare professionals agreed to an increase in their licensure fee so that the state could collect money to give to haven so it was always something from the health professional side the little issues, I say, uh, are more related to things that we've heard from Excuse across the me, country. Excuse me, Sandor, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to talk fast. <laughs> well, uh, Kim, tell, tell, tell me about these minor issues. Well, one of them is just a loss in revenue to the state. We don't want to see the licensure fees for nurses in the state to go up extraordinarily to so the state can recover the money they're losing. We, we don't want to see that happen. Data, right now, Connecticut is just, people look up to Connecticut with such admiration because we have wonderful data about our nursing workforce. These 39 states and two territories that are collecting data wish they had the data we have. And what happens is that when someone goes into the compact, they're no longer buying that Connecticut license. So we have no data about who's coming into our state to work on the compact. So we're just recommending that employers actually register nurses that come into the state working on the compact. So the state has data on who's coming in under the compact and knowing who's actually working there. The other pieces around scope of practice, nurses, um, their scope of practice, RNs and LPNs vary across the country. And the compact puts a response responsibility on the individual nurse to know the scope of practice of the state that they're working in. Now, it's a scope of practice is kind of a this um, thing that's thrown around. But uh, let me give you a hard example. In some states, LPNs do dialysis, right? So if an LPN comes here and they think they can do dialysis or an RN's working with an RN, they do dialysis and they delegate that, they're working outside the scope of practice in Connecticut. So that puts our patients at risk and it puts our nurses at risk. So we think that as a nurse is coming into the state to work with their compact license, that their employer it tells them they have to take um, a module so that they can learn about the the Nurse Practice Act in the state of Connecticut. And we're totally happy to help with that, but we think that's a huge protection for the nurse as well as it is for the patients in the state. And fingerprinting is the last thing, which I know you guys know is an issue in the state, but we don't have fingerprinting for um, FBI fingerprinting, um, which a lot of other states have it already, you know, and so the system is really well worked out. Um, but for, you know, FBI fingerprinting for that, you know, tens of thousands of nurses, um, you know, we, I don't know the state's capacity for that. And I think the state should be, you know, really well prepared uh, if they're going to implement the compact to have a plan to make sure that how that's going to happen. So it actually, you know, it happens. So those are the other, other things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Representative Cook has a question. Hi, Kim. Thank you. And um, I'm going to be brief. And you answered part of my question, but my other question would be this. So the thoughts on the compact solving the problem on our shortages in the healthcare industry, um, what is your thoughts? And before anybody around this desk, um, you know, gives me more dirty looks, make that answer quick. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it quick. <laughs> Um, yeah, does it? I, you know, who knows? Um, you know, the, as John said, the door swings both ways. We did a quick survey of our members. 75% were excited to say, oh, we could get the compact. Um, and they had nothing that they wanted to do with it. They just thought it would be cool to have. But when we educated them that the compact could bring with it the loss of con confidentiality with Haven, they were like, whoa, that's got to be solved. And so, you know, I think that um, travelers have always come into our state. I mean, back a long time ago, I've been nursing now, 
and we've always had travelers in our state. And you guys have done a tremendous job to make it easy for nurses coming into the state to get their license within two weeks. So, you know, people coming into the state, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, you know, thinking about telehealth and where the future of nursing is going, I think we do need to find a solution. I think we need to take the time to get the right solution. I think we all need to see the right solution. I think we need to vet it and think about it and make sure that all the issues are being addressed so that we're moving forward and we're not creating new problems, but we're really being smart. We're learning from other people's problems and issues that they've had in implementing this. And we are getting on top of it before we start having problems in our state, which sets us up for continued excellence. Thank you. I appreciate that, your dedication to the cause and congratulations to that uh, first victory tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kim, uh, I, I, if you feel that you're not part of the conversations, please reach out to us. We, we really Thank want uh, things to move in the way the nurses are protected. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, next person on the list is uh, Kerry Rysian. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, afternoon, evening, and now night. Uh, I usually teach at night, so this is perfectly fine. We'll be your class tonight. Oh, welcome. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, um, that's wonderful. Uh, well, good evening, morning, whatever time it is, uh, distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Dr. Carrie Racian, and I'm pleased to submit testimony supporting HB 5317, an act requiring a study concerning the funding for and effectiveness of the Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Program. Uh, I'm an associate professor of public policy at the University of Connecticut and the director of UConn Center for Advancing Research Methods and Scholarship in Gun Injury Prevention, or ARMS. My expertise is causal program evaluation. I'm also a member of Connecticut's Commission on Gun Violence Prevention and Intervention, and I co-chaired the commission's subcommittee on data and evaluation. I'd like to thank Senator Moore, each of you, the full assembly, the governor and his staff, and the Department of Public Health for all their efforts in building and sustaining the commission and its work. ARMS supports this bill and indeed believes it's critical to creating the infrastructure that is necessary to ensure the continued and effective prevention and intervention of community gun violence here in our state. UConn is further committed to having ARMS work with DPH and anyone at the commission um, and community programs to develop, implement, and evaluate strategies intended to help reduce gun violence in Connecticut. I think we can all appreciate how important community violence programs are, but I'd like to use my, talk, my time to talk about the importance of evaluation of these programs. Programs should carefully consider how they're going to intervene, what that intervention uh, would do and why it's expected to work, and how they're going to measure it. Programs must also define evaluation, which can be categorized broadly as either a process or outcome evaluation. A process evaluation measures how well another program is followed uh, based on a particular design. An outcome evaluation is what tells you if something is effective. And it's hard. Uh, and it requires funding. Uh, did the program actually reduce gun injury and violence? Being able to answer that question is really important if we want to know if a program is working. Ideally, evaluations, these two kinds of evaluations, works together, and it's important to know if the program is being offered as intended and if it works. Funders, political officials, and citizens want to know the answers to these questions, but so do providers. But knowing requires an evaluation, which requires sustained investment. I've had the privilege to work with many of these programs in Connecticut, and I can confidently say providers want to know if what they're doing is effective and they want to know what they should do more or less of because they have scarce resources. In my, in my um, expertise though, evaluation is hard. It's program design, data measurement, data collection, and data analysis. And a study like the one proposed in HB 5317 would help programs engaged in community violence interruption work measure their effects and understand how to improve their already good work. But many of them would need outside evaluation support. Many of them don't have evaluators on their staff. One potential model is for ARMS to work like a National Institute of Health or NIH data coordinating center. In the NIH model, ARMS would work with DPH to identify evidence-based programs 
work with programs to create that data evaluation plan, ensure evaluation data is properly collected and consistently collected across programs, and help programs demonstrate their success for future and sustainable funding. Excuse me, doctor, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. I would just end by saying that ARM seeks to be a resource in the state, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I do have some answers to other questions that were asked. I'm happy to share that or submit it in an email later, knowing the um, the hour of the I, night. I do have a few questions, and it'll be very fast. Of course. Um, how are you funded? Um, so ARMS is funded largely through internal investment at UConn as infrastructure. It's very difficult to get infrastructure dollars from external sources, uh, especially at an R1 university. R1 universities usually fund particular research tasks. And so currently our funding comes from the indirects from those research grants and then internal investment from our um, OVPR office. And and uh, do you have NIH grants? I'm sorry, what? Do you, do you have NIH grants? We do not currently have NIH grants. You may know that only recently did federal funding become available for gun violence prevention work. And the NIH has released very few calls for this kind of work. Um, and the University of Michigan uh, received the Coordinating Center grant uh, that was recently administered um, or given out through NIH. So, so no, we do not have one of those, but we know the model quite well. And the funding that we are talking about is not going to impact you, but your work helps us identify where it would be very effective. Is that fair? Yeah. So we don't really stand to gain anything here, um, except, you know, if evaluations do cost money and whoever does that would need funding to uh, do that evaluation. Um, currently, I serve on the commission as a volunteer and as a part of my UConn arms duties and would be happy to continue to do that. But the evaluation itself would require sustained investment. I, I heard a lot about the work that you've been doing. So I wanted to just uh, thank you for the work you're doing. If you can take one minute to answer some of the questions that you feel that we should have that we had asked. Sure. The only, um, the main question I wanted to answer was about the tax um, in the California data, which came from this side of the room. Sorry, I was face behind you. Uh, it's an 11% tax, which is similar to the federal tax, which is between 10 to 11% based on the type of ammunition. Uh, California's is 11%, um, and it's estimated to raise $160 million um, every year. Um, that is from Johanna Schubert. She had that in her notes. Perfect. Uh, Representative Kennedy has a question. Uh, just a comment. Did you submit your uh, testimony in writing as well? Our, the government relations submitted on my behalf. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And as uh, the, uh, Senator Anwar suggested, could you put the what you just gave us in writing as well? So, uh, it's in Johanna's uh, testimony, but I'm it happy did, to follow okay. up with an email, right, but perfect. it is in her written testimony. She just didn't have time perfect. in her three minutes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> no. So that's separate. Okay, good. And you're done with your question, Representative Kennedy? Okay, my co-chair has a question and then Representative Ewan. We have a squeaky mic because we heard the squeaky mics get the money, so. Squeak oh. away. <laughs> oh, the squeaky mic gets the funds. Um, thank you, Senator Anwar, and uh, thank you uh, for being here with us, for staying all day. So just in terms of how we structure this group and this body. Um, we heard earlier a conversation about having the commission kind of direct the conversation. There's you, there's creating another group. I don't really like to duplicate efforts, um, but I just wondered if you wanted to share your thoughts about that in terms of, you, for example, you said you co-chair the subcommittee on data and evaluation. So when I hear that, I think, well, maybe the subcommittee on data and evaluation is a good place to have some of this conversation because we're looking at sustainability of funding and the ability to evaluate, which th these things go together. But if you could just comment a little bit about that. Yeah, happy to. Um, So the subcommittee on data and evaluation uh, right now is making recommendations on what evaluation would look like. It doesn't itself have the capacity to carry out an evaluation independent um, with without funding or without sort of um, infrastructure, which I think DPH would be well positioned to help 
um, secure and to not duplicate services. I do think that this kind of study would be well placed in a place like DPH. I think the kinds of programs that are currently funded through the commission um, really vary a lot in terms of how they seek to move the needle on this issue. And I think it requires an interdisciplinary um, sort of suite of expertise and tools, um, but they all seem to comport with the sort of public health prevention model. And so um, I think it's well-placed in DPH. I think it does need to be thoughtful about how those pieces work together, but I think the basic sort of tools um, are already there. It would be a matter of, you know, how you actually execute the study in a way to ensure that the question is answered. Not only that the state wants to know, is our investment working? But as I alluded to in my remarks, to answer what the providers want to know, which is, am I doing my job, right? Like every community violence interrupter program that I've ever met, and I'm a formal social worker, <laughs> like we feel a calling to this work. It's really important to know, is it working? And without this kind of investment and evaluation, we don't know, you don't know, citizens don't know, and we all deserve to know. It's not gonna work. <laughs> I just told you. Okay, uh, my, my uh, someone believes it's not going to work. I, I, I think evaluation is powerful. I think research design is powerful. Um, I think it's important to have um, an objective party conducting that um, evaluation though, right? And having DPH sort of overseeing that is I think important. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Senator Hamar. Um, thank you for that answer. Essentially what you're saying is we, in order to be able to do this properly, what we're looking to do in this bill, we, need resources to accomplish that. You do. We're going to need funding to actually be able to do this evaluation, which by the way, you know, as a local prevention council with a small, tiny grant from the state, we use, and we have a drug-free communities grant, which is from the CDC. We pay an evaluator locally to assure that we are achieving results in terms of lowering the number of children who are beginning age, you know, increasing age of onset for alcohol use. I'm just, I'm saying, I'm hearing clearly in a different way. What you're telling us is we've got to invest seed money essentially in order to be able to know how we can have that sustainable funding. And if what we're doing is effective. I think it's also important to, so there are eight um, mini grants that were funded through the ARPA H dollars. There are a lot of other programs that were not funded through the ARPA H dollars that may wish to apply for future funding. And then there are some for whom this call may not be well suited for, right? And the evaluation of all of those programs in a holistic way is something that's really missing in this infrastructure. And I think there's a lot of economies of scale of having that evaluation in a central, centralized place as opposed to having an evaluator for each of these programs where that data is not sort of culled together and thought about like, what are the measures that we are collectively interested in measuring? And if you have a different evaluator for each program, you're simply not going to have that, which is the NIH coordinating center model, which is to sort of pull this and pull it together um, so that you can have one training. So arms to send trainings for the programs, for example, right? So that there's one training, we do it one time, we have follow-up questions, we try to answer individual questions as well, understand all programs are different, but there are some things that all programs can hear and benefit from at one time. And that kind of economies of scale is really what's important in a scarce resource environment. So quick, very quickly, is there a plan to evaluate those eight programs at this point? Mm. Um, there is a, an RFP for the evaluator. It is um, in legal land somewhere being reviewed. The RFP for the evaluator for those programs has not yet been released, um, which is going to be problematic. And I don't think that was anyone's preference. It's just sort of how this happened and the need to get those ARPA H dollars out by a certain date. Ideally, you want an evaluation to happen before a program starts. So you have data measurements in place and you have a plan for measuring things in place. You also want baseline measures. Did it change something? I don't know, where'd we start? And so if you're not collecting that from the outset, 
it's going to be problematic. Thank you. Representative Wielander, followed by Representative Zupkus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, based on your research experience, uh, if this proposal goes through, uh, would the data and information that we gain be helpful in securing uh, additional mm -hmm. funding, uh, outside funding, such as the NIH or CDC or anything else? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the reasons I think that the evaluation is so important is to be able to tap into sustainable funding um, from probably not the sources that you've mentioned. I think there are funding sources that are more philanthropic um, and based in foundations that have been interested in funding this work. The federal government's dollars are, are pretty um, restrictive and well-defined based on just new historic uh, dating or data-driven practices. But I think there are a lot of um, opportunities for uh, outside funding but the programs need a plan to sort of, I view the mini grants as like pilot programs, right? It's not a lot of money. It's about $88,000 per program per year, right? In the scope of providing social services, when we're talking about something as sort of entrenched as gun violence, $88,000 can transform a program, but can it transform a problem? That's a different question, right? And so those dollars are a real opportunity for these programs to be able to think like, how can I measure this and demonstrate my effect and take it to a funder and then sort of really scale this up in a way that's much more effective. So, um, so, so yes. Okay. So simply put a, a small investment on our end now could potentially open us up to outside funding that would come in and it saved up money for the state in the long run. I think so. I mean, I do think a lot of um, philanthropies would want to see the state match those dollars. It is a, most of them have a scale up model. Philanthropy dollars are not infinite either. Um, but there are state dollars. There is a new um, initiative at the White House looking to make these programs more sustainable federally. So there's a little bit of a wait and see in this space, as you can imagine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your answers. Representative Zupkus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be quick. Thank you for coming. Um, I do agree with you that data is important and you can't measure it. You can't manage it if you can't measure it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these programs have been around already. Um, and so I'm interested in knowing what they're doing now. What is the measurements now um, that they're going for? And that doesn't take any money. I mean, they've been, since they've been in, in uh, uh, formation, what, where, where were they and where have they come from now? And what is the data yeah. That's what I'm interested in for now? So I would categorize that under a process evaluation. What is their process? What are they doing? What are their outputs and what are their outcomes? You can't infer from that necessarily that the program caused a change in those numbers. We may all re recall from introductory stats class that correlation is not causation, right? And when you look at those numbers and you're like, where did I go and where did I stop? That's that's really correlation. And it can be informative. And it's really have, hard to have causation without a correlation that's in the direction you hope it to be. But without a research design, you cannot fully attribute that change to the program itself. Okay. But and that and so that's why those um larger kind of evaluations um are important. But they should be evaluating themselves as they go. Should they have that expertise? There was another question about what amount of funding goes to administration. And a lot of times we don't like to see funding go to administration, but that's precisely what evaluation is. And so this is a really hard tension. And I understand. I I, I know all about nonprofits. Yes, and I know you do. funding yes. comes and I get it all. 100%. But we are constantly in the nonprofit that I work with, mm -hmm. we're constantly evaluating. We can always get better. But every year we're evaluating what are our benchmarks? Are we meeting our goals? And how do we move forward? And where's that funding coming from? So I'm interested in, okay, they've been funded all these years. What's happening? Yeah. What, no. what are the improvements on? And that doesn't cost us any money. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a hundred percent true. It might not call you any additional money, but it should be captured in your investments that you've already made. So I grant you it's not additional marginal dollars. That said, I don't, I don't know. I'm not evaluating those programs per se. I will say that the mini grant programs are required to provide a report to DPH, I believe once a quarter or, or every six months. 
they recently had a showcase where they're starting on that. So those will be available um, to both DPH and then the assembly uh, to know the change in those metrics. Right. Thank you. And I'll end with that because I'm a, I'm a believer that we should fund things that work and don't throw money after things that don't work. And we can't do that if we don't know if it's working or not. So um, full agreement. You. Professor, this was a good class for us. <laughs> and uh, uh, You were a very attentive group, uh, much more so than some of my students. And right. what time are we at? 8-11 on a, what even day is it? I don't even know. Oh my so, gosh. Same as way. long as there's no quiz, but thank you for nope. the testimony. And uh, this was very helpful. We appreciate you staying here all day and then appreciate your testimony as you obviously figured out how attentive we all have been. My pleasure. And I'm around tomorrow as well. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, your wait is over. Mr. Mike Waterbury, thank you for being here all day. I know you had to go to Awake and you're um, outside that uh, place in, in the car right now. So welcome, you're on. Thank you, uh, Public Health Committee, not only for the opportunity to speak, but also your endurance. Um, it's been an impressive day and a great experience. So um, I am the chairman and CEO of Good Group, which is a community of companies working to reinvent healthcare one system at a time. I'm going to kind of cut to the chase and spare you all the statistics because a lot of people spoke very eloquently about it all day. Um, medical debt in this country is a public health crisis and financial assistance plans programs are not working. So we applaud what you've proposed in House Bill 5320. Uh, uniform application will help for sure. Reporting and accountability will help for sure. I think the one thing, and maybe you heard it from one of my colleagues earlier today, that we think is important to add to the bill is a uniform online application process for everybody in the state of Connecticut, for all the nonprofit hospitals in the state of Connecticut. We think that would significantly improve the access and really the effectiveness of financial assistance plans. So other than that, the bill is is going to help, so we, we support it. But if you could consider adding that, that we think that would significantly improve uh, really the health and well-being of the, the residents of Connecticut. So that's really all I wanted to add. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to to speak to you all tonight. Thank you. So uh, help us understand this a little bit. Um, if How does your model work and how is it going to help the, the citizens who are uh, impacted under the um, medical debt? Yeah, I mean, I think financial assistance plans and programs are are in place today that that should help people who can't afford to pay for care where they don't have insurance. The challenge is, is that they're not easy to access and they're not uniform. Um, and they're not always, you know, they're usually buried in a hospital website through a link that leads you to a paper application. So we believe that one single place to go that could be promoted in a lot of different ways that gave residents a very easy way to understand if they qualify and then a very simple way to upload documents and complete the application will significantly improve the accessibility and the effectiveness of financial assistance plans. So that's that's really what we've seen across the country as we work with hospitals. Um, if you make it available online, you promote it um, and you support people through the process, they'll apply, they'll be aware and they'll when that when, when appropriate, they'll get approved and they won't go in a, into medical debt. Okay, so so um, I, I think your, your testimony is helpful. It, it tells us there's more than one way to assess and manage this situation. I think at some point it would be worthy to sit down with some stakeholders, including yourself, to get a better understanding of um, how we can create uh, some model that may be effective and, and organized. Yeah, no, we'd welcome that opportunity. And I think, you know, we're doing this across the country today and feel like we could support the residents uh, of Connecticut through just a very simple to use online portal that feeds into every one of the nonprofit hospitals in the state of Connecticut. So happy to do that. And uh, again, I applaud what the state is doing with House Bill 5320. And um, financial assistance, not the complete answer. We have a lot of problems, but it, it will help lower income families and, and patients in the state of Connecticut avoid medical debt. Okay, thank you so much. My co-chair has a question.
Thank you, Mr. Waterbury. Thank you um, to my good co-chair. You referenced that if this was online and promoted that more people would actually make the application and that you're doing this in other places around the country. Do you have any data that you can share with us to help make the case with the data? Yeah, in our testimony, we, we, we provided, we've done a number of surveys around this. Um, you know, part of the challenge ultimately is that people are unaware of financial assistance and it impacts people not only are uninsured, but also are insured. I mean, one of the biggest trends is that, uh, you know, with high deductible, people are aware that not only they're going to all. Mr. Waterbury, you're you're cutting in and out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we. Uh, Hopefully, you'll find that information in that you asked in my testimony. It's it's uh, we put a lot of statistics in there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Seeing no other questions or comments, we will try and follow up. Thank you for your time. Next on our right. list is uh, Mr. Paul Pescatello. Thank you for your patience with us and thank you for spending the afternoon and evening and now night with us. Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you for your endurance. Again, uh, Paul Pescatello, I'm senior counsel at the CBIA and I uh, chair its Bioscience Growth Council. I'm also chair of We Work for Health Connecticut. Both groups are uh, uh, bring together um, biopharma companies, emerging biotech companies, research organizations, and patient groups. I'll be as quick as I possibly can. I'm here today in support of SB 175, <clears throat> an act concerning funds for the Rare Disease Advisory Council. As you know, um, all the groups that I represent, we were uh, very enthusiastic, enthusiastic supporters of establishing the Rare Disease Advisory Council um, the, you know, the, the, um, in my written testimony that you have before you, um, we all know like how important rare disease research is, how many rare diseases there are. I always say every individual rare disease is in fact rare, but rare diseases are not rare. They're depending on how you count them. There are five to 7,000 rare diseases. So many, many of us, uh, suffer from them or in some way are connected to somebody who does. The work of the Rare Disease Advisory Council is so important. It's 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 there to convene um, patient groups and industry and research institutions, and it also has some very practical charges like setting up a website to make uh, what you know what's available out there for rare disease sufferers, uh, what resources are available um, out there, more accessible to them. And so to do all to do those very practical things, it needs some money. Um, and it said uh, this bill solves that problem with a with a request for fifty thousand dollars, and or the ability to go uh, to legally go raise money from other public uh, sources or private sources. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. But I hope you uh, will support this bill and uh, get some funding for the Rare Disease Advisory Council. My, my coach here has a question. Thank you. There's that squeaky mic again. Um, back with the funds. Um, thank you for being here. I commented to Senator Amwar that we don't have people from CBIA here very often at the Public Health Committee. And it's wonderful that you're here because this just demonstrates that there are multiple levels of impact. Um, and I appreciate you advocating alongside us for these funds because indeed those administrative costs are real costs. and. Though the Rare Disease Advisory Council has a number of just incredibly committed professionals and people who are volunteering their time, being able to do these things uh, will take that. So I just wanted to say thank you, especially for staying all the way through so that you could share that message with us in person. Very much appreciate it. Well, again, thank you. Thank you. I don't have anything to add except that I hope you enjoyed our life for a little while. <laughs> I'm going to go to the gym to get some exercise. <laughs> <laughs>
Can you do the exercise for us too? We've been sitting all day. <laughs> the next person on our list is uh, Icha Pradhan. Welcome. After that, we have uh, Audrey Merriam, Dr. Audrey Merriam, and then we also have uh, Dr. Farquhar after that. Go ahead, please. Dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and esteemed members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Echa Pradhan, and I'm a policy and advocacy specialist at Health Equity Solutions, but I'm here testifying on my own behalf as a resident of Hartford, Connecticut, and not my employers today. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance. During my time as an international student here, we had a spoken and implicit understanding among us international students that if any of us ever needed medical help for whatever reason, do not call an ambulance, call me an Uber. Even though we were all required to purchase student health insurance through the university, we were wary of getting any medical help due to horror stories we had heard about others who had racked up tens of thousands in medical debt. This was due to the unpredictability of hospital costs and how even when prices are publicly available, patients often face unexpected out-of-pocket expenses. After all, even among insured individuals, healthcare costs remain a significant barrier with 42% of those insured from Access Health Connecticut struggling to afford rising healthcare costs. All of this set the stage for me and other international students to start delaying or foregoing medical care. Unpaid medical bills create a great deal of anxiety for anyone, and especially when you are not familiar with the medical system in a foreign country. So the easiest thing to do was just avoid getting medical care altogether. Not one of us were aware of hospital financial assistance programs and that we could have qualified for them. This lack of knowledge is being driven and worsened by the inaccessibility of onerous financial assistance policy and application processes as well as inadequate notification from hospitals on the availability of such assistance. In fact, the first time I learned about hospital financial assistance was not during the very few times that I visited a hospital or doctor here, but when I engaged in health policy research at Health Equity Solutions. Had I known about hospital financial assistance, I would not have struggled to pay my medical bills as a student or delayed care for as long as I did. Therefore, I strongly support House Bill 5320 as it would simplify the application and screening process by creating a uniform application and setting higher standards for notification to patients of available financial assistance option. Furthermore, the IRS has not revoked any hospital's nonprofit status for noncompliance in the past decade, which means states have a crucial role to play in closing these regulatory gaps and ensuring that Connecticut residents are not forced into unnecessary medical debt. I also urge the committee to incorporate language in the bill around one, hospitals offering a reasonable payment plan for individuals ineligible for assistance. If I can be offered payment plans to purchase a phone, laptop, jacket, then why not for something more essential and unavoidable such as a medical expense? And two, enhance accountability by mandating hospitals to disclose race, ethnicity, and language data in their financial assistance and medical debt reporting. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 5320, an act concerning hospital financial assistance policies. I urge the committee to pass the bill favorably. Thank you. HR. Yes. Anybody. Thank you. You did a very good job. Thank you. And uh, I, I think this is uh, very helpful. I'm I'm so glad you stayed and, and you were very focused and succinct and, and this was very helpful. Thank you so Do you have much. a written testimony as well? Um, not Not personally. It's on behalf of Health Equity Solutions. Yes. Okay, so whatever you said, if you want to send them in written format, you're welcome to do so then. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I will do so. all right, you stay well. Next uh, person on our list is Dr. Audrey Merriam. Thank you, Senator Anmar, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Dr. Audrey Merriam, and I am an Associate Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine the co-chair of Connecticut's Maternal Mortality Review Committee and the chair of the Perinatal Quality and Safety Initiative for ACOG's District 1. I'm here today representing the Maternal Mortality Review Committee and ACOG to testify on House Bill 5322. I am opposed to this bill and here is why. First, the Maternal Mortality Committee in Connecticut's 
in Connecticut has a mission to identify pregnancy-associated deaths, review those deaths caused by pregnancy complications and other associated causes, and identify the factors contributing to these deaths and recommend public health and clinical interventions that may reduce these deaths and improve systems of care. The goals of the committee are to perform a multidisciplinary review of cases, determine the annual number of maternal deaths related to pregnancy, identify trends and risk factors among pregnancy-related deaths, recommend improvements to care at the provider and system levels with the potential for reducing or preventing future events, prioritize finding and re findings and recommendations, and recommend actionable strategies for prevention and intervention. Additionally, the public act that establishes committee states that our task is to review maternal deaths and make recommendations. There is nothing in our mission statement or in our charge from the state that pertains to us creating and distributing educational materials to hospitals and providers. Secondly, the healthcare systems and physician offices already use electronic, electronic medical records with evidence-based screening tools for IPV and depression in the programming. The Maternal Mortality Committee does not claim to know what is best for each provider in terms of screening tools and has on past occasions stressed the importance of screening by providers for both mood disorders and IPV. The larger issues that we have seen are that despite screening, there are not adequate resources to deal with the problem and would urge the committee to focus its time and attention on ways to increase funding for IPV and mental health resources. Third, while the Maternal Mortality Review Committee recognizes that IPV and mood disorders play a significant role in maternal mortality in the state, this bill does not align with any of the committee's recent recommendations about how to help curtail maternal mortality in the state. I would urge the committee to look at those recommendations and draft legislation that is in line with the recommendations our committee has taken the care and time to propose based on our review of the deaths in the state. Finally, the Maternal Mortality Review Committee is a purely voluntary committee with no funding from the state. We dedicate our personal time to reviewing traumatic cases and make recommendations at these meetings. We do not have the manpower nor the expertise to draft and distribute screening tools and educational materials for IPV and mood disorders. We have not previously met with any state senators or representatives regarding our ability or our scope to perform the work asked of us in this bill. In summary, while I wholeheartedly agree that we should be doing more to screen for IPV and mood disorders and provide interventions to prevent maternal mortality related to these issues. However, this bill misses the mark. We need to move beyond screening and provide resources that will impact more than just birthing persons during pregnancy and the one year postpartum. We need more mental health care providers to see and treat these women in combination with obstetric providers. We need education for the potential perpetrators of IPV to teach healthy relationship skills and prevent IPV across all stages of life. So I oppose House Bill 5322, but would gladly work with any member of this committee to draft meaningful legislation in line with our committee recommendations to combat maternal mortality in Connecticut. Thank you so much for your testimony. You were just like within the exact 33 minute uh, timeline and you covered all aspects. So very, very helpful and I appreciate your testimony. And Representative Parker has a question or comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Miriam, for being here and for your <clears throat> for your work um, on the committee for your leadership. Um, and it's been a long day. We heard testimony earlier from CCADV um, mm -hmm. who said that they uh, understand as a member of the committee and said that they would be happy to do the heavy lifting of developing and helping distribute. And I can just speak for experience I've had so far of folks that um, have been great in sort of working behind the scenes to try to move this through. So I'm wondering... Does that um, seem to be your experience with them on that committee? And, and do they, does that seem to be an appropriate role for them to play in, the, in this context? Well, I think if CCADV wants to take the lead, um, then that should it should be listed as CCADV's charter in, in this bill and not the Maternal Mortality Review Committees. I think if they have the manpower and the staff to do that for IPV, then I, I we will support them in that. That is in line with our recommendations. Um, but I think that that should be their task then and not the maternal mortality review committees. I appreciate you sharing that. I'm no LCO attorney. I don't know that we could name a group like CCADV and statute. So maybe that's why mm -hmm. going through the maternal mortality review committee is what makes most sense or has been the path we've been pursuing. And my other quick question is, uh, and I really appreciate you noting that there are recommendations that I'll speak for myself. I should do a better job paying attention to, and we look forward to working with you to lift some of those up. In the meantime, if this were to move forward, do you see that there's any downside to this, presuming that the lift is there from CCADV, that DPH is able to get it out? Do you think there's a, is there some negative consequence we're not seeing here? I don't think that there's a negative consequence. I, get, I just think that this is not in line with what the committee is tasked with doing. And I think that, again, there's screening tools that already exist. Providers know them, hospitals know them. The, the committee in the past has distributed materials electronically 
informing people of our work and recommending screening tools if they did not already know um, about them. But again, I don't think as a committee, we are not specialists in creating educational materials for providers and for hospitals and would rather that be on, you know, CCADV or other committees um, who do have expertise and have that manpower um, as we are already all volunteering our time to review these cases and make these recommendations. Thank you for those answers. And again, thank you so much for your work. Thanks for being with us today. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, it's it's our bandwidth issue. We do have a lot of questions, but we don't have any capacity anymore. So we will- <laughs> That's quite all right. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> with that, we'll move to the next person on our list, which is uh, Dr. Farquhar. Thank you, Dr. Farquhar, for your patience and welcome. I thank you. Sorry to be going so late. Uh, Dear Senator Anwar, Representative McCarthy Behe, Senator Summers, Representative Claritis Dietra, and members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Thomas Farquhar, um, and I am the president of the Radiological Society of Connecticut. I know I've uh, met and spoken to uh, many of you previously, and thank you for your support of the CON law directly for advanced medical imaging. I've submitted my testimony, and you I know you've spoken to a number of my colleagues, so I just kind of wanted to... Um, it's been a long day for me when my number was called. I was in the middle of um, fluoro. So I just wanted to clarify a few things that I've heard brought up just to make sure that we had them straight. There was a question about, um, we have 300 radiologists in the state and there was a question about whether or not they were hospital-based. Yes, most of us work in hospitals, not necessarily employed by hospitals, but work there with the other um, fraction of us in uh, office settings. There was another question about a work source workforce shortage. And I don't know that they were talking about, there is a national shortage of radiologists. Um, but in terms of staff, we have um, a tremendous workforce shortage. So for sonographers, CT techs, mammographers, x-ray techs, um, I've been in the office setting where folks are leaving to go work for the hospital because they'll get better pay and benefits. And then in the hospitals, they leave to go back into an office setting because they don't want to work weekends or evenings or call. Um, and there is definitely a workforce shortage in all of the um, uh, specialized trained staff that we need to do radiology. But the main focus for our comments was about uh, Governor's Bill Number 9, the Act Promoting Hospital Financial Stability, particularly Section 4, which wanted to exempt CT scanners. Um, from the CON process. Um, let me be clear, we're, we're fine with apples to apples replacement of um, uh, scanners. That should be a very rapid process. Um, but what we're concerned about is adding new CT scanners without any barriers. And I know that uh, when Dr. Gifford spoke, she said that in the last three years, they have approved all of the applications for CT scanners. But I know if she looked back four years ago, and it, it seems like it was even longer than this, but it was the very beginning of COVID back then four years ago. Um, I was gathering the current radiology and pulmonology literature on CT scans for COVID because there was a physician in Fairfield County who wanted to get three mobile CT scanners to scan asymptomatic patients as a test for COVID. And if you wanna read more about them, you can just Google on, uh, just Google uh, Connecticut physician took advantage of pandemic, and you will hear all about the over-testing that he did for these unnecessary CT scans. And that's the type of thing that we're worried about um, if you exempt the CON uh, for uh, CT scanners, would be over-utilization that drives up costs. Um, so my testimony includes uh, um, a study from the federal uh, GAO showing that self-referral can drive up uh, costs in healthcare. Um, but you'll also see a rise of for-profit out-of-state entities bringing CT scanners to the state. Um, and that's the real you know, type of thing that we don't wanna see. So replacing a CT scanner that a, a practice or a hospital already has, they're usually doing that to get better technology, uh, which is actually good for patients. Um, but to simply allow the Wild West where anyone can bring in a CT scanner, um, it's definitely going to have um, deleterious consequences. I just don't understand her logic that in the last three years, you know, she hasn't uh, um, declined an application. It basically means that the providers know what it takes to get a CON and what is actually needed. And so you're not getting unnecessary um, requests. Um, I don't think that that means that there's not people who would be placing unnecessary requests um, 
you know, if, if there was no process for it. But I, I'm happy to answer any other questions if, if anybody had any. I, I do realize it's late. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. And thank you for clarifying a number of things because uh, uh, I was having difficulty with some components, but you've helped me understand them better. Thank um, you. I don't see any questions at this time, and um, but we appreciate your testimony and thank you for staying with us this evening. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Take care. Good night. And, uh, Dr. Farquhar was the last person on the list, so we do not have anybody else to testify. So please get some rest. Go. The ones who are at home, rest more, and the ones who have to head home, drive carefully, and we are adjourning this public hearing. Thank you. Drive safe, capital folks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>